Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Committees have lodged proposals to meet as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we'll move on. Senator Waters is yes, seeking the Yes, President. Call. I seek leave to move a motion to declare a climate emergency. The leave motion is, has been circulated. Leave is not granted. I'm informed, Senator Waters. President, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion to declare a climate emergency may be moved immediately and determined without amendment. Uh, we are moving this motion today for this parliament to debate the declaration of a climate emergency because across the Tasman, Aotearoa New Zealand uh, today are declaring a climate emergency in their parliament under a Labor government with a strong Green presence, including a Greens climate minister. There is no, and I'd like to quote now Christina Figueres uh, this morning. She says, there is no other country that has as much renewable potential as Australia, but she said that the world is waiting for a suicidal Australia to reverse its position on climate change. This is our opportunity by recognising that we are in an urgent climate emergency. This is our opportunity to be united in the Pacific, in our part of the world. Pacific nations have just written to Australia just yesterday, which my colleague asked about in question time yesterday to a very unsatisfactory response. The Pacific small island nations have written to Australia to remind us that their homelands and culture face devastation from climate change and that we must not continue to have the weakest pollution targets in the developed world. Environmental collapse is unfolding right in front of our eyes, and it's being driven by the profits of coal, oil and gas companies. Stopping a breakdown of the Earth's delicate climate system is no longer about protecting future generations. It's happening now. Let's recap this year so far in Australia. This year started with megafires on a scale that we have never seen before. It was deep drought that made such devastating fires possible. Other parts of the country had hailstorms, toxic smoke covering cities and dust clouds swallowing up entire regional towns. We've just come out of an intense heat wave in springtime, and now uh, Kigari, or Fraser Island as it's known, is on fire with a 1,000-year-old tree under threat and people being evacuated. The Bureau of Meteorology confirmed just yesterday that we've had the hottest spring on record, the hottest November on record. And this is despite our first La Nina in nine years, which is supposed to keep temperatures lower than normal. The Bureau has advised us that what we can expect in this La Nina summer is high flooding and increased chance of cyclones. The last time a La Nina occurred was when the Brisbane River flooded in 2011, with much devastation caused. Global heating is now a direct and present threat to every aspect of our lives that we cherish and hold dear. We are in a climate emergency, yeah, yeah. and we need to act quickly and forcefully, just like we have uh, in other emergencies. The first responsibility of governments is to keep its citizens safe from danger, but they are pushing us further into trouble rather than keeping us safe. We cannot exceed two degrees of warming, but the Bureau of Meteorology has advised our parliament that the targets that this government have set for Australia have us on track for up to 4.4 degrees of warming in our children's lifetimes. We have 10 years to get this under control. 
2050 means nothing if we don't halve pollution over this critical decade to 2030. And that's pure physics. As much as you like to think you can, you can't negotiate with physical sciences. Unless we rapidly change course away from coal, oil and gas, then life as we have always known it will cease to exist. Nothing will be left untouched. We can have that future, or we can have a future that, in the middle of a recession, which I note we're coming out of today, where we can create jobs directly by building abundant, cl clean, cheap renewable energy to attract domestic manufacturing back on shore again. Our wind and our sun is our competitive advantage. High-speed rail, public transport networks, green steel, hydrogen, electric vehicle manufacturing, these are the jobs that can be created today. We can create tens of thousands of jobs across the country, rejuvenating landscapes, planting trees and restoring creek lines and rivers. We have all the technologies, and skills and capital and resources that we need to create this safe, abundant world. But we have to sideline the coal, oil and gas industry that has the major parties wrapped around their little tentacles. We will get there but we don't have a lot of time. That is why the government and the whole of society must recognise that we are in an emergency and take action at emergency speed. Now is our chance to join New Zealand, England, France, Germany, Spain, Sweden, Canada and the biggest customer of our coal and gas, Japan. If we don't, Australia will remain increasingly isolated on the global stage, with our only allies being petro-states like Russia, Saudi Arabia and the, U and the UAE. So for Australia to hold its head up high, I commend this declaration to the Senate. On the, before I call the next speaker, I remind senators, I granted you some latitude there, Senator Waters, as the move of the motion. This is a motion to suspend standing orders. The occasional allusion to the procedural matter would be helpful for debate. Um, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the Senate has an established order of business. There are many, many opportunities that exist during the day where senators are able to move motions. The government will never agree to this kind of tactic to try and disrupt the order of business um, when there are many other opportunities that are available to every senator in this order. chamber to make a point. I move that the question be put. Senator Rice. Sorry, so the question is now the question be put. I, Senator McKim, I've got a motion before the chair. The minister moved that the question be now put. So the, the motion is now that the motion to suspend standing orders be put without further debate. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion be now put. The ayes will be passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 43, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator C. What tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 43. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I will now call on the clerk to call on Government Business Notices of Motion. Government Business Notice of Motion number 1. Exemption of the Electoral Amendment Territory Representation Bill 2020 from the cutoff. Senator Rustin. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion number 2. Introduction of Electoral Amendment Territory Representation Bill 2020. Senator Rustin. Pursuant to notice, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 in relation to the representation of territories in the House of Representatives for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I present the bills and move that this bill may, be, may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 in relation to the representation of the territories in the House of Representatives and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. I table the expenditure memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. I move uh, that the debate debate now be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill in committee. The committee is considering Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill of 2020 and a related bill. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Griff. Senator Patrick. Thank you, thank you um, uh, Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, before we were uh, rudely interrupted by adjournment last night, I was uh, trying, to get a, uh, trying to ask you a question about, um, about decision reasoning and the publishing of decisions. Uh, You'll, of course, be aware that, that, that uh, often decisions are published in respect of you know, the AAT and the, and the courts so that people in the community can understand uh, what the rules are, how the law works, uh, the operation of the bill in this instance. <coughs> if there are never any reasons made available for people to, to uh, look at to understand why something was rejected, how is it that the government will uh, inform the public uh, and entities that are subject to this bill uh, basically the mood of the government and how, um, how to avoid uh, getting into a situation where a, uh, uh, an agreement is entered into that is, uh, you know, ultimately gets overturned or that, uh, where they, they start to walk down a path uh, for an agreement uh, which then later um, uh, has the minister intervening. Minister, um, thank you, um, Senator Patrick, and uh, and Madam Deputy President. Um, Senator Patrick, I think we, we were discussing this yesterday. Uh, obviously, uh, the processes which will uh, which will exist under the bill, the engagement of the task force with uh, entities, state and territory governments, local governments, uh, universities be very much part of that process, but it's similar to, uh, as I alluded to yesterday, and I haven't quite put my hand on the note that I was using uh, yesterday, uh, Senator, uh, to uh, the provisions under the FERB, uh, which are also sensitive uh, decisions and uh, which are uh, provisions which uh, have a similar application uh, as these. Uh, we will be engaging comprehensively with those stakeholders, with those entities, uh, on, uh, on these matters. And I think once the stock take process is uh, underway and we have the chance to uh, go through the arrangements uh, and work with entities 
about the nature of those arrangements. I do think this will fall into a sort of rhythm, if you like, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, awareness and understanding of what the implications are in relation to foreign policy and foreign relations. Um, one thing I would like to absolutely assure the Chamber of is that this is in no way intended to be a confrontational engagement or a confrontational uh, um, relationship between uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth government and state and territory and local governments and, and universities under this bill. This is meant to be and will be, I am absolutely confident, a constructive set of relationships that will assist us all in coming to uh, a uh, collaborative approach uh, on foreign policy and reflecting the Commonwealth's particular role uh, in that regard. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a follow-up in respect of uh, the discussion we were having yesterday about the sensitivity of these, these uh, reasons, and I do understand uh, the minister's concerns. Uh, but in relation to both uh, uh, in relation to a decision that related to a state government. Uh, and, and I ask this question in, igno in ignorance of how Commonwealth state relations work at a, at a ministerial level. Uh, does the dialogue between states and the Commonwealth permit the disclosure of those perhaps sensitive reasons to the states so that the, such that they are assisted uh, as they um, you know, uh, may seek to establish future uh, agreements with overseas entities? Minister. Um, as part of the dialogue, Senator, that's, uh, that's an important part uh, of the approach. The decisions themselves will obviously be contained in the public register uh, as part of, uh, of this uh, process that's, uh, that's formalised. Um, that will provide a picture of arrangements uh, that are inconsistent with foreign policy uh, and foreign relations, and there will be a significant amount of consultation during the process between the entities and, uh, and Commonwealth Government in the form of uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Task Force. Um, there's also the matters in section 51, which I alluded to yesterday, which are the matters that uh, the minister is required to, uh, to take into account which gives some quite explicit guidance to the states and territories uh, in relation to, uh, to these matters and to the Commonwealth, frankly, uh, in terms of what has to be taken into account um, by the minister. Um, on sensitivity, obviously decisions will be based on a range of inputs. Uh, the, um, the foreign minister's input, as is explicitly referred to uh, in the bill, uh, but also um, uh, classified issues, cabinet and confidence issues and a range of others. And I do think that uh, for the reasons that I set out yesterday and for the reasons that apply in the context of the FERB, similarly, um, that uh, the way the bill has cast this in terms of not providing reasons uh, is one that the, uh, the government believes is appropriate. Senator Wong. Oh. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, just a question in relation to delegations of decisions under the bill. Could you just uh, clarify whether this is a decision, or whether the decisions are made exclusively by the minister, whether they are delegated, if they are to be delegated, to what level, and uh, perhaps matching those with the, the nature of the decisions that uh, that might be made. Minister. Uh, Senator, um, there is a capacity to delegate, but the uh, responsibility um, begins and ends with the minister. Senator Patrick. So I'm just really trying to get an understanding of how low down the, the, the seniority chain that some of these decisions may be delegated. What is the intention of the government? Uh, and uh, you know, that, in some sense, goes to Senator Wong's concerns yesterday that you may have junior officials making uh, decisions or you may have. Uh, uh, you know, even even the EL, at the EEL level, making decisions, and uh, you know, so it'd be informative to the chamber if you could perhaps be a, bit, a little bit more specific. Minister, sorry, chair. Section 56 of the bill, senator, goes to the question of delegation. Uh, the delegations are limited, uh, limited to the secretary of the department uh, or a person who holds or performs the duties of an SES officer. Uh, in the department, but the minister is not able to delegate any of the minister's powers or functions uh, under the parts of the bill which deal with uh, negotiating and entering core foreign relations 
or in relation in part four to a call for an arrangement, uh, or section 54, which is the uh, part of the uh, legislation which deals with making the rules. Um, and a delegate uh, in exercising any uh, powers or performing any functions under the delegations must comply with any directions of the minister. So that's section 56 of the legislation, Senator, which is very clear about the delegations. Thank you. Senator Wong. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, I rise uh, to just put on the public record my concerns not only about the substance of this, but this minister's failure to, to engage with us constructively. Um, we are of the view that it's a pretty reasonable proposition when a minister is exercising this level of power. And it is a substantial, it is a substantial power. And let's, be, let's recall, this could enable whoever's there, and perhaps, you know, this minister, possibly Peter Dutton, got, I mean, goodness me, imagine the power in his hands, could just choose uh, to exercise a power to stop Mark McGowan, Premier McGowan's agreements with some international uh, entity. It could, um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, the BRI is in their sights, the Victorian one, um, you know, Stephen Marshall's agreement. Uh, some agreements Stephen Marshall has with sister city arrangements, or potentially here. And whoever's in that seat, whether it's Maurice Payne or Peter Dutton, could do so without even giving the government notice and make a decision without even writing down the reason for it. That's the, the kind of authoritarian power she's defending. And you know, I know that Senator Payne doesn't like to pick up the phone, but you know, there's an incredible amount of passivity associated with the pass the dealing with this legislation. The consultation on the regime, which was non-existent, every day this minister gave around consultation was after the bill had been announced. I mean, really, well, that's not consultation. You know, and and I think. You know, there's some suggestion that it's somehow a privileged position to actually talk to people. I just think it's good legislating. You know, like if you're going to introduce a power that, that gives you the discretion to veto agreements across subnational entities and universities, wouldn't, what's the problem with actually talking to people to work through how that might best work? That's called good government. No, didn't pick up the phone, didn't meet with them. Yeah, we saw that on Qatar too. Uh, and even the engagement on foreign policy, which you know the, the interchange I think with Senator Rice uh, about why foreign policy isn't defined, and you know, I under actually understand the argument there. But the minister herself said, uh, well, I'm sorry, her department herself has admitted that engagement with the affected entities on this on government foreign policy is ad hoc. Now, <clears throat> I um, indicated broad support for this legislation on the day it was announced, subject to you know, constitutional remit, subject to um, looking at the detail of it. Um, we've, you know, we hear from the minister's office, they want to be bipartisan, we send them our amendments. Radio silence, not even the courtesy of a call on this legislation at this time. I would have thought you'd want some bipartisanship. I, I find it, you know, at a time we are going through, we, we've seen what happened uh, yesterday and the day before. We understand uh, what Australia is dealing with. Why not try and land an agreement? But no, just silence and just comes down here and airily dismisses it. I just think it's um, frankly pretty poor form, and I, I'm putting that on the public record. I think it's deeply disappointing. Nothing the minister has said on, on these issues of um, the accountability of the executive for this decision makes sense. Uh, her arguments yesterday and today to Senator Patrick <coughs> uh, really don't hold up. I again put on record our willingness 
to consider an alternative proposition to deal with some of the issues the minister has raised, even though I actually believe those issues are dealt with in the amendments we have proposed. Uh, but there's, again, radio silence. I can't work out if it's just passivity or, frankly, arrogance. Because I do think it's a pretty arrogant position to say the federal government is not accountable for the decisions it makes. So I hope the Western Australians have a think about um, <clears throat> you know, whichever minister is there, imagine Peter Dutton or someone like that, you know, which, which, which of Mark McGowan's propositions might be vetoed without reason or notice. So look, I, I, uh, I was hopeful that we could actually have a sensible bipartisan discussion on, on this bill. But it appears that this minister is unwilling or disinterested in doing so. And I express my disappointment, particularly at this time. Uh, um, I, I, have, I was going to move to other topics, but I don't know if the Greens had saw any further issues or Senator Patrick before I move off these issues. He's talking in the back room. Do you have anything, Senator Rice? You, yep. Senator Rice. Thank you. Thanks, um, Chair. I just wanted to conclude some of this discussion about the concerns that we have about the lack of the lack of a collaborative approach and the lack of accountability. Um, Minister, you have talked about how this isn't meant to be adversarial; it's collaborative. It's people working together, but that hasn't been the experience so far in terms of consultation and working with a whole range of stakeholders before this legislation was introduced. We, what I want to put on the record is that the issues of what's in Australia's foreign, uh, what's in Australia's interest is obviously incredibly important. The issues of foreign interference is incredibly important. I think everybody around this chamber recognises that sort of measures to ensure that there isn't foreign interference, that we are not entering into relationships that are not in our interests or not in the interests of human rights, not in the interests of world, uh, you know, good order in the world, that it's important that we do have, a, have legislation that enables us to deal with those. And I also agree with the premise of the legislation that I think that it's important that there is a collaborative and cooperative approach between the states and the Commonwealth in terms of our international relations. So a situation like the Victorian government deciding that it was going to go and enter into the Belt and Road Initiative with China without engaging the Commonwealth is not a situation that is in the good interests of Australia. And it plays into playing off different parts of the Commonwealth and different states against each other. So it's clearly that collaborative approach is what is essential. But what we cannot see is that that collaborative approach and that reporting back and that accountability, which are sort of go hand in hand with that collaborative approach, they are not baked into this bill. Minister, you talk about the fact that they can happen, but that doesn't mean that they will happen. And unless you actually have them there in the legislation to ensure they will happen, it is very possible that maybe not under your Minister, you as Minister, Minister Payne, but under future ministers, that these things won't happen. That the powers that are vested in the foreign minister to just take a complete over-the-top non-collaborative approach are there in the bill. They are there. They are enabled. So, going to the collaborative approach, what I would want to know: we know that there was no consultation with the states and territories before this legislation was introduced. Um, I want to know what are the details of the dis uh, what discussions have been had with all of the states and territories since the introduction of the bill. We know that not all of the states and territories took the opportunity to put in submissions to the inquiry, and those that did were um, largely not supporting the bill. So, if, Minister, could you please go through the, ne the negotiations and the discussions? that you have had with all of the states and territories since the legislation was introduced? Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Senator Rice, thank you uh, for, uh, for those observations. And um, let me say, there is, in this place, there is a range of ways in which legislation is brought to the parliament, in either chamber, a range of ways. Uh, and government uh, selects according to uh, the nature of the legislation and the approach government wants to take, how they do that. Uh, in some cases, there will be large public exposure draft processes, and in some cases, there will not. But that is a matter which is uh, for government, and uh, the approach that the government has taken uh, in this context is, is obviously the one that is before us. Following the introduction of the bill, as I indicated in the chamber yesterday, uh, there were, uh, I think, 60 consultations uh, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, prior to the uh, committee hearings, uh, I understand that the uh, Office of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate was briefed on the bill as part of that uh, process. And I would have to say to the Chamber uh, that I think this government uh, is actually very constructive with uh, briefing, engagement, briefing engagement with the Opposition. Uh, in a way, in fact, uh, that I did not experience uh, in my time as a shadow minister in this place, not even close. Uh, so I do think we try to be constructive uh, and indeed uh, very forthcoming with briefings uh, as they are requested by senators, including yourself, who I may say, Senator Rice, in the brief time you've held this portfolio, uh, and uh, briefings are requested. Uh, and not even requested, in fact offered by government uh, to the opposition in relation to key matters in my portfolio. Uh, you asked for uh, an indication of stakeholder engagement uh, in the discussion of the legislation, Senator, uh, and uh, in conferring with officials I can advise you that uh, consultations and um, uh, discussions have taken place largely by video conference in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but, uh, in no particular order, let me say, with the South Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet on the 27th of August, with the Tasmanian Department of Premier and Cabinet and the Department of State Growth on the 27th of August, with the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet on the 28th of August, with the New South Wales Treasury on the 28th of August, uh, on the 31st of August with the Queensland Department of Premier and Cabinet and Trade and Investment Queensland, on the 2nd of September with WA Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. On the 2nd of September with Global Victoria. On the 10th of September with the Northern Territory Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade and the Northern Territory Department of the Chief Minister and Cabinet. On the 14th of September with the Queensland Department of Premier and Cabinet. On the 17th of September with the Western Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet and WA Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation uh, for a second time. Uh, on the 17th of September with the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet, on the 23rd of September again with the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet and also again the New South Wales Treasury, on the 6th of October with the South Australian Department of Premier and Cabinet for a second time, on the 12th of uh, October with the Senior Officials Trade and Investment Group, which I understand to be uh, a group of um, officials from the ACT, Queensland, New South Wales, NT, South Australian and Victorian governments, uh, who are the senior office holders uh, in their portfolio area on trade and, and investment. On the 5th of November, again with the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet. Uh, in relation to, uh, to local government, Senator, on the 28th of August with the Local Government Association of Queensland. On the 31st of August with Local Government New South Wales. On the 3rd of September with the Local Government Association of the Northern Territory on the 4th of September with the Australian Local Government Association, on the 9th of September with the Local Government Association of Tasmania, uh, on the 11th of September with the Darwin City Council, on the 15th of September again with Local Government New South Wales, and on the 13th of September with the Alice Springs Town Council, uh, on the 14th of September with the City of Perth, uh, and on the 18th of September again with the Local Government Association of Queensland. Uh, in relation to, uh, to universities, uh, Senator, um, on the 1st of September with uh, the Australian National University, on the 4th of September with Universities Australia and the Group of Eight, uh, on the 7th of September with the Australian Technology Network of Universities, the ATN, uh, on the 16th of September with the Universities Australia Board, which included representatives of the UA Executive, the University of Queensland, La Trobe University, Edith Cowan University, the University of New South Wales, the University of South Australia, the Australian National University, the Queensland University of Technology and the University of Southern Queensland. 
uh, on the 16th of September also uh, with the group of eight, Senator. Uh, that included the group of eight executive uh, the university and representatives of the University of Adelaide, the University of Melbourne, Monash University, Australian National University, the University of Queensland, the University of Western Australia, the University of New South Wales and the University of Sydney. On the 17th of September, uh, with the Innovative Research Universities Group. Uh, that included the executive of the, university, of the Innovative Research Universities Group, uh, plus Griffith University, James Cook University, Western Sydney University, Charles Darwin University, uh, the La Trobe University, Murdoch University and Flinders University. Uh, again, on the uh, 25th of September, the executive of the Australian Technology Network of Universities, uh, their executive uh, themselves, and then secondly on the 25th of September, uh, the ATN executive again, and also the University of Technology Sydney, the RMIT University, the University of South Australia and Curtin University. On the 28th of September, Senator, with the uh, University Foreign Interference Task Force Steering Group, the UFIT Steering Group. Uh, that meeting included uh, the UFIT Task Force, uh, RMIT University, the University of Newcastle, the University of Queensland, La Trobe University and the Australian National University. On the 30th of September, Senator, with Universities Australia, that meeting included uh, the executive of UA but also the University of Queensland. And on the 1st of October, Senator, uh, the Innovative Research Universities Group, uh, again, uh, that group on that occasion included uh, Griffith University. I'm just trying to see if there's a difference in the groups that were included on that occasion, as on as with the uh, 17th of September group. But I don't think that there is. So the same group has met on the 17th of September. Uh, on the 7th of October, Senator again, Universities Australia, uh, and on the 9th of October again with the uh, Australian Technology Network of Universities uh, executive. On the 15th of October, Senator, with the New South Wales Vice Chancellors Committee, uh, that meeting included the executive of the New South Wales VCC, uh, the Australian Catholic University, the Australian National University, Charles Sturt University, Macquarie University, Southern Cross University, the University of New South Wales, the University of Wollongong, the University of Canberra, the University of New England, the University of Newcastle, the University of Sydney, the University of Technology Sydney and the Western Sydney University. Um, on the 23rd of November, Senator uh, Minister Tian and I met with uh, Universities Australia and with the Group of Eight, and as I mentioned yesterday, also Professor George Williams uh, attended uh, that meeting. Uh, on the 16th of September, Senator, the DFAT uh, Peak Business Bodies Group uh, was also engaged in consultation on this matter. That included OzIMM. Uh, the Australia-China Business Council, the AI Group, the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, the Australian Services Roundtable, City Australia, the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Minerals Council of Australia, uh, the National Farmers Federation, the Export Council of Australia, the Australian Fresh Produce Alliance, the Australian Food and Grocery Council and Ostmine. Um, those consultations, uh, Senator, obviously have been uh, broad and far-ranging in terms of the issues on which DFAT has engaged in those discussions. Uh, they have included the draft rules, uh, which, as you know, have been loaded onto uh, DFAT's website, uh, the information that is to be included in notices, uh, the nature and the uh, form of the public register, what that will uh, include, and, of course, exempt arrangements uh, as part of those discussions. Senator Rice. Chair. Um, that's, yes, as you say, Minister, a very broad list um, of the consultation which has occurred. I actually only asked for the consultation with state and territories government. So, I mean, I've got a lot of information about beyond that, which is fine. Happy to receive that information. In terms of that consultation, you've said some of the things that it covered. Uh, the, uh, is that consultation and in terms of the key um, uh, Positions being put, or questions being asked, or overall perspectives on the bill has that been documented by by DFAT, by the people that have been conducting the consultation, and is that available on the public record? Minister, Senator, it's not a matter of public record, but of course it uh, forms part of the work that DFAT is doing in the uh, bringing together or standing up of the uh, the task force. Uh, it covered uh, the areas that um, I mentioned in my. Um, uh, 
cover the areas I mentioned in my uh, remarks, Senator, and I'd be very happy to go through the list again if you would like to be refreshed. Um, but but um, uh, it has been in relation to any question and any issues that those entities uh, and uh, those governments uh, have sought inf on which they've sought information uh, and any issue in terms of the operation of the, um, uh, of the legislation. Uh, it's part of what has uh, influenced the bringing together of the fact sheets, uh, which are also uh, loaded on uh, DFAT's website, uh, and the uh, Q&A process, which will be part of the public information process, Senator. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, be make, I'll be very brief. I just want to make an observation that we've been debating this bill since Monday night. Uh, we are still in the committee stage, but we are yet to consider a single amendment. There have been a number of questions asked by senators on the same topic over and over and over again. It appears to me like it might be that the chamber is trying to delay the passage of this bill, which I think would be very unfortunate given the bipartisan support for this bill and particularly considering the events of this week. And I hope the Senate can quickly move on to the substantive matters and the amendments that senators wish to move. Senator Rice. Thank you, Chair and Senator Patterson. I completely reject your. <laughs> there are a lot of what you were just saying. There are a lot of very important questions to be asked about to be asked about this legislation. So, what I wanted what I wanted to ask finally, in terms of those consultations, Minister, you said they weren't on the public record. I asked if you could take on notice, please, to um, provide the documentation of those consultations for us. I had one further question in terms of those consultations. I was interested to know in what dis discussion there has been in terms of the rules and guidelines that have been laid out, whether in terms of which countries that the arrangements have been discussed with either the states and territories or local governments, whether there has been discussion about particular countries that you feel the understanding will be that, yes, those arrangements will certainly be ones that will need to be of particular scrutiny, or whether there are a group of arrangements with particular countries that are ruled out, that essentially don't worry, you, you know, there's not going to be um, considerable scrutiny over arrangements with those countries. And if so, if there has been articulation of countries which are in those, those two buckets. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Um, well, we obviously respect the confidence of the stakeholders who have been uh, engaging uh, with us, Senator. Uh, but we have addressed every issue that they have raised. Um, the, the public positions, uh, which are of uh, interest to them, can obviously be ascertained through their submissions to the committee process uh, and public comments uh, that they have made, but I do respect their, uh, their confidence uh, in the consultations. Uh, in relation to, to countries, um, Senator, let me be very clear uh, that this bill is not directed at any single country or any single arrangement for that matter. Um, as I said uh, yesterday and as I said publicly when uh, the bill was uh, announced uh, by the Prime Minister and, uh, and I some uh, time ago now, uh, a, a, an open source uh, review of uh, state and territory arrangements uh, with foreign countries uh, provided a tally of over 130 different arrangements from more than 30 countries, which literally span the globe uh, and the alphabet, actually, uh, in terms of uh, their breadth. Uh, so uh, there will be many countries which have been discussed in consultations uh, with, uh, with officials. But until the stock take process uh, is underway and is uh, um, in um, motion, as it were, uh, as part of uh, the um, implementation of the bill should it pass, um, that, uh, that it's difficult to identify if there's a specific sort of arrangement or a specific issue or a specific country um, which will come to the fore uh, in this senator. Most importantly, though, um, to bring it back to the principles behind the bill in relation to foreign policy and foreign relations. Uh, we will come back to, uh, to that position where the Commonwealth is uh, the, uh, the lead, uh, part, lead um, uh, voice uh, on, uh, on these matters, and uh, Australia's approach uh, is a consistent uh, and joined-up one, uh, and I do think that that is a very important purpose of the bill. Senator Wong. Senator Rice. I've just got one final question because I just wanted to pursue 
the issue of documentation of the records of the consultation. There must be some documentation of the records of the consultation that you can share with the Senate that does not um, uh, uh, that, 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 that doesn't yeah, absolutely that's de-identified that doesn't risk you know, the privilege and the privacy of those 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 stakeholders that you can share with us that here is the the summary here are the issues here are the issues that were raised in various consultations that summarizes those issues summarizes those concerns there must be a uh, overall summary of the documentation of that consultation that you are able to share with us. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Well, Senator, I didn't reject your request for that information. You asked me to take it on notice, and that's obviously a process which I will undertake uh, with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Senator Wong. Uh, refer to the list that the minister read out. Uh, can she confirm all of the consultations she listed occurred after the bill was finalised? Can she also confirm that she continues to refuse to take on board amendments that take into account the concerns of affected entities. And finally, can the minister advise how many conversations or discussions and consultations she has had with premiers, chief ministers, vice chancellors or chancellors? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, Senator, the, um, I, I did say in response to, uh, to Senator Rice, and I think you were um, elsewhere, Senator. Uh, that um, the uh, consultations which I listed, yes, did occur after the introduction of the bill. Very happy to go through them all again, Senator, if you wish me to do so. Um, uh, speaking. Senator um, the minister asked, I'm happy to go through them again. She's answering a different question, and you know, that, that simply would be time wasting. I asked her a very direct question. She, uh, can, I, can she confirm that she is refusing to take on any amendments which actually go to the concerns raised by affected entities? And secondly, can she tell us who she's spoken to? Which premiers, chief ministers, uh, vice chancellors or chancellors has this minister consulted with in relation to this bill? Minister. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, so, Senator, the consultation has been led by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, I met last week, uh, not last week, I met um, in the break with uh, Minister Tian, with uh, the group of eight uh, and Universities Australia representatives, included uh, Professor Williams, as I have said. Uh, but this has been a 60 stakeholder consultation process, Senator, which I think uh, is an indication of uh, the number and um, uh, and depth of uh, the discussions that, uh, that have been had um, on the bill and on its issues. In relation to amendments, um, obviously we have made amendments uh, to the bill. We've taken account of a number of suggestions uh, and we've amended the bill ourselves in the House of Representatives. Uh, we have placed rules uh, on the public record as we indicated that we would. Those rules respond to uh, concerns raised by stakeholders. Uh, and of course, there, may, there is the opportunity under the bill for there to be future rules as well. Senator Wong. So, can the minister confirm? I think that answer means she's had one meeting with stakeholders in relation to this far-reaching legislation. I think from that answer, one. And the minister confirmed that there has been no conversation that she is engaged with of any of the heads of government, first ministers across Australia, who are affected by this. So, not Premier Berejiklian. Premier Marshall, Premier, I always say Goodvine, but I think it's Gutwin, is that, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I've got a Tasmanian, it reads Goodvine. Um, uh, Premier McGowan, Chief Ministers, that she's not had any conversation with any level of government about this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. As uh, the Senator well knows, the Prime Minister has engaged with his uh, uh, First Minister counterparts, both uh, through correspondence and in conversations. There have been 60 stakeholder, conversation, stakeholder consultations, as I have indicated. A very comprehensive engagement across the states and territories, across universities and across local government. Senator Wong. So just to confirm, you've had one meeting with, with stakeholders? I've asked you this question. Yeah, she's had one meeting. Excellent. The minister, I should say. Okay. I asked this question yesterday. You said you didn't have it with you the date, but perhaps you have it today. When were Australian universities added to the bill? Minister. I don't actually, Senator, and I apologise. I apologise, Senator. I don't. Um, uh, no, Senator. I don't think there is actually a date as such. The drafting process 
No, the drafting process, Senator, um, always envisaged the incorporation of uh, universities in the bill. That was an ongoing process up until uh, the announcement uh, and uh, lodging of the or uh, tabling of the legislation in the House of Representatives. Uh, and that drafting process is something which, as you well know, uh, is uh, is a very uh, is a uh, consultative process between agencies, um, parliamentary council, ministers, uh, and uh, and the bill is finally the bill in its final form is uh, is as it stands, Senator. Senator Wong. The, the process that dare not speak its name, isn't it? Well, universities didn't know about it till the bill got dropped. I know Senator Patterson said, "Why should they be privileged?" I just think you know it's not a bad thing when they're involved in the the. Foreign interference task force process to actually let them know you might get a better outcome. But um, anyway, let's just be really clear. The minister and her department have been asked this regularly, including at Senate estimates, and they refuse to answer, which can only lead to one conclusion: they were a last-minute inclusion in a bill. Well, if I'm wrong, get up. if I'm wrong, stand up and tell us when the first draft with the universities were in it. I'm happy to have that date. Well, you can't just sit there and say you're wrong, you're wrong, and not give an alternative. Oh, right. OK. Well, when was the first draft with universities in? It's a pretty simple question. Mr Newman's a very intelligent officer. He could have told me that, but he was— I'm not patronising. I think he is. He answered questions— I don't think someone like you should tell me about being patronising, Senator Pay. But anyway, my point is they know, and you won't tell us. And I don't understand why not. Well, I do, actually. You don't want to tell us because it was a late addition. Um, when were, why can the minister explain the regulatory gap between public and private universities? Why aren't private universities subject to the same requirements? Minister. Uh, Senator, I can. I just want to grab this. Um I just want to grab this reference, if I may. Um, obviously, Australian public universities are covered because they are state and territory entities established by law with significant levels of international uh, engagement. Um, while it is established by Commonwealth law, the Australian National University has been included uh, to ensure um, parity between uh, public universities. And so, given that the bill is intended to address foreign engagement by state and territory governments and government entities, it's not intended to regulate private entities such as private universities, which have no connection to government. Um, and so, accordingly, the way the bill is presented reflects um, our focus on ensuring consistency in Australian foreign policy and foreign relations across all levels of Australian government. Senator Wong. Well, hang on. It's quite possible for private universities to engage in agreements which are not consistent with Australia's foreign policy. Well, you'd, you'd shake your head, but I would have thought that would be pretty self-evident. Ah. So, you know, why does Bond University get to do whatever it likes, and the ANU has to be subject to this regime? I mean, if we're consistent about Australia. Um, having a coherent approach to foreign policy, why would you exclude products? Minister. Senator, I think I've addressed that. Um, the scheme is not intended to regulate private entities such as private universities. Uh, they don't have a connection to government uh, in the same way as uh, public universities do. And so the focus of the bill was, is on ensuring consistency in Australia's foreign policy and Australia's relations across all levels of government. Senator Wong. Well, I, I don't, with respect, I don't think you've actually explained it. You've just said privates are out. I'm making a policy point. If we're serious that the federal government should have, and I agree with this proposition, I think it's unremarkable. You know, the primary responsibility for Australia's foreign policy and external and external relations. We've had a whole range of evidence put before. Uh, the Senate committee in the public arena and also through the Intelligence Committee inquiry about the actions of universities. Surely is a matter of policy if you're serious about the principle of Australian government, federal government um, 
taking that primary responsibility, you would include private universities. And there's no, just to confirm, there's no constitutional reason why, or is there, is there a constitutional reason why private universities are not included, or is it just the privileging of Bond University and others? Minister. Senator, I think um, that imputation is completely incorrect. It's not about privilege, privileging um, any uh, private university uh, entity. Uh, this is about public entities. It's about public universities being covered because they are state and territory entities established by law, because the ANU is a Commonwealth university established under Commonwealth law and therefore also a public university. Given that the bill is about addressing foreign engagement by state and territory governments and government entities, and private universities are not government entities, they are not within the scope of the bill. Senator Wong. Does the minister not envisage a circumstance where Bond University might enter into agreement with um, a foreign government that she has a concern with? I mean, this is a bill that goes to you know, the local shire council. <laughs> you can, you, does the, the, the bill includes your capacity to strike down agreements at much smaller, of much smaller entities than a private university. She really, is the minister really saying that there's no possibility that uh, an entity such as Bond or another private university could enter into an agreement which was inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy? Minister. Senator, what I am saying, uh, as opposed to words that Senator Wong may wish me to say or put in my mouth, what I am saying is that the bill relates specifically to Australian public universities because they are state and territory entities. Uh, and they are established by law as state and territory entities, while established by the Commonwealth law, obviously. The uh, ANU falls within uh, the scope of this bill because it is also a public university. The whole point of the legislation is about addressing foreign engagement by state and territory governments and government entities. Entities which are not government entities are not within the scope of the bill. Senator Wong. Well, the bill covers local government. So if you think about you know, in the, within the Australian democracy, some local shire council, you can strike an agreement of theirs down, but you think it's not relevant for a, a, you know, a significant university to come within the remit of the bill. I mean, you can answer on process, but there's a policy point, there's a regulatory gap which you've put in place, which you haven't justified other than in a sort of process, process answer. Fact, sorry, Chair. Uh, I kept doing it. As the uh, fact sheet on, uh, on uh, universities uh, says, Senator, uh, the scheme. Sorry. Can I help you? you? I could read it into the hand side. <laughs> well, I don't think everybody would have it. He might be very wrong. He's extremely popular already, Senator. Um, uh, I don't know Order. Senators, you'll address Australian your private remarks universities, the chair. Uh, Minister, Australian you private the universities, Senator, are encouraged to be transparent. Uh, about arrangements with foreign entities by publishing information uh, about uh, those arrangements on their websites. Australian private universities can also seek uh, advice from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade on the foreign policy implications of potential arrangements uh, before they enter those uh, and therefore have the capacity to, um, uh, to consult on those issues uh, as part of, uh, of their normal business. Uh, we encourage them to do so if they wish to. Senator Wong. Well, okay. Well, that's discretionary. Um, other universities will be required to comply. Um, my recollection is, and I'm sure the minister will correct me if I'm wrong, that the, uni the all universities, including private universities, are part of the foreign interference task force process. So, who may? Why was the decision made to exclude private universities from the remit of this bill? That is a policy question. Uh, secondly. You haven't come back to me. Can you just confirm there is no constitutional reason why private universities should be excluded? Minister. Sorry, did you want me to repeat that? I'm conscious yeah. you were talking to it. Yeah. I think I've answered your question about why the uh, private universities are not included. It's because the bill relates to government entities, Senator, and they are not. Senator Wong. 
So again, I'll, for the third time, there is no constitutional reasons why, why Bond University should, is outside the remit of the bill. It's a policy decision you have made, which gives a higher level of regulation to Australia's public universities than to private entities like Bond University. Minister. Senator, there are many private uh, entities, private individuals, uh, private uh, um, businesses. Uh, as we know all too well, who enter into arrangements with foreign governments. But this bill is directed to government entities and state and territory and local governments, Senator. Um, that is a very specific and clear uh, uh, scope of the bill, and therefore private universities are not covered. Um, and there, are more than, there is more than one private university in Australia, Senator. As I said, they are encouraged to uh, engage with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, on these issues, and uh, we have a good relationship with them. Uh, the frameworks uh, that relate to foreign interference, that relate to defence exports, that relate to a range of other uh, international issues uh, are ones uh, that private universities are also subject to uh, as part of the uh, normal business of, uh, of government. Senator Wong. So, private universities remain vulnerable to foreign interference. I mean, that's, the, that's the reality. You, you've put in, you're putting in place uh, a. Well, if they're part of. Well, I hear, I hear you talking to your colleague, your advisor, about they're part of you. Well, so are all universities, and you chose to bypass that process because you wanted this bill. And what my point is. There is no constitutional reason why they're being excluded. Uh, under this regime, then, foreign interference in private universities remains open, potentially, because you're excluding them from the legislation. Minister. Thank you, Chair. This bill, Senator, is about foreign relations uh, and foreign policy. This bill is not about foreign interference. Foreign interference is covered by the university's foreign interference task force, of which those universities are members, along with a, a range of other uh, bodies, and those issues are addressed in that context. This bill, Senator, which I, I think is, to use a word that you use, unremarkable, is related to government entities and state and territory local governments. Private universities self-evidently are not government entities and are not state or territory or local governments. Senator Hanson. Um, Minister, I have raised this uh, same point that Senator Wong has raised about the private universities, and uh, it was stated to me that it is to do with state and territories, and I understand that. My suggestion then to, to the uh, advisers would then, um, why shouldn't we write to the private universities and asking them to be part of it on a voluntary basis, which I think was, um, was going to be put to the department? Um, is, that a, is that a consideration that, because it could be unconstitutional to include them in it, is it a consideration that possibly it could be writing to the private universities to um, be a part of it voluntarily? Um, I also understand that this will come up as a review in three years' time, that at that period of time then we could actually look at what it's going to be like in three years' time. And if, if, if it has worked quite clearly and it's not going to be unconstitutional, it is not going to cause problems with foreign relations, that then we can relationships that we can then um, look at expanding it. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Senator Hanson, I understand those uh, conversations have been had. That is uh, in part the purpose of doing the three-year review and why we have uh, made that amendment. Uh, it is, as I said to, uh, to Senator Wong, and I'm not sure if you'd come into the chamber uh, at that point. Um, there are uh, many avenues for engagement of private universities are on these important and sensitive uh, issues. Uh, we encourage them to, uh, to engage, uh, but in terms of the issues that you have raised, that is certainly something that can be considered in that way. Senator Hanson. Uh, just moving to another um, point that concerns me, and I'd say millions of Australians, was the, the leasing of the Port of Darwin. Now, Senator Wong has an amendment to actually include in wanting a report from the government in this bill and to be put laid on the table. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit mystified about why you would put an amendment into the bill regarding a report to be put uh, in, 
put uh, to be laid on the table with regards to the bill when this could have been done in a notice of motion. Now, my question to the government, and I am terribly concerned about the way the Port of Darwin was leased. Can the Port of Darwin, under this bill or any legislation by the government, be reversed? The leasing of the port can it be actually be reversed, and end up back in the hands of the, um, of the Australian people, not foreign-owned. Minister, um, Senator, uh, happy to to be corrected on this matter. But in relation to the Port of Darwin, the first thing that I would say uh, is that uh, we have strengthened the uh, role of the Foreign Investment Review Board, uh, as uh, you are aware to ensure that infrastructure acquisitions such as the Port of Darwin are now fully and appropriately assessed. That is a change since that transaction was made. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, provision of the Foreign Investment Re Review Board goes to precisely the point that you make. We also, uh, in 2018, introduced the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, uh, which strengthens the ability of the government to monitor and protect against risks to critical infrastructure, uh, such as water, electricity, gas and port assets, uh, specifically in relation to uh, this question. That means we now have a critical infrastructure asset register uh, to ensure that government knows who owns and operates our most critical assets. It also provided a uh, ministerial uh, directions power of last resort. Uh, which provides the Minister for Home Affairs with the power to issue a direction to an owner or an operator of a critical infrastructure asset to mitigate national security risks. In June of this year, uh, we announced reforms to further strengthen our foreign investment framework, uh, and those changes will include a new national security test to ensure the government can address national security concerns arising from new individual investment uh, proposals which would otherwise be below the screening thresholds uh, and subject to uh, the passage of legislation those reforms commence on 1 January next year. Um, Senator, in terms of the commercial uh, agreement between uh, the Northern Territory government uh, and the commercial uh, operator of the lease of the Port of Darwin, Commonwealth uh, is not in a position to uh, reverse that agreement, but we have put in place since 2016, through all of those steps, uh, protections and provisions which ensure that should such a transaction come to, uh, to uh, uh, the point of, uh, of, uh, of being made again, all of those steps that I've just gone through are now in place to address that and the concerns that you've raised. Senator Hanson. It's for clarification too. Under the free trade agreement with, with uh, China, they have a $1.1 billion investment, so they can invest in Australia up to $1.1 billion before it goes before the Foreign Investment Review Board. Um, can you guarantee Australian people now that, even under that scheme, everything that they want to buy up in Australia will be come under the national interest test so that they cannot just go and buy it up without look, going through FERB or it's um, fully investigated in the best interest of Australia. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, if the uh, proposed uh, purchases or investments uh, included any entity or any facility or any piece of infrastructure uh, which is covered by uh, the Foreign Investment Review Board, the Security, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act or the reforms to the Foreign Investment Framework introduced in June, then they would be reviewed through that process. Senator Wong. Hi. Thank you. I appreciate well, Senator you Hanson. Your, uh, I'll, just to follow up on one of the things you said. Um, First, I'd make the point, um, and this is as much an indication to you, Senator Hanson, the reason we've done it as an amendment rather than a motion is the government can ignore a motion, it can't ignore a, law, a piece of law. So that, that is the logic of it. You have raised with me, and I think that's a consistent position, why don't we do it as a notice of motion? And the reality is the minister could just ignore a notice of motion where she can't ignore the law, one hopes. Um, secondly, that, I, I don't recall the minister ever saying um, before what she's now said which is the government is not in a position to reverse the lease in the port of Darwin. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's the advice. No, no, I'm not, I'm not pushing back on it. Uh, everyone else has hedged it when we've asked that. <laughs> everyone else has ducked that question. Um, uh, it's been put previously. Uh, now, okay, I would like to understand why. 
Uh, this legislation is in effect retrospective. That is, you can veto under this legislation deals which were previously made. I think that's pretty clear. Obviously, the Port of Darwin is such a deal. It may be that because the Port of Darwin arrangement is with a ostensibly private entity, it's outside of the bill. If that's the case, I'd like to understand that. I mean, these are the issues that we traversed in the, the Senate committee. I don't think were clarified, uh, and it would be useful to clarify it here. I think. Minister. What I would uh, offer on that is, uh, given that the legislation is focused on uh, state and territory engagements with foreign governments, commercial arrangements entered into by corporations are therefore not the focus of the scheme. Um, arrangements of that nature um, may only be within the scheme's scope if they're subsidiary to a core or non-core arrangement between the state and territory government and a foreign government uh, or a foreign government entity. Uh, that's irrespective of whether the corporation is wholly or partly state-owned or privately owned. So arrangements by state, territory or locally owned corporations, such as water corporations or port authorities, are not the focus of the legislation. Uh, and those, my understanding is, those sorts of, uh, of transactions, those sorts of commercial arrangements are uh, now are best are best um, situated uh, within the context of the FERB arrangements uh, rather than this bill. Senator Patrick. No, Senator Wong. I think Senator Patrick's got his Olympic Committee amendment. But so just to confirm, at this stage, your initial advice is that this legislation, not with, one, can go back and, um, and veto. Sorry, I'll start again. This legislation would enable a minister to veto an existing deal, an existing arrangement. First point. Second point. Uh, however, the Port of Darwin would not be within the remit of the legislation because your advice is it is with a private entity. Third, given the arrangements within China around uh, the role of government. Uh, and its engagement in the economy, I, I would ask, does that change your view about whether or not the government could consider this lease uh, to, a, to this private entity? Is that clear? Right. Well, it doesn't have a market economy in the way, well, I know the, the, the Howard government said it did have a market economy. The, the, obviously, the, the government has a, a much greater um, interest in and capacity to influence the behaviour of uh, otherwise private companies than it does in Australia. Given that, does that change the government's view about the juris its jurisdiction in relation to the Port of Darwin? Minister. Give me one second, Senator. And, um, I do understand the point that uh, that you are making. Um, the question, I'm sorry. Uh, and in terms of, of the advice that um, that officials have uh, have provided, um, that still falls within the uh, parameters of the uh, statement I made earlier about commercial arrangements uh, would only be within the scheme scope if they're subsidiary to a core or non-core arrangement under the legislation, uh, and that's irrespective of whether the corporation is, to your point, about control, uh, wholly or partly state-owned or privately owned. So arrangements by state, territory or locally owned corporations are not the focus of the legislation. Senator Wong. It's all very com complex and the you know, core and subsidiary, and I understand that architecture, but the very simple proposition is, are you telling the chamber uh, that you are very certain that the Port of Darwin lease arrangements are not subject to this legislation because the arrangement is uh, uh, with an ostensible private company. Minister. 
Um, yes, Senator. That, thank you, Chair. This is Senator. That is uh, my understanding, and I would reiterate, as I did with uh, Senator Hanson, the steps that we have taken uh, in other contexts around the FERB, around the security of critical infrastructure, to address some of these issues that have arisen since that lease was signed in 2015. Senator Hanson. I just want to write, raise a question. We're talking about the Port of Darwin, which has been leased for 99 years. Is in the Port of Brisbane, Port of Melbourne, and Port of Newcastle, which is the largest coal exporting port in the world, in foreign hands? Isn't it foreign owned as well? So where do we, where, how far do we go? Is it just the focus of the Port of Darwin? What else do we look at in Australia that's actually in foreign ownership? Minister. Senator, um, I appreciate the, the issues that, that you raise uh, and uh, the other uh, uh, sites that you uh, refer to, but they are not uh, relevant to, to this bill. Uh, if they are uh, covered by, uh, given the, um, the importance of the infrastructure, if they're uh, relevant to the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, um, then that gives us a much strengthened ability to uh, monitor and to protect against risks to critical infrastructure. Um, in, uh, in that way. Um, and the conversations that I've had with, uh, with Senator Wong also goes to that point. What is important in the security of critical infrastructure legislation is this ministerial last resort directions power, which does give the Minister for Home Affairs the power to issue a direction to an owner or an operator of a critical infrastructure asset to mitigate uh, national security risks, uh, and that and the enhanced protections that we have provided in the Foreign Investment Review Board uh, process, our foreign investment framework, are uh, part of a suite of steps which we have taken since 2015 and this, um, this uh, uh, particular incident uh, to protect exactly the concerns that you have uh, identified. Senator Wong. So just to clarify, um, I wasn't aware. Uh, well, I think your answer to Senator Hanson means this, and can you please correct me if I'm wrong? That uh, whether it's the Port of Darwin or the other ports that the Senator listed, those existing arrangements cannot be vetoed or altered by passage of this legislation because they're with private entities. That's my first question about the arrangements. And the second is, whilst I understand your argument that look, you know with bipartisan support. You've done what we suggested, which was the, uh, a different approach on FERB and, and critical infrastructure, etc. But there is no capacity for government now to regulate leases which are ready or arrangements which have already been signed under those arrangements. You know, that's going forward. Um, does the minister have any concerns about any foreign policy implications or national security implications of those existing arrangements? Minister. Chair. Senator, the nature of the commercial arrangements for the specific ports that Senator Hanson identified uh, are not immediately known to me. I don't have every, every one of those uh, at my fingertips in terms of who is the uh, either owner or lessor uh, in that um, lessee. I'm sorry, uh, in that context. So I can't comment directly on those and I am so therefore I am speaking in the, in the broad and uh, I should um, reinforce that um, and the nature of the commercial arrangements um, also not uh, known to me obviously case by case but I was trying to respond to the specific questions in relation to the port of Darwin but my understanding is that the critical infrastructure uh, legislation uh, plus the FERB uh, which has clear rules on state-owned enterprise uh, investments uh, are the relevant framework under which these are dealt with. Uh, we did not want and we do not want to duplicate those, uh, those powers, and these other frameworks cover uh, private company and commercial concerns. Senator Hans. I... <clears throat> well, then that takes me to the question. In Queensland, the state government still owns the powers and wires, the poles and wires, I should say. Would the, would the federal government, under this legislation, then look closely at the if the state government intended to sell those poles and wires to foreign ownership? Would that actually could it be over overruled under this legislation? Uh, 
Minister. Thank you, Senator Hanson. And again, I would say that that is not um, in relate. That is not pertinent in this legislation because this legislation is about foreign relations and foreign policy. In terms of a commercial transaction of that nature, then it would be uh, covered under uh, the Security of Critical Infrastructure and the Foreign Investment Review Board processes, but not this bill. Senator Wong. So, sorry, I, I, so just one final question, well, hopefully final. What if leases are contemplated by a foreign arrangement? What if leases are contemplated by a foreign arrangement, i.e. a state government arrangement? I think he knows what I'm talking about. Minister. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if they are uh, subsidiary to a core or a non-core arrangement, then they would come within the purview of the bill, is okay. my advice. Senator Wong. So that means we, nothing can be done. Your advice today is nothing can be done about the Port of Darwin, and probably, subject to advice, nothing can be done about the other port arrangements that Senator Hanson has raised. But in the future, if a state government engaged in a, an arrangement with a foreign um, entity, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the term is under the bill, which contemplated leasing arrangements, for example, uh, then, then the leases would come within the remit of the minister for the purposes of the bill and could be vetoed at that point. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could um, would be uh, my observation. Uh, and I would also say that given the changes that have been made to the foreign investment review process uh, and, to the and with the security of critical infrastructure uh, legislation, there would be a meshing of, um, of uh, relevant Legislation, so security of critical infrastructure, um, foreign investment review, and if the engagement was, as I said, subsidiary to a core or non-core arrangement, then this legislation as well. Senator Wong, if that's the case, can you rule out that the Port of Darwin arrangement is subsidiary to a current arrangement? Well, you don't. Well, well you. you Shrugging, Minister. my friend. But, no, I'm looking. At the, no, I was not you. I was looking at the advisor. Senator, Senator Wong, I'm giving the call to the minister to answer, not Would, her advisor. Sure, sure. Uh, perhaps it might, I might make it clearer so he can give advice or she can give it. Yes. Yeah, so, so if there's already, if, if the uh, the point you you know the description you just outlined, which is you have a, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what the term is in the bill, a state government arrangement. It, can you confirm that the the Port of Darwin is not subsidiary to a foreign arrangement such that it is caught by the bill. Minister. So, Senator, uh, I would have to say that that is the whole purpose of the bill and the stock take, because I do not have the uh, details of the nature of an arrangement made between the Northern Territory Government and on this lease. So that has to be part of the process of examining such arrangements to determine their nature, to determine whether they're consistent with the legislation. Senator and so I'm not going to preempt that. Okay. Senator Wong. Which is fair enough. In other words, I think you're saying that's possible, hypothetically, and you need to do the stock take. So what's the problem with pro providing a report to the Senate that outlines, given the, the concern about the Port of Durham, what's the problem with outlining a report to the Senate which outlines your findings based on that, or that stock take? Minister. Uh, Senator, the, the um, uh, proposal in the bill is to provide a register of decisions, uh, is to consult widely uh, in that process, collaboratively and constructively, uh, strong relationships with the states and territories, local government and universities, and to, uh, to work within the structure that's placed in the bill, Senator. Senator Patrick, I think your time has come. You Thank you. Um, I might just add that I actually think the lease arrangements for the Port of Darwin were tabled or provided to the Senate committee uh, looking into the FIRB that specifically looked at that. <clears throat> I, I just have a feeling about that. And I, um, people may want to look at that in the, uh, as, as I move my amendment. Um, I, I, uh, 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 Mr Chair, uh, I seek leave to move uh, amendment 1 to 8 on sheet 10061 um, together. Leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, just so everyone understands, that what this uh, amendment seeks to do is to, to bring within the scope of the bill 
uh, both the uh, uh, Australian Olympic Committee and foreign Olympic Committee, uh, Olympic Committee. So that could be uh, some foreign Olympic body or indeed the International Olympic Committee. Uh, I'm going to just start off by telling you my motivation for this. So all laws are generally designed to deal with controversy. So I just want to give you an example of, of the controversy that, that caused me to propose this amendment. And it relates to the Beijing 2022 Winter Games. Uh, these games uh, will uh, occur, the Winter Games will occur in, in Beijing. Uh, and there is no question that uh, the Olympics are the international event. They are used by governments uh, of all uh, types to promote national pride. They're used as a propaganda tool. I mean, we, we uh, here in Australia for the Sydney Olympics uh, used it as a promotional tool for Australia. And in the case of the Beijing Olymp Olympics, uh, unfortunately those Olympics will be, will be run in the shadow of a range of human rights abuses. Uh, I'll just name a few of those. Uh, for example, of course, we have the Uyghurs in Western China that have been subject to uh, uh, a genocide, if I were to use the words of Mr Joe Biden. Uh, we've got the crackdown uh, on uh, freedoms in Hong Kong and indeed right across China uh, as another issue that, uh, that, that uh, yeah, must be of concern to all Australians. We've had uh, situations where there is arbitrary detention of, of, uh, uh, of foreigners in, uh, in China. And indeed, we know that some journalists, just recently Australian journalists, were, um, I might say, harassed prior to leaving uh, China. So uh, we, we cannot stand by and simply observe what is happening and uh, then uh, uh, basically allow the Chinese government to, to, to promote their uh, nation, to, in, to try and improve their national standing uh, using something like the Olympics. Now, I know some people say sports and politics should never be mixed, but the reality is they are inextricably linked. There is no question that they are. Uh, the way in which uh, countries engage and promote uh, the, 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 uh, uh, their country in the competition or the cities in the competitions that lead up to the selection processes. The fact that you know, all of the athletes that will attend uh, the Beijing Olympics uh, will in fact have come uh, from places like the Australian Institute of, Support of Sport uh, or you know, through other organisations that are funded by taxpayers. Now, of course, Mr John Coates wrote to uh, the committee that examined this bill and you know, basically said, you know, we've got to keep politics out of, uh, out of the Olympics. Now, in some sense, it's a farcical statement because whilst Mr John Coates is uh, the, the head of the, or the chair of the Australian Olympic Committee, if I look to China, you'll see that, uh, that their Olympic Committee is just stacked with CCP members and, indeed, the head of their committee is in fact the Chinese Minister for Sport. So to try and suggest that the, the Olympic arrangements are, are pure, uh, that they're divorced of any politics is just ridiculous. And it is, it is, a, huge, uh, it is a huge business. Now, some people may, may differ. But some people may say, I think you're wrong, Rex. I think we should attend the Olympics. And I just want to make it clear, so the Beijing 22 Olympics, I just want to make it very clear, my amendment does not uh, invoke a boycott of the Beijing 2022 Olympics. What my amendment does is bring those bodies within the scope of the bill so that the government, should it wish to, can initiate a boycott. So it simply puts a, a card into the minister's uh, back pocket that when we get to the point where others uh, uh, recognise what is happening in China, uh, uh, and uh, we've seen you know, the, the British Foreign Secretary raising concerns about uh, participation in 
uh, in the Olympics. So I think that that movement will grow stronger and stronger as we uh, approach the, the Beijing 2022 Olympics. And it would be good if the minister were able to exercise a power uh, to have Australia boycott from a government level. We do not want to leave the decisions as to a boycott of the Beijing 2022 Olympics uh, to the athletes. That just puts incredible pressure upon those athletes. That's not an acceptable outcome. We've, you know, we've seen that taking place uh, with the Moscow Olympics uh, uh, back in 1936. We, we want to make sure that if, if a decision is made, uh, if it's not appropriate to, turn, to, to attend those Olympics, and that's my strong view, that it is not appropriate to uh, feed the Chinese propaganda machine, uh, then that decision can be made by government, and that could potentially invoke a range of different uh, measures to compensate those, a those athletes who, of course, devote their, their life towards attending these sorts of things. So I just want to be very clear that, that this is not invoking a boycott. It's simply giving an option for government uh, to, to do so. Um, I might just, uh, in the last couple of minutes, just say, because I didn't do a second reader, that I do support the bill. I will support the bill. I, I support the intent of it. I do have some concerns uh, in relation to uh, granting an executive power without uh, yeah, appropriately balanced judicial review or, or, uh, or review of decisions. Uh, and so, in that sense, I may well support some of the amendments, and I'll deal with those as they as they pop up. Um, but uh, uh, in, in principle, uh, the, uh, you know, this bill uh, should, at final instance, be supported. Senator Hanson. At this stage, I'd like to inform the chamber that I will with be withdrawing my amendment 114 on the sheet. Thank no? you, Senator Wong. Minister. Uh, thank you. If I may, uh, in response to, uh, to Senator Patrick and uh, to his uh, amendment. Um, Senator, I want to, uh, want to be very clear that I appreciate very much the issues that um, motivate you to bring such an amendment to the chamber. Uh, these issues have been discussed uh, recently um, within the parliament and, uh, and more broadly. Uh, and I understand why they are of significant and, and sincere concern. But in terms of the, the bill itself, they do go beyond the scope and the, the intention of the bill. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is about regulating state and territory arrangements with foreign governments and related entities. And there is not a direct line of government relationship between uh, the Australian Olympic Committee and the International Committee and state and territory governments and, and foreign entities. So as non-government organisations, they're not regulated by uh, this bill. I would also say that the Olympic Charter, uh, which uh, so far has broadly stood the test of time, uh, provides that organisation within the Olympic movement, uh, provides that the organisation within the Olympic movement shall apply political neutrality. And I do think it's important to respect that um, political uh, neutrality. And in Australia, the mechanism uh, that uh, goes to uh, participation uh, in, su in games such as the Olympic Games rests with the Australian okay. Olympic Committee. They're responsible for selecting, sending and funding Australian teams to the Olympic Games, uh, no matter where they are, uh, are held. Uh, we have a range of avenues available to us to advocate on human rights questions, and I think a fair-minded observer would say that this government has, with conviction uh, and with commitment, advocated on those issues in multiple international fora uh, and domestically, uh, where such matters have been under discussion, uh, and directly with China. We have participated uh, and supported from time to time resolutions, statements, 
in relation to precisely the issues that you have raised as matters of concern uh, in your remarks today and previously in public statements. Uh, we continue to do so because we do believe that advocacy on human rights is an important role for Australia and advocacy on human rights is something which we took very, very seriously during our term as a member of the Human Rights Council. But whether it is in the UN General Assembly, uh, whether it has been in the Human Rights Council uh, or other appropriate fora, that is the approach that we have taken. In terms of uh, attendance at international sporting events such as Olympic Games, and you know, I was in Japan in October, Senator, briefly, uh, and was uh, particularly struck by, uh, as, as we saw in Australia 20 years ago, uh, particularly struck by the extraordinary engagement of the entire nation in the prospective holding of Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. These are a very, very big deal for any country that, um, uh, that is, uh, is a host. Uh, we work closely with uh, community organisations, with non-government organisations, that includes sporting organisations. And when there are concerns from a foreign policy or a security perspective with Australian sporting teams attending international events, that is always something that government can take up with the relevant sporting organisation. Um, I recall many years ago now, uh, then Prime Minister Howard, uh, one of my distinguished predecessors fine South Australian Foreign Minister Alexander Downer uh, instructed, directed uh, the cancellation of the Australian cricket team's tour of Zimbabwe in 2007. I'm sure you recall that too. So government can and will engage on such matters where it is necessary to protect Australia's interests. And, and that is really the point to come to, Senator Patrick, because I do understand what you, what, what you seek to have government do what you seek to have government have the capacity to do. Uh, so I don't know that I don't agree that the uh, specific amendment is necessary uh, for this to occur. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, it does go beyond the uh, the confines of the uh, bill in terms of its application to uh, state and territory arrangements, state and territory government arrangements with foreign governments and related entities. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, statement, uh, Minister. I, I just want to ask a, a question in, in relation to that response. And you know, my, it's a, I have a genuine concern that there is momentum building up to a boycott of the 2022 Beijing Olympics. But I'll, I'll ask this, qu this question in a, uh, in a geographical, neutral manner. Um, in the event that uh, there is an, a, an Olympic event where the pressure has built up uh, to a point where uh, athletes are, are being asked to make a decision themselves about boycotting, and that's the dilemma I'm trying to, 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 to solve here. Uh, you mentioned Zimbabwe, but what are the mechanisms for government to protect those athletes in circumstances where uh, uh, the, the pressure has built, uh, the government is, is in agreement. Uh, what are the mechanisms to protect those athletes from having to make that decision themselves um, rather than have a decision made by, uh, by the government on their behalf? Minister. Senator Patrick, I think that goes to the point uh, that I made uh, in relation to uh, the. Uh, uh, I understand it's termed uh, to me as an instruction uh, that was given in 2007 in relation to the touring Australian cricket team uh, and uh, and Zimbabwe. Uh, so mechanisms per se, legislated, constructed. Um, that's that's not um, envisaged. Uh, and I would have to say at this point in time, Senator, to be clear, we're not considering a boycott of the 2022 Winter Olympics. But you, uh, you make a, a relevant point about uh, uh, pressure and uh, uh, the, uh, the demands that are placed on athletes themselves. 
Um, but government, as I said, works very closely with uh, sporting organisations, peak bodies particularly, uh, non-government organisations, community organisations in relation to, uh, to these issues. Uh, I do remember um, that decision of the Howard government. Um, I am in some circles known as a cricket tragic. Uh, it was a matter which I was following strongly at the time and which I strongly supported and wrote to, uh, uh, wrote to um, I think, uh, at least one cricketer at the time who uh, had taken it upon himself to take a particular personal stand um, when our friends weird world. Uh, but there is not a, there's not a structured mechanism, and I, I don't think that it's appropriate for that to be inserted in the context of this bill for the reasons that I have said. But what I can absolutely assure you is how seriously government uh, takes this, and that we can and will engage on those matters where it's necessary to protect Australia's interests. Senator Rice. Thank you. Look, the Greens absolutely understand where Senator Patrick is coming from with this amendment and deeply share his concerns about human rights abuses in China, are deeply and passionately worried about the plight of the Uyghurs in China, um, the plight of the Tibetans over many years, any people working for democracy in China, in fact anybody within mainland China who dissents from the positions of the Chinese Communist Party and the, uh, the appalling um, attacks on them, um, the, the jailing, torture. We are deeply concerned about the current situation in Hong Kong and the massive attacks on democracy in Hong Kong. Um, the complete trashing of the one country, um, one what is it? One country, two two state agreement, um, and essentially China just come in and, with its might, in Hong Kong. Um, the question is what you do about it, and I think it is exceptionally important for Australia to be very acting very strongly and particularly acting multi multilaterally, to be playing our role leading, in fact, multilateral arrangements because of our relationship with China, because they have been our largest trading partner. And we know, you know the situation we're currently at with China, that it's a very, very difficult and sensitive situation as to how you can apply meaningful pressure on China to actually get some meaningful action on the human rights abuses that are going on without just everything escalating out of control. So there is an incredibly serious issue that the world needs to be grappling with and not just allowing some Chinese expansionism and not just allowing the ongoing abuse of human rights in China. That said, the question, as I said, is how you go about it. And we do not think that this legislation, including this sort of mechanism in this legislation, is the appropriate way to be going about it. In fact, our position on this legislation is we think that it is far too reaching, that there is far too much sort of control without the appropriate tracks and balances over universities. And we've got an amendment, as you know, to remove universities from the scheme. We think that the level of control and the ability to um, negate agreements that local governments make is overreach. And so we don't think that this wouldn't be an appropriate mechanism to include um, that ability of control over the Olympic Committee within this legislation. Um, that said, I think that the calls, as Senator Patrick said, for a boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics, they are growing and they are going to continue to grow because of the human rights situation in China. And I think Australia really we need to have the conversation about how we what we think about that call, because we know that the Beijing Winter Olympics are going to be a massive propaganda mo moment for the Chinese Communist Party, and they are going to milk that for all they can to be saying that, no, you know, we are a legitimate world player, superpower on the world stage, and try and brush away what is going on, whether it's the Uyghurs, the Tibetans or in Hong Kong. So I think that that is something that the world really is going to need to grapple with and to be taking you know, a multilateral approach. And I think you know, there will be calls. I, I can see over the coming two years there will be countries that will decide that, yes, that their athletes should not go and that that will be supported by their countries. I also think it's incredibly important that if there is a decision for Australia to boycott the Winter Olympics, 
that it should be a decision that is supported by government. It cannot be left to the athletes to have to bear that decision themselves. And I also reject the position that the Olympics Committee currently say that you, know, you need to separate sport and politics. That's never happened and it never will. Um, and that this moment, the Winter Olympics, are a political moment. And they are a critical um, moment for China on the world stage for them to be putting on these Olympics. So that said, we have got a very serious issue when it comes to human rights in China, a very serious issue that the world needs to be dealing with m more appropriately than it is at the moment, but including the ability to deal with that within this legislation is not something that the Greens support. Senator Wong. Um, so, as I've indicated to Senator Patrick, amendment. Yes, I'm, I haven't said the opposition's a position. <laughs> Senator yeah. Wong, you have the call. On the amendment, yes, I, I've uh, ceded to others uh, to go first. I'll just to indicate the opposition's position, which I've indicated to Senator Patrick. Um, uh, the amendment obviously seeks to bring the Olympic movement within the operation of the bill and seeks to deal with arrangements between the AOC and foreign entities, including foreign Olympic bodies, which include the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and other national Olympic committees uh, in countries other than Australia. Um, each of these obviously is a foreign entity. Um, uh, I, I do recognise and their long-standing concerns Senator Patrick's held about the Olympic Winter Games that sit behind the amendment. Uh, the advice I've received from the Australian Olympic Committee is that uh, subjecting it to this legislation would violate its autonomy under the Olympic Charter. Uh, so for that reason and others, um, the opposition is not minded to support Senator Patrick's amendment. There's no other contributions. The question is that amendments one to eight on sheet 1061 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. And those have it. Senator Patrick. Um, put on the record, that's just to avoid a division. Uh, well, there was only one voice, Senator no, I Patrick, understand. so there was never <laughs> going to be a division. <laughs> okay. All right, you caught me out. <laughs> Senator Wong. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to um, the capacity for a requirement for reasons to be provided. Um, and Senator Patrick, I note, has circulated, I think, some quite, I think, obviously I don't think they're as good as mine, but they are quite sensible amendments which go to the provision of reasons. Um, and I made the point earlier that uh, this is pretty wide ranging powers for a minister. Um, a minister can veto uh, an arrangement that you know, Premier Brenner Jicklin engages in. Um, the, the Byrons, uh, you know, on the Sutherland Shire, Ipswich City Council, uh, any of the above uh, can be, with a foreign entity, uh, can be vetoed by a minister. Um, we understand why uh, that is necessary, but I reiterate what I said yesterday, I repeat what I said yesterday, which is I do think if ministers do stuff, they probably should tell, explain to people what they're doing. Uh, and uh, my uh, concern is uh, this, the extent of the power that is vested in a minister as a consequence of this, by the parliament, as a consequence of this, uh, is substantial and wide-ranging. Uh, and it isn't enough of an answer to, to that extent of power to simply say, oh, we've, um, what's the word? Yeah, foreign policy is the remit of the federal government. Yeah, it is, but that doesn't mean you can, it doesn't proceed from that um, a suggestion that you can simply veto arrangements without providing any reasons or having any accountability. So, leaving aside your arguments about the AAT, which, for um, the reasons I've previously outlined, I don't think are correct, can the minister explain why she believes uh, it is wrong for a minister to provide any reasons for a decision under this legislation? Minister. 
Thank you very much, um, uh, Chair and uh, Senator Wong. Uh, this is obviously a matter which we've uh, discussed uh, yesterday and uh, and again today, and it is uh, a matter which was uh, considered it seriously in the uh, drafting of the legislation. We are. Uh, the government is of the view, uh, similarly to the way the FERB legislation is constructed, uh, that to protect uh, the potential for damage or prevent the potential for damage to uh, bilateral relations, uh, to protect Australia's position, uh, including in bilateral and, and international forums or negotiations, uh, that uh, it is appropriate. Um, for such serious decisions as they are taken in context of the FERB as well, uh, for reasons not to be publicly provided in these cases. However, I do think that the implementation of the bill and the provisions within the bill, the work of the Defence Foreign Affairs and Tra Defence Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, Task Force, uh, will go a great distance uh, in our engagement with states and territories, in our engagement with uh, local government uh, and with universities. Uh, to uh, informing and enabling them uh, to, uh, to work on these issues with uh, a much better foundation. It's not a secret process. The minister's decisions are made public through the register. They are open to uh, all to see uh, and to scrutinise. The minister is required in, in section 51 to take uh, a significant set of uh, matters into account in relation to the state or territory who might be uh, making the arrangement, uh, and uh, they include uh, whether the, Im the importance of the arrangement in assisting or enhancing the state and territory's functioning, uh, the extent of the performance of the arrangement, so, uh, Senator, it's um, uh, implementation, the whether the declaration would impair the continued existence of the state or territory as an independent entity. Uh, <laughs> Senator, whether the decision declaration would Senator significantly Wong. curtail or interfere with the capacity of the state or territory to function as a government, whether the declaration would have significant financial consequences, uh, whether it would impede the acquisition of goods or services by the state or territory, including, uh, as some have raised, for the purposes of infrastructure, whether it would have an effect on the capacity of the state or territory to complete an existing project that is to be delivered under the arrangement. So, the senator um, may um, uh, may choose to uh, to find humour in that list of matters. Uh, but the point I would make is that you would expect us to have considered the implications for states and territories in relation to this legislation. In doing so, uh, we have developed uh, uh, and uh, put into the legislation, into the draft, into the legislation presented to the Parliament as part of uh, Section 51, two uh, those particular um, uh, conditions. Um, these are going to be decisions, Senator, which are made robustly, made in the public interest, made with transparency and accountability, as is appropriate given the nature of the issues that are being concerned. Senator Wong. I, uh, my, my amusement was that there was somehow some great democratic principle about you not being able to make decisions which actually impinged upon the existence of a state and its capacity to operate. I, I just don't know that it's much of protection. I think the constitution does that. But look, you, you say, Minister, these will be decisions made robustly with transparency and accountability. Can you confirm you would not have to give any state government any notice of a possibility that the, you would veto an agreement in which it had entered into? Minister. Thank you, Senator. I was just asking for the um, for the section, Senator. Um, that is not required under the legislation. But the process of the stock take of arrangements, uh, which we will be undertaking with uh, the states and territories uh, and local government and relevant entities, uh, is part of um, 
developing, if you like, a, uh, a I think I could use the word rhythm um, previously with uh, with Senator in a discussion with um, Senator Rice or Senator Patrick. Uh, part of developing that relationship, uh, the understanding of the nature of arrangements which uh, which might be within the purview of the bill and the act if it is passed, uh, and that states and territory governments will be a key part to ensuring that that comes together. And, and that goes to the point of the, uh, the consultation again, Senator. It's why we are uh, engaging with, um, uh, tourism, with jobs, tourism, science and innovation groups, why we're engaging with um, the trade and investment group uh, particularly, because these are issues of, of, con of interest to them uh, and uh, they've been very productive discussions. Senator Wong. Uh, behind all the words, so you don't have to give any notice to a state government if you are considering cancelling uh, an arrangement in which they are entered into. Uh, um, why do you think that's appropriate? But that is a, a, another level of government in Australia enters into agreement, leaving aside whether it's good or bad. Before you as the minister make a decision to override an elected government about whatever agreement they get into, whether it's with yeah, Korea, Japan, China, the United Kingdom, whatever. Why do you think it's appropriate the foreign minister doesn't even have to tell them she or he's considering it? Minister. Thank you. Um, Senator, as I have, uh, have said um, at s in some detail, uh, this is going to be a comprehensive and collaborative approach between uh, the states and territories, uh, the local government and universities that are covered by the bill. It is uh, open to uh, the government to, and the states and territories, I should say, to seek further information, to seek to vary um, an arrangement uh, to ensure that it is consistent. Uh, and uh, the stock take process, I think, is, as I've said uh, in answer to other questions, a very important part of this in ensuring that uh, it provides uh, a level of uh, awareness and information uh, that will give the familiar familiarity I'm sorry, to, to states and territories of those issues and areas uh, which may be uh, affected by the provisions of the bill. Senator Hanson. But, um, on that remark about why um, you, have to, you don't have to talk to them or your decision. State governments and state councils are in a lot of most of them are in huge debt, and you have someone like um, China with Belt and Road wants to come to go to Victoria and put up a lot of money to build infrastructure, and I think this bill has come about because of that, because of concerns about China putting Belt and Road into Victoria. Why is it a concern of the federal government to actually? not allow Victoria or any other, even st maybe be local government, not to be involved in Belt and Road, and if they're signing up to these agreements, why is the federal government taking the stance that it is to actually override their decisions? Minister. Chair, thank you, uh, Senator Hanson. Uh, I've said in my summing up speech to, uh, to the chamber uh, that uh, these are not decisions uh, which will be taken lightly. These are serious decisions of government. Uh, but it is our view uh, as a government, uh, and we recognise that internationally Australia's strength is greatest when we are speaking with one voice as governments across Australia. And that's the purpose that the bill serves. So this bill will assist us in ensuring a consistent approach to Australia's international relations in Australia's national interest, uh, reflecting the Commonwealth Government's fundamental role in setting those uh, foreign policy and foreign relations parameters. It's our role to negotiate treaties, our role to represent a, a nation uh, internationally. We do think that this remedies a gap, therefore, in the existing system, so where states and territories uh, do not have to advise or even consult the Commonwealth in relation to such arrangements. That is, a large gap uh, in the system gives the Commonwealth no line of sight, uh, no vision of what state and territory governments are entering into. Uh, we believe that the mechanisms as they're set out in the legislation are about protecting Senator Hanson our national interest uh, and, importantly, addressing the consistency of our foreign policy across all levels of Australian government. 
Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Right, well then I'll use an example. With the Belt and Road, China actually put a lot of money into the Shanghai port. They couldn't pay it back, so they actually took over the port. So therefore, hasn't isn't China with putting a lot of money in Belt and Road that the agreement that is made, and also putting a lot of money into this, they're using their own technology. So if it's building a, a rail line or if they're building computer systems, if they're using their own technology, that in the future you have to always buy from China because you can't get the product from elsewhere. So basically, is it also protecting our own interests that we don't have to constantly be, be um, buying from China? So they're tying us up so that we can't um, go outside the perimeters because they've used all their knowledge, all their technology, all their infrastructure, and we are actually bound and tied to it. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Um, not directly related to that uh, example, Senator, but in the broad, can I say one of the things that COVID-19 particularly has shown us is the need for diversification of supply chains and to make sure that Australia um, uh, stands on our own two feet. It's why we have uh, an advanced manufacturing policy led by uh, Karen Andrews, the Minister for uh, Industry, Science and uh, Technology. It's why we have been working across multiple bilateral relationships and in, uh, in multilateral contexts on supply chain diversity to make sure that we never find ourselves in a position uh, where we are strongly, re strongly reliant uh, on a, a very narrow uh, cohort of suppliers. Uh, COVID-19 has brought that to the fore, uh, I would say, in about 90 per cent of all of my international engagements in the last year. Senator Ayres. Before I um, go to my question, uh, I, mean, I find it very difficult to accept uh, what the minister just said. Um, I have to tell you, as somebody who comes from a manufacturing industry background, uh, that, that you know uh, people aren't serious when they start talking about advanced manufacturing. Uh, and you know that uh, a government that allowed one of our core national capabilities, one of the industries that provided um, critical national capability in terms of the automotive industry uh, in Australia to go offshore, all this all this froth and bubble about national resilience, all, all this talk about supply chain diversity uh, counts for nothing um, after the government that you've been part of uh, did everything in its power to force not just the 40,000 jobs but the national resilience and innovation and capability that comes from that. You look, at, you look offshore now and have a look at what the United Kingdom is doing, just one example, uh, at big investments in automotive capability that they see as precisely serving the policy objectives uh, that you've been glossing over uh, in terms of national resilience and supply chain capability. The Canadians billions and billions of dollars going into green cars, into electric vehicles, which for political sloganeering purposes uh, just last year and the year before, some joker uh, in Liberal campaign land decided that an effort to invest in electric vehicles, which is the future of uh, automotive engineering and automotive capability was, was in some way an effort to take away people's weekends. I mean, it was the silliest thing that I've ever heard, but it was a self-defeating self thing because the opportunities for us to re-engage with that most sophisticated, the largest job-generating uh, industry, but also that gives rise to the capacity for innovation and capability does make me wonder about the capacity of this government to think its way through the foreign relations problems that now confront it. Now, I, I have heard uh, and listened carefully yesterday and today 
as we've been circling around this question about why it is that it's appropriate for the minister to neither consult prior to making a decision uh, in relation to a foreign agreement that the states and territories may reach, or to provide reasons. And one of the reasons I'm so apprehensive about this set of arrangements is because the government set the tone. There is no contest in this place. I think the phrase that you used, Minister, was whether the Commonwealth should have a line of sight uh, on the kinds of agreements that states and territories are reaching or local government is reaching or the universities are reaching with foreign entities. No, no contest at all uh, on that question. Uh, but the way that the bill has been formulated and the language that's been used by advocates for the bill in this place, I think would give states and territories and universities in particular some real concerns about the arbitrariness uh, of the power that the minister is proposing to exercise. Now, I've heard you say that the power would be used in a robust way. I'm not sure what that means. It wouldn't be used lightly, that there'd be processes in place. I mean, that, those commitments are as good as far as they go. Uh, but if you're the Premier of New South Wales or of Victoria or you're a researcher in one of the institutions uh, that the bill seeks to cover, your most recent experience of the government's engagement over this question is zero consultation in the formulation of the bill. Zero for the states and territories, no engagement over the construction of this most important legislation. For the universities, no engagement, no consultation. Now, Senator Patterson said yesterday, well, that, what, what, why should they have that privilege? Well, that's not a position that this government would take if it was seeking to regulate the beef industry. Uh, it's not a position that the government would take if it was trying to regulate, you change the regulations in retail or finance. It's a contemptuous way, really, of engaging uh, with the universities. Um, so no wonder they are so apprehensive about the way that the Commonwealth is going to engage with them prospectively if our most recent experience over the last three weeks has been so contemptuous uh, of them. It seems to me that there are two approaches that are very confused in the legislation. One is the arbitrariness and the power of veto uh, of the minister, and the other is the softer, more educative line of sight propositions that the minister has advanced. And it appears to me that those two twin sets of objectives, which could be reconciled in the legislation, which could be reconciled in, in a bill, perhaps in a different form, being brought to this place, uh, it's harder to reconcile those because of the government's behaviour. And because of, for example, a refusal to provide reasons. So before I come to uh, my question, I, I have um, heard much criticism from the university sector, some of it muted, I have to say, from their peak organisations. You don't hear much from them of any substance, but from the individual institutions, deep concern about the character of the minister's power and, in particular, about the way that the government 
conducted itself without consulting. So we've had those criticisms have been aired in this place, and they were aired substantially yesterday. Um, but what, what, what I'd like to understand is why did the government conduct itself in the way that it did? What was the rationale for not consulting, uh, in this case, with the university sector? And does the government recognise that that's hurt its capacity to engage constructively because of that failure to consult? Primarily, Minister, I'd like to understand why uh, the minister chose and the department chose in the drafting process that we heard so much about in estimates uh, to not consult uh, uh, with, uh, with the institutions that the bill seeks to cover. Well, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I feel duty bound to provide a uh, real time fact check on Senator Ayer's contribution in one respect before turning to the substantive matters of his contribution. Uh, the first is uh, on the question of the car industry and its departure from Australia. Uh, there are four uh, major car companies uh, in Australia uh, who manufactured. Mitsubishi, Ford, Holden and Toyota. And Senator Ayres certainly is correct to say Senator Order. 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 Senator Wong and Senator Wish Wilson. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wish Wilson and Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. Order. Senator Wong and Senator Wish Wilson, I've called you to order about seven times. Thank you. Order, please. Senator Patterson is making a contribution. S Senator Patterson would like to make a contribution. Thank you. Um, Order. Th thank you, Chair. I, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to being that token Liberal delegate at NUS when the Trots uh, and the Labor Party fought each other. It's, um, it's eerily reminiscent. It, it was a very happy time. Uh, in, any, in any case, thank you. Returning to the— Order, please. <laughs> Senator. We did indeed. Um, anyway. Returning to the substantive matters, or the um, peripheral and substantive matters. Senator Wong and Senator Wish Wilson. Order. Order. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate you, your Senator assistance. Patterson. Returning to the, the substantive matters, I was going through the four car companies that were manufacturers in Australia. Uh, Mitsubishi, Ford, Holden and Toyota. And I acknowledge Senator Ayres is right. Holden and Toyota did make the decision and did announce their decision to cease manufacturing in Australia under the first term of the Abbott government. However, Order. as Senator Ayres should know uh, and may have forgotten or chosen to forget, the departure of Mitsubishi was announced in 2008 under the Rudd government. The announcement of Ford's departure from manufacturing in Australia was in 2013 under the Gillard government. So two of the four Australian car manufacturers announced their departure under the uh, Rudd-Gillard government, not under this government. And to attribute the blame to this side of politics for that uh, event, I think, is uh, curious. Turning to the more substantive matters raised in Senator Ayres' contribution on this question of ministerial accountability for decisions made, I appreciate the perspective raised by opposition and some cross-bench senators on this question. But I do observe that ministers are, in our system of government, accountable to this parliament, and governments are accountable to the people. And if the opposition or any other member of this place is curious about a decision that the minister has made, if the minister does indeed make a decision to cancel an agreement, they are free to ask the minister about that in this chamber. Uh, and, and I look forward to them, to them doing so if indeed that is the case, and ultimately, ultimately the government is accountable to the people for the decision it makes. I was reflecting on a contribution that Senator Rice made in this debate last night. She made a good point that, uh, sadly, it may not be the case that Senator Payne will be Foreign Minister forever. 
Um, I, I hope that is for, for a very long time, but one day perhaps she will be succeeded by another foreign minister. It may be Senator Wong who replaces her one day as foreign minister. It may be Senator Ayres or Senator Kitching, given their interest in these matters. Uh, but speaking uh, as a Liberal senator, I will sleep very soundly at night knowing that it may be Senator Wong who retains this power in the future. I would much rather Senator Wong have this power to make this decision and much rather that she exercise her judgment using this power and the judgment of the federal government on questions of national interest and foreign policy than any state premier, Labor or Liberal, let alone any local council mayor, let alone any vice chancellor, because I know that ultimately she'll be informed by the best advice and the best expertise here in Canberra and because fundamentally I don't think there is a really profound difference on foreign policy across the chamber. Fundamentally I think we substantially agree. So I, I am not troubled like Senator Rice is by the fact that the foreign ministry may change hands one day. Uh, I trust that an elected government and the person they choose to appoint as foreign minister will exercise that, that choice carefully and, that, and any decisions that they make will be subject to the scrutiny of this parliament and the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, um, um, Deputy President. Uh, just a few, a few, few responses. The first is uh, we do think this is a role for federal government, but we also think where there are substantial powers vested in any minister, to, uh, as they are by this legislation, um, including to council agreements that elected state governments and elected territory governments are engaged in, and elected councils, uh, that a modicum of dis uh, you know, notice uh, and reasons for decision is a pretty reasonable proposition. I don't think that derogates from the central proposition which you asserted, which is federal government has responsibility uh, for, for um, foreign powers, so, so for foreign relations. Uh, but I, I am going to just respond very briefly to your defence of your government when it comes to the car industry. I'm from South Australia, uh, and I've worked for unions which have had members uh, at Holden's and as part of the supply chain. Uh, and I'll say this to you: every worker and their family knows what happens. What happened? Every worker and their family know what happened. And your treasurer, no, Northern Suburbs, it's Holt, GMH, mate. Uh, every, 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 every person knows that Joe Hockey stood up on the floor of the parliament and goaded them to leave. And people were watching, and people were watching, including management, and they were astounded. People, I remember one of them confidentially, like I won't give the name, saying to me, we have never seen something like this. We have been goaded to leave by the Treasurer of Australia. And then they did. So every South Australian knows, and every worker and their family who have suffered as a consequence of that decision knows it was the coalition and a coalition treasurer who not only turned their back on the industry, but out of some ideological big he-man bent, stood on the floor of the parliament and goaded them to leave. And we will never forget it. We will never forget it. We will never forget it. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> now, after all that, I propose to perhaps out of order move uh, Opposition Amendment 1112, uh, circulated in my name, which goes to the provision of an annual report. Uh, this is an amendment which requires the minister to provide an annual report to the Senate on the exercise of their decision-making power under the proposed act after each calendar year. It really goes to the point Senator Patterson made about accountability. It also prescribes the minimum contents of such reports, uh, given we've seen reports uh, provided by this government which you know, avoid certain delicate topics which are actually important, such as the Aged Care Annual Report and the response to the Royal Commission report. Uh, in order to avoid the risk of vague and unhelpful reports, it requires statistical information about decisions and results and the details that, of each decision. It's consistent with the recommendations of my colleagues on the Senate committee. Uh, it also requires an outline of the engagement uh, that has occurred during the year with entities covered by the proposed Act to articulate and explain those amendments. Uh, to those entities, Australia's foreign policy and how they should engage with foreign entities in the Nas Australia's national interest. Uh, we are conscious, 
being a responsible opposition, that some information may need to be redacted from tabled reports, and the minister would be obliged to prepare two reports, a classified report and an unclassified report. We, we, the amendment requires the minister to table the unclassified report, but to give a copy of the classified report to the Leader of the Opposition, which they are under a duty to keep secret. I would uh, just uh, underline that this is precisely the same sort of arrangement which reply, applies to intelligence agency reports, for example, under the ASIO legislation, which enables these uh, classified reports to be provided to the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, but it is important, obviously, to ensure uh, that these sorts of issues are not weaponised or politicised in any way and to ensure the bipartisanship on these sorts of national security matters uh, uh, is provided on the basis of um, reasonable shared information. Uh, conscious of the national security matters inherent in the decision-making under the bill, the amendment provides that before tabling the report, the minister may make redactions as she or he considers necessary in order to avoid prejudice to security, the defence of Australia, Australia's relations with other countries, um, law enforcement operations or the privacy of individuals. Um, uh, there are two aspects to this amendment. We're dealing with the first, which is the amendment to the bill, which requires the minister to provide an annual report to the Senate. I'm also, when we come, uh, when we move the report of the committee of the whole, when the minister does that, I, I, it is there is a motion for a continuing order, which requires these reports to be referred to Senator Patterson's. No, it's not Senator Patterson's committee. Sorry, Senator Abetz's committee, the Senate, Senate Foreign Affairs, Trade and Trade Legislation Committee so that the authority for the committee examining the reports is pursuant to Senate order, not just this, rather than the bill. I would have preferred the latter, but I am doing what the clerk told me was the right thing to do. Uh, if this amendment is successful, we'll then move that amendment uh, subsequently. Um, we're conscious of the sensitivity required in the handling of national security matters, and we have uh, taken that to account in relation to the drafting of both amendments. Thank you, Senator Wong. Minister, are you? Yes, sorry. Um, just briefly, if I may, uh, Chair Senator, um, the government doesn't support um, this amendment. Uh, we do believe that the public register uh, is going to be uh, a very important um, process through which uh, information is provided about uh, the uh, decisions that are made. Uh, it will enable uh, the ascertaining of um, the minister's decisions on arrangements uh, in terms of uh, the numbers and the outcomes uh, of those arrangements uh, will be broadly uh, publicly available. It will, well, completely publicly available, I should say, uh, to allow for that sort of um, public scrutiny over decision making. It will help the states and territories uh, to. Um, build a picture of the kinds of arrangements that uh, might be deemed to be adverse to or inconsistent with uh, Australia's pol foreign policy. It will include information about arrangements to support greater transparency. Um, I think it is an uh, important confidence-building mechanism for the public, for business and for state and territory entities themselves that they can enter uh, and deal with arrangements knowing they're consistent with Australia's foreign policy and, and, foreign, policy and foreign relations. Um, to be clear, there's certain information that won't be published on the uh, register. That includes uh, commercially sensitive information, information that would uh, disclose um, state or territory cabinet deliberations or documents, uh, any information that's subject to legal professional privilege or public interest immunity uh, or national security information. That is to protect that information, uh, to recognise that its uh, publication could uh, have a detrimental uh, impact. As Senator Rice. Chair, the Greens will be supporting this amendment and the improved transparency and accountability that would be provided for by the provision of an annual report. I note the Minister's response of not supporting this because she feels that the public register will be enough information. It's very clear that there, there's going to be much more limited information on that public register, and in fact, you just outlined some of the things that won't be on the public register, than we think is appropriate both to either be publicly available or, in the case of sensitive information, to, to be redacted and so, to take account of that sensitivity. Um, you know, we note that there, you know, it isn't full transparency because of the um, 
provisions outlined in this um, proposed amendment to be able to redact, redact sensitive information. And I think critically, this report is one of a, the provisions of annual report is one of a suite of amendments that we and the Labor Party are moving to try and in improve the transparency and the accountability and to actually put some checks and balances in this legislation. Because for all of your words, Minister, of this is going to be this most wonderful collaborative open approach where you know, everything's going to be discussed with everybody else, there is nothing in the legislation that says that that's the way it has to be. All the legislation lays out is basically a framework that allows, if the government wanted to, to come in in an incredibly heavy-handed, non-consultative and completely over-the-top manner without having to give any reasons for decisions that are being made, without having to account for yourself, without having to give any reports, without the ability to review those decisions. It is a very authoritarian way of going about this piece of legislation and completely at odds with the expressions that you have been using um, during this debate, Minister, of your commitment to a collaborative and open approach. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that um, Amendment 1 on sheet 1112 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Um, I believe the noes have it. A division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr. Bells. So the question is that amendment number one on sheet triple one two be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 32 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Just waiting for someone to seek the call. Senator Rice. Thank you. Look, um, I will move Amendment 1 on sheet. 1078, which is to define what um, foreign relations means in the bill. So, and essentially, I mean, a, consist a consistent theme throughout all the discussion and the debate that we have had on this bill is that key terms and definitions were undefined or poorly defined. So this is a very simple amendment, one that we think it would have been a pretty obvious thing to have included a definition of foreign relations, but we hope that it's a useful one um, that will provide clarity in the, in the legislation about what indeed the um, extent of what is covered by this legislation. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that um, Amendment 1 on sheet 1078 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
The bells. So the question is that Amendment 1 on Sheet 1078 is moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. There being 28 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.
So I'm waiting for someone to seek the call. Senator Wong. So we've had a discussion today about the review of decisions. I understand, just for clarity, the government has put forward legislation which enables a minister to make a decision under this bill to, vary, to veto an agreement that an elected government has entered into uh, without notice and without any reasons for decision and without any capacity for review. Um, with the uh, opposition, for the reasons outlined, doesn't believe that is appropriate. I, I place on record again I have offered to the government, both at staff level and at principal level, to engage with them about the content. Order. You want to leave? If you don't want to listen. Order. Please continue, Senator Wong. Um, uh, we, I have raised with the government on, by multiple channels, staff, office-to-office, uh, uh, leader-to-leader, uh, -leader, a willingness to engage with the substance of changes to this. We've had no reply from the government until recently, um, which I think is disappointing, as I've said before. Um, so I seek leave to move all amendments on sheet 1114 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move the opposition, opposition amendment circulated in my name on sheet 1114. Uh, again, underline the bill does not require the minister to provide any reasons for decision and does not allow for any process or review or appeal by affected entities of ministerial decisions. The bill excludes procedural fairness the operation of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act and any form of re merits review. I would note when Mr Morrison announced this legislation, he claimed the legislation would, and I use his words, quote, provide a transparency around all of those arrangements. And it would, quote, to ensure ultimately a greater awareness of the federal foreign policy settings that we are seeking the alignment of and the support of and the cooperation with of governments and government-related entities right across Australia. Well, of course, the problem is that a regime which provides no transparency of the minister's decision, no notice of the minister's decision, no requirement uh, for the federal government to advise affected entities of its foreign policy settings, no guidance to ensure the alignment of governments and government-related bodies right across Australia, is not a scheme that provides uh, the sort of transparency and enables the alignment of which the prime minister spoke. So if the government wants to deliver on this promise, it should provide guidance, and when the entities get it wrong, it should, they should explain why, because that is, over time, the only way we can ensure the sort of alignment which is necessary uh, at this time. Um, I also make the point, without procedural fairness, without a requirement to provide reasons, without a capacity for review, this is a discretion which sits solely with the minister. No requirement to explain what Australia's foreign policy is, no requirement to explain how an arrangement is inconsistent with foreign policy. Uh, now, I don't doubt the motivations of this minister. I've criti been critical of her performance, but I don't doubt her motivations. But any minister may make decisions with regard to all kinds of matter under this uh, legislation, given the broad discretion, discretion given to the minister under the bill. Uh, it's not unimaginable, for example, that a federal government of one, one political persuasion might take issue with an arrangement beneficial to a state or territory government of another political arrangement. And we have seen that in the way in which the government here has chosen to attack Premier Andrews uh, through the media without actually sitting down and having a chat. Well, I'm just looking to see who was moaning. Well, you know, I just think when it comes to foreign policy, how about don't do it through the newspapers. If you're really serious about safeguarding Australia's national interests, why don't you sit down? Why don't you? Well, you can come in here and, if you want to join the debate, very happy for you, Senator. Yeah. Why don't you come over here and have the guts to stand up? They won't let him. <laughs> oh dear. I, I always offer Senator Rennick, you know, leave to, you know, leave to speak, but he always, he never takes me up on it. Right. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a serious bill. Oh, I was serious. Grow up, Senator Wong. 
All right. Order. Okay, being told to grow up by Senator Rennick is mean, one of the highlights of my career, I reckon. <laughs> No, look, I think what we have here, you know, whatever people's views on the BRI, and you know, I've made my views clear, if we're serious in the context of the, the sort of strategic and geopolitical environment Australia is in, uh, to, uh, about safeguarding Australia's sovereignty, then there actually has to be a degree of unity and a degree of working together. So my criticism of the federal government is on this. They have chosen to play this through the media for political purposes rather than actually try and resolve it. As I said, at the same time, they refused to release their own secret BRI deal. It's pretty Senator Rennick wasn't here to hear that, which Mr Chioba entered into, which the government still refused to release. Uh, the minister can exercise powers under this, this regime to cancel an arrangement without the need to provide re reasons, without any notice, without the capacity for review and people wouldn't even know what factors the minister took into account. Only the minister would know that. So we've taken a responsible approach in drafting amendments to ensure the government's concerns are dealt with, dealt with including the net need for sensitivity in publishing details of Australia's foreign policy. I say to the government, if you want to deliver on what Mr Morrison promised in announcing this regime, transparency, leadership and alignment, you would accept these arrangements. At the statement of reasons that we have drafted would include whether, in, if in making the decisions, the minister is satisfied or not satisfied of a foreign relations matter, or had been ceased to be satisfied of a foreign relations matter, an explanation for the basis on which the minister reached that position, and in particular, uh, foreign relations, foreign policy, or other considerations involved, and an explanation of how matters have been taken into account. The minister raised earlier as a justification for non-inclusion national security sensitivities. I again make this point that in recognition of national security sensitivities, this amendment does not, I repeat, does not require information to be included in a statement of reasons if disclosure of that information is or is likely to be protected by public interest immunity, of which obviously national security grounds are an, a ground. Uh, of, uh, the opposition has provided that the threshold for withholding uh, information on the basis of a PII, public interest immunity claim, uh, is that the minister believes on reasonable grounds that the information is subject to public interest immunity. Now, I, I, I outline that because that is a very substantial protection of national security or other information that a minister reasonably believes should be excluded on the basis of public interest immunity. The minister has said a number of times that she has put judicial review into the legislation. I make this point. Judicial review of ministerial decisions has limited utility without a requirement for a minister to provide reasons for decision. It limits the, also limits the ability of Australian entities to comply with the legislation. These leg amendments establish a right of review de of decisions under the Act by the AAT. They require the minister to provide reasons to affected entities and for entities to have the capacity to appeal them. They insert a new clause in the bill itemising decisions that would be reviewable. Uh, we have specified that the review function should be conferred on the security division of the AAT so that the procedural requirements for classified evidence apply. For the purposes of this clause, a foreign relations matter means a matter that relates to whether or not a particular action would or would not adversely affect or would be likely or are unlikely to adversely affect Australian foreign relations or be inconsistent with Australian foreign policy or inconsistent with Australian foreign policy, amongst other things, to summarise. Uh, now, I know the government uh, has, uh, what, what I would say, the minister's not um, been uh, interested in engaging on this. Uh, well, these are very sensible amendments. It is a very substantial power. The uh, Labor Party doesn't believe ministers should have this kind of untrammeled power to walk, you know, to veto agreements that sovereign state governments and um, territory governments have entered into without at least providing reasons for decision, having some capacity to be accountable for them. Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair, and uh, note that the government does not support these amendments for the reasons that have been ventilated uh, at length uh, in the discussion uh, and the debate during the committee stage. Uh, I uh, 
appreciate the uh, matters that uh, Senator Wong has raised, but we believe they are covered uh, within the provisions of the bill. Uh, we are very conscious of the uh, decisions being made under this bill and the potential impact that they have in relation to bilateral relations, in relation to disadvantaging Australia's position, uh, including in bilateral and international fora or uh, negotiation or negotiations. Uh, and uh, I do want to emphasise again, as I did uh, in response to a previous discussion, that uh, this, is, uh, this is not by any means um, a secret or secretive, for that matter, uh, process. The minister's decisions are made public through the register. They are open for uh, all to see and to, uh, to scrutinise. They're made on the basis of Australia's foreign policy, which uh, is the purview of the Commonwealth government, is made by the minister in consultation, determined by the minister. Uh, in consultation uh, and uh, processes through the Prime Minister, the Cabinet process, advice from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, these decisions uh, will be robust decisions, as I have said before. They'll be made in the public interest and with the transparency and accountability that is appropriate uh, in the context of the nature of those decisions. Senator Rice. Chair. Um, the Greens will be supporting these amendments. They're very similar, um, very similar result to uh, amendment that we're also putting forward, because having to provide reasons for decisions, having the ability to challenge those decisions is fundamental as part of a framework where you have got accountability, and we believe that accountability is fundamental to having a framework of actually working collaboratively together. I, mean, I think all of us here are on the same page when we think, yes, it would be the best outcome if we have got the Commonwealth, the state and territory governments, universities, local governments all on the same page, not cutting across each other, not making decisions that are in conflict with decisions that the others are making. And again, so if you've got a problem where that's occurring, the question is how do you address it? I mean, I've done a lot of work in bringing groups of people together to work out how they can sort of work together, see what their common aims are, see what their common purposes and, and reaching uh, solutions together. And I can tell you that there is only one way that you can do it in a way which it has got la will last, and that's to actually genuinely work together collaboratively. It's genuinely to talk with each other. It's genuinely to listen with it to each other. It's genuinely to hear and learn from each other and then to be working together. And the way that you do that is you set up a framework for those discussions that actually ensure that that's going to occur. You cannot have a framework that, despite lots of good words at the beginning of, yes, we're going to work collaboratively and transparently and, and in an accountable way, that at the end of the day all the power rests with one person. And that's the problem that we have with this legislation. A framework that actually set up, set up a framework for the states and the Commonwealth to work together, but didn't vest all of that overarching unaccountable power in the hands of the minister would be the way forward. There is clearly you know, room for improvement compared with where we're currently at, where, as I earlier said, I don't think it's appropriate for state governments to be going off and signing Belt and Road initiatives with China that the, the Commonwealth had no even knowledge about or engagement in. That's not a sensible way forward. But there is a vast gulf between that situation and what's being proposed here. Because you can set up a framework that addresses that, that doesn't then place all of the power in the hands of the foreign minister in a way that does not have to be accountable. And yes, minister, you might be committed to be accountable. You might be committed personally to be providing reasons. Personally, your way of working may be to be collaborative. But unless it's actually laid out in the legislation, it doesn't have to occur. Unless you've got guidelines for the decisions and a requirement to lay out guidelines for the reasons why a decision is being made, unless you've got a requirement to actually provide reasons back to people who you are you know, saying that arrangement can no longer occur, unless that is in the legislation, it doesn't have to occur. And that is our concern. I'm sure that it would have been possible to get a, bit of to get a piece of legislation that addressed 
the vast majority of what you wanted to achieve with this legislation with multi-partisan support, because there is support around this chamber and around this parliament for, I think, what the intent of this legislation is, to address the problem of making sure that those arrangements are in Australia's national interests. But the fact that you are not willing to accommodate very sensible amendments that put in place a framework of accountability um, shows that that cooperation is, is, is not present. And that it means that's why we are having to have this debate here today. And it means that you know, you're not going to get support from us. And, and, there, and why, and I just don't understand the reasons, in fact, I don't think there have been sufficient reasons given as to why these very sensible amendments are not being supported by the government. I mean, your response was that, yes, that there are you know, potential threats to our bilateral arrangements. That's not a reason. You know, we, there is room in this amendment to be able to redact information that is sensitive, that shouldn't be there in the public eye. But this blanket approach of no, no guidelines, no review, no reasons for decisions, it's complete overreach and is setting up a regime that's got the potential to be misused in the future. Minister. Briefly, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, to be absolutely clear, so that uh, uh, there's no misapprehension in terms of uh, the uh, the record, um, this process is not all in the hands of the Foreign Minister. Um, full stop. Uh, there is uh, within the legislation uh, the process of judicial review, the parameters of the foreign policy test which I have uh, set out in the chamber in this debate, uh, the limited scope of the coverage, the matters which the foreign minister must have um, uh, in section 51, uh, which the uh, foreign minister must uh, take into uh, account. Uh, the uh, public register itself, the rules, of course, are disallowable. Uh, and uh, of course, the legislation was amended by the government uh, in the House of Representatives to also incorporate a three-year review, uh, which will give the uh, the Parliament, government, the ability to uh, to address uh, any um, prospective uh, changes or uh, amendments to the process. Thank you, uh, Minister. No further speakers. The Yes. So um, I then will put that the amendment be agreed to. Those of aye, those against. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Is division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
Stop the bells. We have the amendment uh, before us, one and two, on sheet 1114. Those in support pass to the right of the chair. Those in opposition go to the left of the chair. I appoint Teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart, and for the nays, Senator Smith. The result of the division, we have 26 ayes and 31 noes, therefore it's uh, lost. Thank you. We now have an amendment moved by the Greens, Senator Rice. Um, look, I'll now move. Um, 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 um. Where am I? Um, amend uh, amendments two and three on page. Um, 17, oh, 1078. 
And um, these amendments, in fact, had. I'm uh, sorry, Senator. You're seeking leave. I'm to, seeking leave to move those yes, I am. together. Thank you. Seeking, seeking leave to move um, amendments two and three together on page 107. That's been agreed to. Yes. Leaves granted. Sen leaves granted. Okay. Senator so Rice. I'll now move um, amendments two and three on page 1078. These are very similar but not as detailed as the Labor Party, um, the clauses in the Labor Party's amendments that were just considered, um, but I want to move them anyway, so look, I move those amendments. You move those. Any speakers? Anyone else seeking the call? If not, just seeking clarification. Is the minister you not going to respond? Give uh, Minister the call. This is uh, 1078, um, uh, Senator Rice. Uh, the government does not support um, the uh, the amendments. Uh, we've had uh, a number of discussions in uh, the uh, committee stage uh, on uh, that matter. I don't think that the uh, proposed definition uh, or the proposed amendment uh, adds clarity uh, and does run the risk also of creating uh, legal uncertainty. Uh, we do believe the term should uh, be interpreted in the context of the Commonwealth's prerogative uh, to determine Australia's foreign policy and foreign relations. Uh, yes. Do you want to go? Are you uh, calling me, or are you? Yes, I'm calling you, Senator Wong. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was. I thought you were about to say something. Um, <clears throat> the opposition will be supporting um, 1078. Um, I, I think the. Senator Rice has moved two and three together, right? Yes. Um, uh, they are substantively similar to the amendments the Labor Party moved earlier, and I, again, um, although I think there was some conflict in terms of the right of re review, um, I would just again make the point that I think the minister's justification for opposing these various uh, administrative amendments um, really uh, don't um, make a lot of sense in the circumstances. Uh, Thank you, Senator Wong. The committee reports progress and pursue it to order. I now call upon Senator's statements and give the call to Senator Scar. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, during the last sitting week, I made some reflections and some remarks with respect to the result of the Queensland state election. Hubris, Senator Watt. Hubris. It's a dangerous thing, Senator Watt. Hubris. And I just wanted to further those remarks. And at the outset, uh, I note that the member uh, for Bundaberg, Mr. David Batt, did in fact uh, lose his seat. Was unsuccessful in his effort for re-election. And I also note that uh, Mr Marty Hunt was unsuccessful in his efforts to seek re-election in the seat of Nicklin. And I just want to say to both of those gentlemen, Acting Deputy President, that my thoughts are with them. I thought they were both uh, outstanding local members. Uh, Mr Batt in Bundaberg I spent some time with earlier this year and saw firsthand the concern that David had for his community in relation to issues such as the Paradise Dam. And I also attended a function with David where he hosted local school leaders, school captains, at an annual function he convened. And again, I, it was an absolute delight to watch that engagement between David and those school students. Uh, so my best, my best heartfelt wishes for you, David. Uh, and also for Marty Hunt, and I think uh, it's a measure of Marty as a person that uh, he, no one could have been more gracious in terms of how he handled the situation after he lost his seat. Politics can be an extremely cruel game, and I think um, both David and Marty uh, represent the best of community-minded people seeking to represent their electorates to the best of their efforts, and I pay tribute to them both. Secondly, I'd like to offer my congratulations to Mr David Crisofulli, a very good friend of mine who has become the state leader of the opposition. David is the son of cane farmers, and I've met David's parents, and they're extremely decent people. And In David's case, the apple has not fallen far from the tree. 
He was one of, I think he might have been the youngest councillor on the Townsville uh, City Council, and he actually progressed to become Deputy Mayor of Townsville before being elected to the state seat of Mundingborough in Townsville. And I first really came across David when uh, one night I was driving home and I heard him give him maybe his first interview as local government minister, and I was immediately impressed by how thoughtful and considered he was in the course of that interview. And from that moment on, in my own mind, uh, I tagged him as someone who I thought would go on to, uh, to greater things, and uh, such is the case, as he's now elevated to that position of state opposition leader. I was fortunate enough to attend one of his first events as state opposition leader, a Diwali festival celebration at Brisbane City Hall. And let me tell you, uh, the Australian Indian community was highly impressed, highly impressed by the contribution that he made that evening. And I think uh, David will do a fantastic job in terms of leading the LNP to the 2024 state election. And of course, our deputy uh, state opposition leader is another David, Mr. David Janetsky. And David was born or grew up in a small town called Ackland, uh, the son of dairy farmers, and his first job was milking cows. And he rose from those beginnings to become general counsel of Heritage Building Society based in Toowoomba, which is the context in which I first came across him uh, when I was a company secretary and general counsel in a former life. And he immediately struck me in that capacity as being someone who was considered reasoned, deliberate, uh, and someone you should take very, very seriously. And one of the standout features of David is the way in which he's brought together his community in Toowoomba South. And it's become quite a multicultural community. Many people uh, have come to Toowoomba. Uh, some of them have refugee backgrounds. And David has done an absolutely sterling job in knitting his community together in terms of promoting social inclusion and making sure that everyone felt part of his community. So I think he will make an outstanding deputy state opposition leader. I also congratulate all those members who have become part of the shadow opposition team. And I'm really, really pleased, very pleased, that Deb Frecklington, who of course was the opposition leader at the time of the last state election, has been appointed opposition spokesperson with respect to water, dams and regional development. And one of the great visionary concepts, I think, to emerge from the last state election was Deb's vision in relation to the new Bradfield scheme. And that was inspired by two great Queensland public servants of Queensland's past, so Sir Leo Hilsha and Sir Frank Moore. So I'm really pleased that Deb has that opportunity to continue working on that vision. And lastly, Tim Mander, who was the Deputy State Opposition Leader going into the last state election uh, and who famously uh, was, a, was a referee of great renown. Uh, he's also been given the portfolio in opposition of Housing and Public Works, and Tim did an absolutely fantastic job in that portfolio as a minister in Campbell Newman's government. And I say to all of the members of the opposition team uh, that you have my support, you have my friendship, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you over the next four years. And the gravity of that task ahead of them in the next four years, I think, was underlined by the Queensland state budget, which was announced yesterday. Now, Queensland, Madam Acting Deputy President, was the last state in the country to release a budget in 2020, the last state in the country. And of course, we Queenslanders were concerned about that because we thought, gee, there's got to be a reason why they're not prepared to release a budget before the state election. It wasn't going to be good. It couldn't be good. It couldn't be a good reason. And sure enough, the proof's in the pudding. Whilst during the election campaign, the Labor Party continually told Queenslanders that they would borrow $4 billion to pay for their election commitments, we now see, revealed on Tuesday, that the Queensland government borrowings will be seven times that amount. Seven times that amount. Not $4 billion, not $8 billion, not $12 billion, but $28 billion, billion with a B, dollars across the next four years. 
Operating deficits over the next four years will only equate to $16.8 billion, and yet Labor will rack up an additional $28 billion in state borrowings. Before the election, Labor told Queenslanders that debt would go to $106 billion. And then just four weeks after the election, four weeks after the election, the Queensland government announced debt would go up to $130 billion. $130 billion. $24 billion, extra $24 billion in just four weeks after the state election. $6 billion a week extra. Before the election, Labor told Queenslanders that they were borrowing to protect jobs, and yet, despite racking up the biggest debt in Queensland's state history, unemployment is forecast to still be the worst in the nation in four years' time. Still the worst in the nation in four years' time. And we know that Labor and the Treasurer, uh, the Honourable Cameron Dick, compared Queensland's debt with New South Wales and Victoria. It's not as bad. It's not as, not as bad as New South Wales and Victoria. But of course, what he forgets to mention, or deliberately does not mention, is the fact that Queensland only has, say, two thirds or three quarters of the economy of New South Wales and Victoria. On a per capita basis, the Queensland government debt is extraordinarily bad. What Queensland needs to get out of this situation is economic growth, private sector development, jobs and activity. We need to grow our way out of this debt situation. What Queensland needs is a slowing of the rate of increase in the bureaucracy, the number of public servants. And what Queensland needs, what Queensland needs is a vision, a vision that will provide every single Queenslander, wherever they live, whether or not they live in Brisbane, whether or not they live in our great northern part of our state, whether or not they live in western Queensland, what Queensland needs is a vision where every single Queenslander, no matter where they live, have the potential to fulfil their opportunity. Thank you, Senator Scar. We will now go to Senator Billick remotely. Thank you, Senator Billick. You have the call. Thank you. I'd like you all to imagine this situation. You resign from a job, as most people do from time to time. Your colleagues say farewell, there's drinks, there's speeches, you might even get a present. And then your former employer charges you your own personal jet at a cost of more than $4,000 per hour flying for weeks on end so you can try and get a new job. Now, doesn't this sound like the most utterly absurd thing you have ever heard? Truly, it is really utterly ridiculous. No one in the private sector would believe this would happen. And yet, this is exactly what Mr Morrison has allowed to happen. When there are tens of thousands of Australians still stranded overseas, Mr Morrison is using a government RAAF airplane to fly in Mr Cormann, not Senator Cormann, Mr Cormann, who is campaigning to be the Secretary General of the OECD from meeting to meeting across Europe. Now, Mr Cormann's stops have included Brussels, Luxembourg, Madrid, Bern, Copenhagen, Slovenia, Zurich, Ankara and Muscat, and have covered more than 20,000 kilometres. Mr Morrison stated that this jet was necessary because Mr Cormann could get COVID-19 if he flew commercially. Now, we all know there's a global pandemic, which is why the Australian government's advice on smart traveller for Europe is do not travel. And there's a ban on international travel from Australia, which sort of begs the question, why is Mr, uh, why is Mr. Cormann travelling and what does he do when he gets to these places? Does he stay on the plane, masked up with all his meetings held in hazmat suits? Obviously not. But given he is facing, facing COVID exposure in all his meetings and travelling outside of the plane, is the use of his own taxpayer-funded plane really mitigating his risk? I presume he uses cars and he's in restaurants and on the streets and in meetings with others when he's in these other cities. And in the photo, read promotional shot, I saw him cooking an Australian barbecue in Germany. He wasn't even wearing a mask. 
in all fairness, I don't actually think barbecue was turned on either. Now, does Mr Morrison not think about the thousands of Australians in COVID hotspots around Europe that are at risk every single day they stay there? How many Australians could have been brought back by now or Mr Cormann is flying around Europe at taxpayer expense? And it's not like these trips are even, in fact, necessary. Former Senator Nastasha Stockdespoia has just successfully been elected to the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And this was done by her campaigning almost entirely from home. She held over 200 meetings via teleconference. And I'm unaware if the government also offered former Senator Scott Despoia the use of a government aircraft for her single trip to Washington and Canberra uh, during, the pre during the selection process. It's not just the planes you taxpayers are paying for. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is supporting Mr Cormann's campaign with a task force of eight, that's right, eight staff, and he's also accompanied by one DFAT officer while overseas. Seriously, if we can make military planes available for sending Mr Cormann around the globe so that he can interview for a new job, surely we can send out planes to bring our fellow Australians home. Mr Cormann must be Australia's most expensive job seeker. And there are over a million Australians on job seeker payment, and I'm sure they'd all be happy with the same level of assistance. Prime Minister says if you have a go, you'll get a go. Well, it's a lot easier to have a go if you get a fully paid for RAF jet, eight staff and unlimited support from the government. Former Treasurer and fellow Jobs for the Boys recipient Joe Hockey once said, the age of entitlement is over. Well, this is clearly not the case if you're a friend of the Prime Minister. Mr Morrison and his government are so seriously out of touch, it's not even funny. We shouldn't really even joke about it. And on the flip side of this over-generously support by the Morrison government for their mates are the workers that have been abandoned completely by this government. In fact, their rights and conditions are so bad they aren't even classified as employees. And I'm talking now about the plight of drivers for food delivery services. These workers can be found around restaurants and fast food outlets hoping to pick up a delivery gear. If they're lucky, this delivery might return them $5. They have no minimum wage and no guaranteed condition. They ride or drive around the streets delivering food as quickly as they can for our convenience and risking their lives in the process. And all this is done without adequate, well, generally none at all, workplace safety protection or workers' compensation. And tragically, I have to say, there have been five delivery riders killed on our roads since September, and I fear that there will be quite a few more. And it includes two deaths in just three days. Now, each of these workers have left their families and their loved ones. Um, their, their families and loved ones are obviously devastated by their loss. And due to the arrangements of their employment, their families are entitled to no compensation or financial support for their death. As a nation, we really got to be doing better than this. Too many workers die on our roads. A couple of weeks ago, it was Road Safety Week, where we recognised that approximately 1,200 people are killed and another 44,000 are seriously injured on Australian roads. So it's now time to recognise that the work conditions of delivery drivers in the gig economy working for these delivery apps are causing unsafe conditions on our roads. Not just for them, but for everyone. The gig economy work is poorly paid and it's insecure. And we've seen drivers such as Amita Gupta losing their jobs for being 10 minutes late for one delivery. Ms Gupta, with the assistance from the Transport Workers Union, brought the case to the Fair Work Commission as an unfair dismissal claim. And this required the Commission to first decide if she was an employee. Unfortunately, the Commission found that Ms Gupta was not an employee, nor was she conducting a business in her own right. Well, what was she doing then? When is a job not a job? Who do you think was out there delivering people's meals for just a few bucks? Why do you think she was doing it? Because she just liked driving? Of course not. She was working to earn money to pay the bills. 
The Fair Work Commission found Ms Gupta had, and I quote, the capacity to develop her own independent delivery business as a result of her legal and practical right to seek and accept other types of work while performing work for Uber Eats but chose not to. Now, Ms Gupta didn't want to found a logistics company. She just wanted a job to pay bills. She shouldn't have to be Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk to have rights at work. And we can't apply the same rules to genuine independent contractors that we apply to somebody, usually on a working visa, who has bought a second-hand bike to get some extra cash when they have no other means of support. And through COVID, many of these people have had no government support at all, don't forget. Michael Kane from the Transport Workers Union outlined some of the issues in the sector. And he said recently, and I quote, Riders are being put onto bikes with no training or protective gear. They are working our streets day and night for little pay. They have no right to insurance, and when they get injured or die, it's at the discretion of their companies as to whether they and their families get supported. Now, that state of affairs is appalling. Everybody, everybody in Australia should be able to work in safe conditions. They need rights at work and they need protection. These workers are not being looked after and they are being denied rights as employees. And due to the failure of the government to adequately protect these workers, the Transport Workers Union has had to step up and create a crowdfunding campaign to provide support to the families of the workers that are being killed simply doing their jobs. We're talking about a crowdfunding campaign to pay for funeral expenses and other costs for workers who die doing their job. Workers in Australia deserve better. The government just can't ignore this issue. It cannot be considered acceptable for people to be working at such low rates of pay below what any award would allow and without any rights, simply because this is the new technology. The government doesn't take action to make the delivery service industry safer. Well, sadly, we'll see further deaths on our roads. So, when you do use one of these apps to order your takeaway while settling down for a nice evening in, I'd like you to take a moment to think about your delivery rider or driver. Think about the dangers they face and think about what sort of training, equipment and insurance you would like if you were doing the same job and in the Thank same you, situation. Thank you, Senator Billick. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Carmichael coal mine proposed by the Adani Group is a triple bottom line dud. It's a financial dud, it's a social dud, and it's an environmental dud. And it's proposed by a company that has an appalling track record, particularly socially and environmentally. The Adani Group and its cheerleaders in the Australian government initially promised up to 10,000 jobs would be created by the Carmichael coal mine. But the Adani Group was forced to later admit in court that in fact it would actually be less than 1,500 jobs. This figure too was later downgraded in the Senate by Senator Mackenzie, who qualified that the 1,400 and 68 jobs only applied to the construction phase of the project and that ongoing there would only be around 100 jobs. So 100 jobs for a massive carbon bomb that does not have the support of the traditional owners of the land for which it is proposed and, wants, uh, and it will be developed if it does proceed by a company that uses dodgy tax havens in the Cayman Islands to hide its assets and revenue. The Adani Group has a truly woeful record on human rights. A power station is being constructed by the Adani Group in India, near the town of Goda. This is where it is intended that most of the Carmichael coal will be transported to and burnt. In March 2017, as part of the Indian government's approvals process for the power station, a public meeting was organised. At this so-called public meeting, Adani officials were required to hear claims relating to the environmental damage that its project might cause, including the degradation of domestic water supplies for local communities, and to present this information 
its, in its environmental impact assessment. The Adani Group has already drained and polluted local groundwater through industrial bores, and local villagers have said that further impacts on their water could determine whether they can in fact stay in their villages or are forced to leave the region and abandon their way of life to find labour work in the cities. However, according to local uh, Adivasi villagers, Adani officials and a large contingent of police forcibly prevented local dissenters from attending the meeting. Those people were only admitted as proceedings were being officially adjourned. But it wasn't just people's democratic rights that took a hit that day. It was their bodies and their children's bodies, with the reports of men, women and children being charged down and assaulted by the police with batons and bricks. As a result, when environmental approval was granted for the project, no mention was made of the exclusion of landowners, the premature adjournment of the meeting or, indeed, any local opposition to the project. And although these arrests were formally reported to police, no one was ever arrested for these crimes. This is the corrupt bully boy company that the Australian government has jumped into bed with. And for that matter, the Queensland government has jumped into bed with. This is the company that the Australian and Queensland governments want to sell our environment destroying coal to. It is this, company's, this company whose pockets the Australian and Queensland governments want to line using Australian taxpayers' money. Proponents of the Carmichael coal mine, including the Commonwealth Government, also use the red herring argument that the Carmichael coal mine will create jobs in poor regions of India like Gotta and improve living conditions of all Indians by providing them with cheap coal-fired power. What they don't tell you is that the electricity generated by the dirty coal power station in Gotta will actually be sold to Bangladesh. It will uh, provide the local indigenous villagers with nothing at all, no benefits, in return for their lands, their culture and the violence that's been perpetrated against them. What the government won't tell you is that Adani will be profiting from Bangladeshi power tariffs, ultimately paid for by Bangladeshi people, when they could instead provide solar power for consumption in India for just 40 per cent of the cost of coal power. And who else would Australia be sharing the Adani bed with? Well, the bagmen for the Myanmar military, the Myanmar Economic Corporation, the same military responsible for the genocide of the Rohingya people, thousands of whom have now fled to Australia. The United Nations has recommended that no business no business should enter into an economic relationship with Myanmar's armed forces or any enterprise they control. According to Australian human uh, rights lawyer Mr Chris Sadoti, who investigated the Rohingya gen genocide for the UN, uh, through Adani, Australian coal will be helping to fund the operations of the Tatmadaw, which is the armed forces, and enriching the generals in Myanmar. The UN report Mr Sadoti co-authored co for the UN said it found conclusive evidence that the actions of the country's armed forces undoubtedly amounted to the gravest crimes under international law against the Rohingya people. Now I move to the planet, our climate and our environment. The Carmichael coal mine will see increased shipping traffic through the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. As a direct threat to the Great Barrier Reef, this will significantly increase the chances of a ship grounding, which will be an ecolo ecological disaster for this unique and fragile marine ecosystem. Adani has been responsible for countless environmental breaches in India, including the sinking of the unseaworthy MV Rack off Mumbai, which was carrying at that time 60,000 tonnes of coal. Indirectly, the mining, movement and burning of coal from the Carmichael coal mine will affect the Great Barrier Reef by significantly contributing to global temperature rise, which will lead, obviously, to more coral bleaching. And I remind senators that uh, 50 per cent 
of the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef is now dead after three severe bleaching events in the last five years. The Adani Group, through a joint venture with Wilmar, is also a major refiner and trader in palm oil, an industry responsible for devastating huge areas of rainforest, particularly in Southeast Asia. This includes development of a major port in Myanmar, leasing land from the Myanmar Economic Corporation, as I said, the financial front for the brutal Myanmar armed forces. India is the world's biggest consumer of palm oil, outstripping even China and the European Union. Adani Wilmar's palm oil operations have also been found to violate the human rights of people who live in the local affected areas, including the dispossession of Indigenous peoples and forced labour. The Adani Group is also responsible for strip mining large tracts of biodiverse forest, including elephant habitat, and destroying waterways and fisheries. The Adani Group has benefited from human rights violations and environmental degradation associated with many of its commercial operations. Some of the abuses have been carried out by governments acting for the benefit of the Adani Group, and the Australian Government is one of them. That the Australian Government is in bed with the Adani Group, while this parliament considers Magnitsky-style laws to impose sanctions on people who commit human rights abuses, would be funny if it wasn't so devastatingly sad. By its actions, both in Australia and around the world, the Adani Group has forfeited any claims to a social licence to operate in Australia, and it is time they were sent packing from this company. And incredibly importantly, we all know, or all should know, the role that coal is playing in cooking our planet. It is completely unconscionable for any government to even consider allowing such a devastating project as the Carmichael coal mine proposed by such a dodgy uh, serial law-breaking company as the Adani Group to proceed here in Australia or anywhere else in the world. It is time that we prevented this carbon bomb from exploding and it is time, well beyond time, that the truth about the Adani Group's track record was placed on the record and made public. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australia is at a critical time in our history. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in an economic crisis not seen for generations in Australia. It has restricted economic activity, disrupted supply chains and limited the movement of goods and people. It's led to high levels of unemployment and a recession. It's exposed Australia's reliance on other countries for manufactured goods, particularly those critical to health services and our dependence on global supply chains. It has exposed our limited manufacturing capability, particularly the ability to pivot and adapt in times of national crisis to produce the goods we need. We need to have strategic capability in our own country, onshore. We've got fragile supply chains for a variety of reasons. We can't always rely on trading partners to get the services we need offshore. We need to start making Australia make again, and regional Australia has a significant role in doing that. The National COVID Task Force has identified the need to reinvigorate and bolster Australia's manufacturing capability. Regional Australia is perfectly placed to lead our manufacturing recovery. Regional Australia is the engine room of the Australian economy, and it has been for more than a century. Back in 1873, Melbourne blacksmith John Furphy embraced the opportunities of living in Victoria's Goulburn Valley and expand and grow his business. Now, 147 years later, later the Furphy name is not only synonymous with a refreshing ale, uh, but J. Furphy and & Sons and Furphy Foundry is a regional Australian manufacturing success story. Today, there are thousands of manufacturing success stories out there right across regional Australia. Derwin Industries is 100 per cent Australian owned and operated uh, by the Evans Group. Doug Evans' vision and that of his sons, Stuart and Craig, is to ensure that their Wodonga manufacturing site expands to make Australia self-sufficient in crucial water and gas pipe fitting components instead of relying on Chinese imports. 
and at the same time growing a new export market. There's innovation and vision from regional manufacturers, not just in my home state of Victoria. Mar Marquee Macadamia is based in uh, Bundaberg, Queensland and in Lismore, New South Wales, is a visionary regional uh, cooperative food processor. It's again 100 per cent Australian grower-owned uh, and it's, our, it's the world's largest macadamia processor. This regional business adapts uh, other nut processing technologies for their needs through research and development. And theirs is a simple strategy to be the world leaders in macadamias. It is that innovation which builds their competitiveness and they need trade settings to support that ambition. I'm excited by our government's investment in $1.5 billion over the next four years for our modern manufacturing strategy, supporting six national manufacturing pro priorities being in resources, technology and critical minerals processing, food and be beverage, and I'd like to see fibre manufacturing added to that, medical products, recycling and clean energy, defence and space. Consider this list. This list is full of uh, already existing operators out there in rural and regional Australia as manufacturers. The New Press Group, uh, based in Cardiff in New South Wales, manufactures leading-edge products to the mining, building, aerospace, defence and medical industries. It's a great regional business supplying the world and supplying highly sophisticated uh, parts for uh, fighter jets. I want to thank the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals and Hunternet Cooperative in Newcastle for inviting me to the Hunter Valley region uh, last week so I could better understand the opportunities and the challenges manufacturing businesses in regional areas face. And there are some challenges to overcome. Regional development uh, frameworks remain fragmented. Rising energy costs and the impact the competitiveness of existing and emerging advanced manufacturers in Australia. And one thing I heard time and time again from uh, these advanced manufacturers was their lack of skilled workforce uh, out there in the regions, and that is why education is so vital. Universities need to equip their graduates. Their researchers need to engage in small to medium enterprises, uh, not simply the big boys, and to be flexible enough and adaptive enough to do that. And our TAFE system needs a complete overhaul. We also need to harmonise uh, those trade uh, qualifications, if you like, across TAFE so that businesses operating in border towns or, or across jurisdictions uh, can get the apprentices uh, that they need and be able to move their workforce around as required. We've known it for a long time that our research and development pipeline and framework in this country just isn't working, lagging uh, behind the wor world in our investment in it and also our commercialisation of uh, the innovation that we do do. We need to catch up. We also need to join up our infrastructure, just not hard infrastructure of roads, rails, ports, uh, and uh, assisting with the freight task, but our communications infrastructure is so, so important for advanced manufacturing to grow and prosper. There is also, however, an abundance of opportunity for advanced manufacturing uh, in regional Australia. Proximity to raw materials, such as our fabulous agricultural products, our energy and mineral resources, will prove advantageous through the establishment of vertically integrated supply chains. We're also blessed out in the regions with an abundance of natural resources and a highly advanced uh, resources and agriculture sector. It makes no sense to talk about advanced manufacturing while we send our raw products overseas for processing only to pay a premium when that finished product returns to our shelves from overseas. There's a considerable scope to move regional Australia up the value chain by focusing on the entire supply chain, not just the original raw product. There's plenty of jobs out in regional communities now and a growing population base to supply a skilled workforce for manufacturers looking to expand. ABS data shows regional Australia attracted 65,000 more than it lost to capital cities, which is fabulous news, turning around that brain drain uh, that we've been experiencing over previous decades. Our city millennials know the appeal of life in regional cities and towns, and a recent report by Regional Australia Institute showed more millennials have moved from Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, Sydney experienced a net loss of 37,000, and that leads to what we in the regions know, that life is good, uh, you can have a great sustainable career in regional Australia, doing something you love, and a great lifestyle as well. We have room to live and grow and play, and I think COVID-19 has really highlighted 
how um, that extra space that you enjoy out in the regions is, is much uh, prized. And we've seen a renewed interest uh, and a significant increase in um, uh, queries around real estate out in regional cities and capitals. Black Jack McEwen, Australia's most significant and longest serving Minister for Trade, who forged our post Second World War economic boom, said, Australia is one of the few countries in the world that is not only self sufficient in food and important raw materials, but has an export surplus in these things. And he went on to say, it would be a great mistake if our manufacturing potential were to be neglected or underestimated. I share John McEwen's vision for a strong and prosperous and sovereign uh, Australia that actually enjoys the security and benefits of a, a, an industrialised economy and an advanced manufacturing sector employing hundreds of thousands of Australians. Economic security means jobs. We need to get those production lines humming. We need to restore our sovereign manufacturing capability, and we need to make Australia make again. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this year has been marred by crisis. First, the bushfires, then COVID-19, both contributing to a deep and damaging jobs crisis. And the government has a choice about how to approach our recovery. They can deliver a big, bold jobs plan, a plan with heart, a plan that uses the levers of government to improve people's lives. Or they can pull out the bottom drawer and use these crises to get out the tired, old Liberal Party playbook. And right now, in the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of our worst economic crisis for 100 years, people are struggling. Their response to our recovery has been as disappointing as it was predictable, because it is straight out of the Liberal Party playbook. This is a government focused on slogans, not solutions, focused on cutting people's incomes and support focused on slashing JobKeeper and JobSeeker before people get back on their feet, and focused on freezing the super guarantee. Because even though a super rise is legislated, we know this government is going to use the cover of the Retirement Incomes Review and the cover of COVID-19 to freeze super, using the false claim that this is going to help wages rise. So is this really what they've got to rebuild our economy? Is this really what they've got to rebuild our country, threatening people that they can't have a super rise or their wages will suffer? Is it really what they've got, asking people to believe that if they forego a legislated super increase, they'll somehow magically get a pay rise? Is this really what they've got? Asking people to accept a super freeze when 2.8 million people have already raided their own super to get through these tough times. And now those same people are looking ahead to a way out of this crisis, only to see the government wanting to freeze their future super. So again, is this really what they've got? wasting this recovery, wasting this opportunity, and using it to bring out their old, tired, nasty cuts. People are concerned. They're concerned about their future. They're seeing big businesses letting workers go. They're surrounded by upheaval. They're seeing small businesses failing. And they want a government that delivers practical solutions for their lives, not tired old ideological positions. And what we have is a government whose only plan for a people's future is to take away their future savings, a government that has missed the opportunity to recover bigger and stronger with a big, strong jobs plan, a jobs plan that rebuilds Australian manufacturing that gets started on big transformative infrastructure projects, that addresses the skills crisis by reinvesting in TAFE, that recharges the workforce participation of women, that invests in social housing to change lives, that powers our recovery with clean energy projects and renewables. 
a plan that is committed to rebuilding good, secure jobs, jobs people can count on, jobs people can plan a future on. Where is this plan? Where is the vision? Where is the national leadership? Missing in action. That's where. Because if the best this government can come up with is cutting the superannuation guarantee, we are in serious trouble. But we've known that this was coming for a while. It was not too long ago that the minister responsible for superannuation, Senator Hume, said she was ambivalent about the legislated rise, ambivalent about the government sticking to its promise, uh, ambivalent. This is the minister who should be superannuation's strongest advocate, its strongest champion. And around the same time, Senator Bragg chimed in to say, it is not a good time to raise the super guarantee. Well, for the Liberals, it's never a good time to raise super. When the economy is booming, no, not a good time. When the economy is in recession, not a good time. And it seems that this has now become the Liberals' superannuation policy. It's not a good time. Superannuation is about the dignified retirement of hardworking Australians, and yet this government is ambivalent about that. They are ambivalent about Australians having decent standards in their retirement. I can assure you that Labor is not ambivalent about Australians' retirement incomes. And we know how the government are trying to sell this freeze. They say that going ahead with the super guarantee will hurt wages growth. But there's a big problem with that argument, and that is the last seven years of this government because this government already cancelled the scheduled super increases, saying that it would improve pay for workers. And then for seven years, they presided over the lowest wage growth on record. What followed was low wage growth that continues to this day. Super has been frozen. Wages have not gone up, and workers have ended up being worse off. Workers like Julia. Julia is a family service worker and domestic violence support volunteer, a proud ASU member and a fellow Victorian, who has already lost out on over $4,800 since the 2014 freeze. And that's not counting, not counting the interest that she would have lost as well. If the super guarantee freeze continues at its current rate of 9.5 per cent, the average loss will be over $1,600 per person per year. A young family could use, lose up to $240,000 in retirement savings by the time that they reach their retirement—$240,000. That is a huge amount of money. How is that going to help anyone? How is it going to help the recovery? Is it fair? This freeze will disproportionately impact women's retirement. Women already reti retire with 50 per cent less super than men on average. They're already at higher risk of experiencing poverty in retirement. So this cut, this cut from the government is a huge blow to closing the gap on retirement incomes because everybody deserves to retire with dignity, everyone. But for many, continuing the freeze on super, that is going to rob them of that dignified retirement that they deserve. But as we know, this has nothing to do with evidence-based policy and it has nothing to do with sensible decision-making, decisions made with the aim of supporting hard-working Australians or the aim of doing what is best for Australia. This is to do with the Liberals' tired, old, nasty ideological obsessions. In the last year, government MPs and senators have said they want to cut super entitlements over and over again. They've said they want to make super voluntary. They've even suggested scrapping it altogether. Senator Rennick has called superannuation a cancer, even going as far to attack his own party for ever supporting super. He believes that the coalition, quote, sold out its values when it didn't stop this cancer called superannuation. And it doesn't stop with Senator Rennick. Senator Bragg believes there needs to be drastic surgery to Australia's superannuation funds. And I think we can all imagine what that drastic surgery would look like, because last year Senator Bragg told us how he thought superannuation should be voluntary, voluntary for low-income workers, an idea that would leave low-income workers paying more tax and having even less super in their retirement. 
So why do the Liberals keep saying these things? Why do they keep freezing the super guarantee? And there is one simple answer. The Liberals do not support universal superannuation. They do not. They've never supported it. They've opposed every dollar that's been put into super since its creation. And pursuing this ideological hatred of super is more important to them right now than delivering a strong and inclusive recovery. This is what they've chosen to go with. This. This is why they spend our worst economic crisis for 100 years attacking workers' retirements rather than doing their job and delivering a big picture plan for our recovery, a big, bold jobs plan, a plan with heart, a plan that gives Australians hope for the future. Thank you, Senator Walsh. I'm Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to respond to Senator Waters' speech in which she claimed the need to declare a climate emergency. She's acting. Her opening statement says it all. Quote, the Greens are moving this motion because the New Zealand government has declared a climate emergency. That's it. No data, no empirical scientific evidence, no scientific reasoning with the framework proving cause and effect. Just we're going to do it because the Kiwis have said it. That's it. And that is the summary of climate change in this country and globally. Then she raised pollution, meaning carbon dioxide is a pollutant. At the same time, she was exhaling 100 times the concentration of pollution that, of carbon dioxide that she was taking in. This is absurd. She's always exhaling. Does that mean she's always polluting? It's nonsense. And I see Senator Stirl laughing, as indeed I know he should be, because this is absurd. Nowhere on this planet, in any government, is carbon dioxide defined as a pollutant. There are no criteria specifying it as a pollutant. It is a misrepresentation instead of data. There is no data, just a false statement. Carbon dioxide is nature's trace gas essential for all life on this planet. Then she went on and talked about mega fires on a scale never seen before. False. In the 1930s, in the 1970s, there were bigger fires, wider fires, more damage. Then she said the fires were due to a deep, deep drought. Partially correct. But in the past, we've had more severe droughts and we've had more severe fires. The fires and the drought are not due to human use of hydrocarbon fuels. In fact, the drought we've just gone through, and still in place in some places, is confirmation, it's evidence that weather is behaving naturally, natural variation. And then she said, Fraser Island has a massive bushfire, as it does every now and then. But wait for it, a 1,000-year-old tree is threatened. Really? I know a 10,000-year civilization that is being threatened globally, with no data, just false statements and fear. And I remind the Senate that my questioning and holding accountable of CSIRO has shown these things. CSIRO has admitted to me that they have never, ever said there is danger from carbon dioxide from human activity. Never. So why are we going through this nonsense? Secondly, the CSIRO admitted to me that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. That means we didn't cause them because there were warmer temperatures in the past. The third thing, ultimately, when they couldn't respond properly with evidence to my questioning, they said they rely upon uh, on uh, climate models. Climate models show that they're not based on data. The climate models are unvalidated and have proven erroneous. And the fact that they have to resort to them, their fabrications, mean that they haven't got any data. And we've got 17 scientists around the world from leading organisations that have shown that the CSIRO is wrong and that I am right, the CSIRO has got no evidence. Then Senator Waters talked about government's role and letting the country down with not, not having adequate policies on climate. Well, I'll tell you what, the government has got three basic roles. Protect life. There is no threat to life from current climate variability. The crippling energy threat, destroying our energy sector, is a threat to life. 
ask anybody who's old and poor. Secondly, government has to protect property. No data, no reason. The government has stolen land off farmers, stolen their property rights, and that is a huge threat. The third role of government is to protect freedom. Again, no data, no reason. They're just putting in place arbitrary regulations and policies that have complete control over people. Then Senator Waters said, we need 10 years to get climate under control. Oh, really? King Canute would claim to, to part the waters in the, in the Red Sea. Senator Waters is claiming to be able to control the climate. These things come and go. This is sheer arrogance and insanity and stupidity. Al Gore claimed that the northern polar ice cap would disappear by 2013. He said that back in 2008. It's there as big as ever. There's a joke that Al Gore is, is complaining about someone who's just made a statement, there'll be, there'll be no, no, no uh, life on the planet or no polar ice caps in five years. And he said, really, I've been saying that for 30 years. That's my statement. I mean, this is absolutely stupid. Then we're told that we'll have 50 million climate refugees by 2010. That was said in 2005. We've had zero climate refugees, absolutely none. This is just a propaganda tool to scare people. And again, the use of propaganda confirms the lack of data, the lack of evidence, the lack of empirical scientific evidence. Then she talked about pure physics as her reason, as her evidence. Pure physics, no data, no empirical scientific evidence, not even a claim of the relationship that's, that is supposed to be underpinning all this. No data, just false statements and fear. And then she talked about abundant, cheap, clean, renewable energy, her words. Well, let's look at that, because solar and wind are none of these. Abundant? No. Intermittent? Unreliable. Cheap? No. Most expensive. Without subsidies, as Warren Buffett said, it's dead. They only live on subsidies. Alan Moran, the noted economist, has said that he's estimated the costs, using the government's own figures of climate subsidies and renewable energy subsidies, as being $13 billion every year, which is $1,300 per annum per household in Australia. For nothing. This is on top of energy prices. And for every clean energy job, there are 2.2 real jobs lost. As for clean, they rely upon rare earths that come from child labour in Africa. Kilcoy, solar panels, they're talking about those Cadmium, selenium will, re will leach into the soil, into the waterways, into Brisbane's water supply if that project goes ahead, that solar plant goes ahead. And what about afterwards? What do we do with these windmills after their 15-year life? They're burying them in, in Wyoming right now. Extra cost, extra pollution, real pollution. Solar panels are a real pollutant and they are now an environmental legacy. Again. There's a reason why windmills didn't last. And again, Senator Waters relies on no data, just false statements and fear. Then she cited nations declaring a climate emergency. Well, let's look at some of these. Japan is building coal-fired power stations. France relies on nuclear energy. Britain relies on the French nuclear energy through an interlinked cable. And Britain relies upon wood pellets burned in an old coal-fired power station from cutting down American forests, transporting them across using hydrocarbon fuels. And Germany is now building coal-fired power stations. Then Senator Waters quoted socialist Christiana Figueres, who has openly stated she's a senior bureaucrat in the UN in charge of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the governing body for this nonsense. She says openly, that the aim of the whole climate campaign is to convert the world to socialism and change the economic system. Change the economic system. Her words, not mine. Again, no data, just misrepresentations and fear. And that's all that Senator Waters is relying upon. The motion itself, well, we haven't got time to go into the motion itself. It's easily torn apart. But I will remind the, cha the chamber that 10 years ago, on the 7th of October 2010, I challenged Senator Waters in a public forum that we both attended as panellists 
to debate me on climate science and the corruption of climate science. She jumped to her feet faster than I've ever seen her move and said, I won't debate you. Five years later, on May 20, 2016, it's almost six years later, five and a half years later, she again refused my public request to have a debate. 440 days ago, on Monday 9th of, no of September 2019, I challenged her again and Senator Di Natale. Yet they continue. They refuse to debate me. They refuse to provide the evidence to the Senate. No data, no proof, no debate, just shout alarm. False statements and alarm. If the Senate keeps making decisions without data, this Senate ceases to be the People's House of Review and continues to be the circus of useless gestures, the big top of virtue signalling and the ministry of silly walks. Senator Hanson and I will continue to use the empirical scientific evidence, the hard facts, to continue to respect and restore the House of Review for the people of Australia. There is no climate emergency. There is a governance emergency. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy, Pre Deputy President. I'm a big believer in the power of civil society. Now, by that I mean we can often achieve so much more when local people get together to solve a problem in their own backyard in a way that suits local needs than we can by government intervention from afar. And there's three great examples that I'd like to mention today that really show us how Queenslanders, faced with a need, a problem to solve, a way they want to see the lives of those around them improved, are changing the face of our community. It's enough to give you goosebumps. The first is Priceless House. At Priceless House, any woman facing an unexpected pregnancy can find non-judgmental, caring support. The volunteers there are midwives, nurses and other women with relevant skills who are committed to helping women at this time of vulnerability. Usually the ladies who come through the door are alone. Some of them who come through the door are in seriously troubling predicaments, facing domestic violence, homelessness, addiction or being ostracised from family. And the ladies at Priceless House make it their mission to become another family for them. They don't just help with counselling and decision making in this unexpected position for these vulnerable ladies, but they help to connect them with pregnancy support throughout the term, arrange secondhand but quality supplies to help get a nursery up and running, and the pastoral care that they need to emerge from pregnancy stronger and more ready for the challenging job of being a parent. I am in awe of their loving and whole of mother approach to care of the vulnerable, and in doing so, they demonstrate something that I know they deeply believe that all lives, mothers and babies from all walks of life, are valuable and have something special to contribute to the world. Which brings me to another great Queensland organisation. Baby Give Back is a charity based in Varsity Lakes on the Gold Coast, and it's the brainchild of Carly Fragley. She started what she calls a hobby of collecting pre-loved baby goods when her children were growing out of car seats and prams. She thought that those gently used baby items still had life in them and wanted to make sure somebody in need could benefit from them. Carly, her sister Mindy and her team of volunteers believe that every baby deserves a safe start to life. So they work tirelessly to collect and safety check essential baby items for families in need. They're so committed to every baby having their needs met that they even buy essential baby items when demand is high. Everything from car seats to nappies. For most expectant parents, there is a joy that comes from preparing for a new arrival, picking out the perfect cot, a new pram or the perfect teeny tiny clothes. For some new parents, though, that experience is more like agonising over whether to buy nappies or food for their child because they simply can't afford both. 
or not knowing how they're going to get their child home from hospital without an installed car seat. What started for Carly as a hobby of helping to match pre-loved baby goods with new families has now become a full-time task for her and her team of volunteers. I was introduced to Baby Give Back by my state colleague, Michael Hart, the member for Burley. Together, he and I recently donated a bunch of new car seats for their team. But they have a Christmas appeal on right now that's about helping 240 families in urgent need to have that need met between now and Christmas. So, for those listening from afar, have you got some baby goods in good nick that could use a second life? Or a willingness to spend a few dollars to buy a few new items? Check out the web website for Baby Give Back. Give them a Google. There's 240 newborns for whom it will make all the difference. Every baby deserves a good start to life. And that starts with a safe place to sleep, to travel safely, to be warm, dry and fed. And it's easy to get emotional when you reflect about how there are some kids for whom that is not a given. But one by one, Baby Give Back are reducing that number with the help of so many Queenslanders. Finally, I wanted to give a shout out to the GAPDL, long acronym. Now that acronym stands for the Gladstone Area Promotion and Development Limited. And while that's ordinarily a group that looks after developing the tourism attractions of the Gladstone region and attracting new businesses to set up in Gladstone, it has a really interesting story in this space. A few years ago, it was noticed that there was a real need for more help for families in the region. In particular, there was a lack of opportunity for people who didn't have the parenting skills they needed to find a way to get them. Now, when you've grown up learning how to be a good parent by observing your own parents do a pretty good job, adjusting to being a parent yourself can still be a really steep learning curve. And I'm very happy to admit to that from my own experience. But when there are people who haven't had the benefit of those good influences, through no fault of their own, but through absent parents, the loss of a parent, mental health problems, addiction or the imprisonment of a parent, well, it's just that much harder without a good teacher. GAPDL saw a need. And even though it wasn't part of their usual remit, it didn't matter. They stepped into the breach. They established Gladstone Region Communities for Children. And they teach in a way that is basically community funded the Circle of Security Parenting Program helping to break the cycle of social problems with origins in childhood by giving parents they help, the help they need to learn to do this most important job in life well. Giving kids a secure attachment to those who care for them, a secure base from which to learn and explore the world around them, and a safe haven to return to when their developmental needs and their emotional stage require it, is life-changing stuff. And it's all done by a tourism promotional group that saw a need in their community and filled it in a way that is just perfect for the community in which they are situated and in many ways different to how you do it in any other place. It's one of those things about Queensland. It's so big and so diverse. The solutions it needs for problems are usually not one size fits all. But to those in Gladstone who had the initiative to take on this seemingly enormous and intergenerational issue, one step at a time, I'd like to say a very big good on you. With the support of local businesses and their donations, one that pops to mind is Ron Harding from Central Queensland Tool Supplies, who I know generously supported them recently. These civil society groups are in a way that no government ever could, with a diktat from afar, changing the lives of the people in their communities, changing the face of their local areas and offering 
um, hope and assistance to those with a real need now. And so to each of these groups, Priceless House, Baby Give Back and Gladstone Communities for Children, thank you for all that you do and thank you for the model you provide for all of us in Queensland for um, active citizenship by noticing what's going on in your area and not being afraid to step up and make a change when it's needed. Thanks. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I want to make a uh, contribution in this uh, time allotted for Senator's statements to compliment the, uh, the Senator's statement by Senator Walsh. And Senator Walsh has opened up an avenue of concern that is, I believe is going to continue well through the next uh, year of parliament, and that is about the ongoing battle to maintain dignity and security in the superannuation sector. And I just want to put this on the, on the, on the record straight up. Women currently retire with 47 per cent less than men. Women live five years longer than men on average. Uh, women only receive one-third of the government tax concessions on super, meaning men receive two-thirds. Forty per cent of older single women re retired women live in poverty and, ex and experience economic in insecurity in retirement. 46.9 per cent of the workforce are women. 44 per cent rely on their partner's income as the main source of funds in retirement. 8.5 per cent of women between 65 and 74 still have a mortgage. The average female salary is 44,000, including part-time workers. Uh, female graduates earn 5,000 less than male graduates in the same role. Women spend an average of five hours on uh, more hours per day caring for children than men. And consequently, we have this huge sector of the community, a productive, impossible to dispense with sector of the community, which is going to be hit by a brick wall of changes driven by the alleged paragon of family values, the Honourable Scott Morrison and the Honourable Josh Frydenberg accompanied by his acolytes in Senator Hume and Senator Bragg, who come out every time opposing what are quite reasonable increases in the superannuation guarantee. But worse than that, their document, your future, your super, worse than that, they come out with changes which they have proposed which are going to impact on women substantially more than males. And I suppose that's a reflection of the composition of their party in this parliament. I suppose that's a composition, the composition of their contribution of women in their cabinet. You know, if the Labor Party was even to stray off the path of equality, the fundamental difference between these two parties in this parliament is we are approaching equality of representation. The other side are not. The other side are not. Nowhere near it. And let's think about some of the changes this crew is proposing. They want to take trustees to be obliged to take the best interests of superannuation uh, recipients in retirement as their code, and they want to change it to the best financial Ooh, interest. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, how was it in the financial interest of any super member to have $36 billion taken out of their accounts? Because $36 billion less means there's a considerable sum less in retirement. So it was an expedient measure, an expedient measure driven by a government that you know, sought to put some money into the economy. And I don't say that those who took the money out um, did it not on prudent advice, but there's no checking. There's no checking by the ATO and others that people actually met the criteria for, take, for taking it out, because the ATO doesn't even check that the employers put it in. They don't even check that the employers put the money in properly. And that's been revealed at Senate estimates. That's re revealed at many inquiries that they don't even chase up unpaid super in people's accounts. So this government has a very low road reputation on super. And I predict that most of the debate in this chamber on this area, we will win. And I think Senator Bragg has an unenviable Quinella. And I am a racing man. I do have a punt. He's got a Quinella. He was wrong on the banks. 
Wrong on the Banking Commission. He admits it. He was wrong on FOFA. And don't worry, Senator Bag, the trifecta is coming. The trifecta is coming. You're wrong on super. You're wrong, you're deceitful, and your totally abhorrent views on super will not be successful. Because what you're doing is disenfranchising people who don't have the opportunity to make high wages, who don't have the opportunity to make significant after-tax contributions. You're making people who will eke out an existence supplemented by the pension or the other way around who will have a small lump sum to put them into retirement in some sort of comfort and then eke out an existence on the pension. You're trying to destroy something that is great about Australia, a $3 trillion pool of superannuation. You're trying to make out that that's a disgrace. You point to $30 billion worth of fees, 1 per cent of the entire pool paid out in fees, and efficiencies will be driven in that area. But you're doing it in a way that will disenfranchise women more than anybody else. Women more than anybody else will pay the price for your abhorrent views in this area. Your abhorrent views in this area. And as I say, that paragon of family values right at the top of the tree, the Hon. Scott Morrison is driving a campaign, ably assisted by the Hon. Josh Frydenberg and doubly ably assisted by Senator Hume and Senator Bragg. An absolute disgrace. But keep going, because we believe on this side in fairness and equity for all Australians, for those who don't earn $450 in a month and don't have any superannuation paid in. You know, we want a taxation office that actually says to an employer, guess what? If you don't pay your tax, there's going to be a penalty. And we want an ATO that says, if you've withdrawn your money in an incorrect manner, you can't do that. Instead of opening a sluice fund of $36 billion, which I believe will impact unfairly on the retirement incomes of women. Predominantly. Because if you've got two accounts and you're in a family and someone's got 150 and someone's got 20, which one are you going to close? Which one are you going to take it out? You know, your views in this area are going to come back and haunt you because we will win many, many, many more votes in this area and you will lose many, many more votes in this area because your views are abhorrent. Order. It being 2 p.m., questions without notice. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Can the minister confirm that the Morrison government has spent $500 million less on bushfire recovery than it has announced and has failed to spend a single cent from its $4 billion emergency response fund on resilience or mitigation works? Why is the Morrison government failing to deliver to help Australians recover and prepare for bushfires? The Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator, for your question. Um, what I can confirm, Senator, is that, um, that every person that has been impacted by bushfires, all bushfire-affected communities, uh, that we absolutely are committed to standing by them to support them in their recovery. Um, in reference to the numbers that you have just put on the table in relation to the bushfire, Recovery Fund and, and the funding that is made available on an annual basis to support bushfire mitigation into the future um, is a fund that is put in place and it has a very specific purpose and it also has some very specific conditions around it, Senator. Uh, and one of those conditions is that that the all other sources of funding to support bushfire recovery have been expended before that particular fund comes into effect. And the $200 million annually that is made available as a dividend from that fund to support our recovery and our mitigation um, pro, uh, activities going into the future. As you would be uh, well aware, um, that we have spent more than $1.8 billion um, in support um, of our bushfire recovery. Uh, you know, $1.2 um, billion, if you'd like me, um, I'm quite happy to go through and to table um, in relation to the areas in which that $1.2 billion has been spent. But uh, you conflate a number of issues, Senator. You conflate there is a significant difference between uh, the bushfire recovery expenditure that has already occurred today 
create through a myriad of different programs that have been administered across many, many portfolios in government. And the fund that you refer to, which refers to the money that is put aside to assist Australia in putting in place mitigation factors, uh, mitigation factors into the future, which, as I said, Senator, it requires all other forms of funding to have been expended before that one is activated. Senator, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In, B in Bega and Cabago, towns devastated by the last bushfire season, community organisations are still crowdfunding to upgrade toilet blocks and build evacuation centres in preparation for this bushfire season. Why are communities being forced to crowdfund for toilet blocks and evacuation centres while the Morrison government's $4 billion emergency response fund sits untouched? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. But as I have said to the Senator on numerous occasions, there has been a, a, a huge range of programs put in place to assist our bushfire affected communities, uh, including the, the, the communities in which Senator refers. Uh, and, and if you'd like me to, I'm quite happy to go through a number of programs. You know, for instance, the support that's been provided uh, you know, to some small businesses in, the, in these communities. But the fund to which you refer uh, Senator, is a specific fund with a specific purpose, with a specific set of criteria. Uh, and, and Senator, uh, the funding that once all other funding has been exhausted, that fund will come into effect, and that fund is in place into the future to make sure that we are always in the place year after year after year to be able to put funding in place to assist these communities to prepare for next year. The funding which is currently being expended is the Bushfire Response and Recovery Fund from 2020. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister says he doesn't hold a hose, but he does hold the taxpayer's checkbook. Why hasn't he delivered the funding he announced? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Senator, I reject the premise of your question because I believe the Prime Minister has um, not only um, has been a, a very strong Prime Minister in making sure that funding has immediately been made available to many communities across Australia, um, and, and, and that funding is out the door, as I have already said. Uh, the total spend on the bushfire recovery has been $1.8 billion, and this, uh, this includes the National Bushfire Recovery Fund and existing support mechanisms. Um, so, Senator, you conflate two different funding pools. You know you're conflating two different funding pools uh, because they have two different purposes. The bushfire recovery uh, funds that have been made available to our communities that have been so devastatingly impacted by bushfires have been expended in our communities. The fund to which you refer to has a completely different purpose. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison Liberal National Government's strong budget measures and economic leadership is ensuring our comeback from the COVID-19 recession? Order, the minister representing. Can we, can we at least let the minister commence his answer before we get disorderly interjections? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Mr President, the Australian economy is proving to be remarkably resilient as it strengthens Order. and comes back from the COVID-19-induced recession. Senator Today, Kennelly. the national accounts for the September quarter show that the recovery of the Australian economy is well underway. The Australian economy grew by 3.3 per cent for the September quarter, the strongest quarterly growth rate since 1976 and ahead of market expectations of 2.5 per cent. It follows, of course, the COVID-19 induced 7 per cent fall in the June quarter. Technically, the COVID-19 recession may, in a technical sense, be over, but our recovery continues and the government knows that there is significant hard work ahead. We know that many Australian households and businesses continue to do it very tough. But pleasingly, the national accounts saw growth strong growth in every state except Victoria for the September quarter. Our growth is being driven by household consumption, which grew by 7.9 per cent for the quarter, the largest increase on record. It contributed some 4 per cent to real GDP growth for the quarter. Consumption was up across 17 categories, with the largest contributors being health, 
hotels, cafes and restaurants, many sectors where small businesses and employees have been doing it tough, and we welcome very much the fact that they are coming back strongly in terms of their recovery. Our government's goal has been to make sure that Australians are safe from the virus and to keep Australians in their jobs and to help them to find a job through these tough times. We have been succeeding in these goals. Over the last five months, 650,000 jobs have been created, with the effective unemployment rate down from a peak of 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent. The Morrison government strongly contributed to this recovery with $257 billion in direct Order, economic Senator support Birmingham, and continues to invest. Expired. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister advise how our economic comeback has been upgraded by the latest report from the OECD? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the OECD has released its latest economic outlook report, and that report has upgraded Australia's economic growth outlook. Order. The OECD notes that the COVID-19 pandemic Order. continues to exert a substantial toll on economies and societies, with global GDP expected to contract by 4.2 in 2020, and indeed across other advanced economies an average fall of 5.5 However, in Australia, the OECD has improved their forecast for Australia. Previously, they had forecast a 4.1 per cent contraction. They now expect that to be 3.8 per cent. This, of course, is well above and better than the forecast for those other advanced economies. It's proof yet again that Australia's successful management of the health crisis and the economic crisis is delivering improved and better results for Australians compared with the rest of this world facing Order, global Senator pandemic. Senator Birmingham. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline any other economic news that shows how the government is building a stronger and more secure post-pandemic Australia and ensuring our comeback? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, sir. thanks, Senator McGrath and Mr President. Well, yes, indeed, leading up to uh, today's GDP data, we've seen uh, a range of different data points that show the recovery is well and truly underway. Unlike those opposite who seem to think that this is all just a political game that they can heckle and jekyll about, ultimately these are serious issues that deal with the lives, jobs and businesses of Australians. We're pleased to see consumer confidence is up 2.9 per cent. Indeed, it's increased for 12 of the past 13 weeks. Payroll jobs data was up again this week. This is the third consecutive fortnight in which we have seen positive payroll jobs data. Building approvals rose by 3.8 per cent in October to be 14.3 per cent higher through the year. These measures are all about ensuring better job security for Australians, better prospects for Australian businesses and the recovery of Australia's economy from this global pandemic. Or Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Dr Lowe, confirmed that unemployment in Australia will remain high for at least the next two years, saying, and I quote, a further rise in the unemployment rate is still expected. The unemployment rate is forecast to decline next year, but only slowly and still to be around 6 per cent at the end of 2022. Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when there are 2.4 million unemployed or underemployed Australians and the jobless queues are still growing? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for your question. The Order. Governor of the Reserve Bank uh, had some things to say today as well. He did. To quote him, he said, Senator We have Watt. now turned the corner and a recovery is underway. No, it does, Senator, it does, and it's offensive that you would suggest otherwise. It matters a great deal, and indeed, in my first answer, just given uh, to the previous question, I was very clear in acknowledging that there are Australian businesses and households who are still doing it tough. We know that. This is a global pandemic that Australia has faced, and we've faced it Order. better than the rest of the world. And we've faced it as a nation. We don't take full credit as a government by any means. We know this has been a partnership, a partnership with hardworking Australians, a partnership with Australians in business who have Order. come through this at tough times, a partnership with the states and territories Order. in terms of their responses. At every step Senators of the way, we Gallagher. have sought 
to work with Australians to get the results that have kept Senator Australians McAllister. in a much better place. Now, I don't know whether those opposite would rather be in any other country Senator of the McAllister. world right now, but I tell you what, most Australians know they would rather be here, because in Australia they are safer than they would be in virtually any other country in the world. And in Australia, their jobs and their businesses and their livelihoods are safer than in virtually any other advanced economy around the world. That is the result of the type of policies that have been deployed across Australia. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the crisis is over. Far from that, we know very well there are more Australians to get back to work. There are more Australian businesses still doing it tough. That's why the budget we handed down this year, our economic recovery plan, focuses on job creation, investment driving, the things Order, that will Senator help the Birmingham. recovery Senator continue. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. The Reserve Bank Governor also said, and I quote, in the September quarter the wage price index increased by just 0.1 of a per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher over the year. Dr Lowe went on to say that wages growth would continue to be subdued going forward. Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when workers and families have suffered with stagnant wages and will continue to under this government? Senator Birmingham. Oh, Mr. President, Mr. President, order. The government is absolutely focused on getting Australians back into work and creating strength in the employment market yet again. When we went to the last election, one of the key achievements that we took to that election was the creation across the Australian economy of more than one and a half million jobs during the work of our first six years in government. And it absolutely devastates us, as we know it does many parts of Australia, at the fact that this pandemic has created chaos in many of those jobs and, of course, the households who depend upon them. But what we do welcome is the fact that we've seen 650,000 jobs come back, recreated, over the course of the last five months. This is about making sure that we do get Australians back into work and that in getting them back into the work, we recreate strength in the labour market and through that across the wages Order, market Senator too. Birmingham. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Uh, Minister, three million Australians are currently relying on JobKeeper and JobSeeker to get by. 2.4 million people are out of work or not getting enough hours. 337,000 young people are on the unemployment queues, with more to join them by Christmas. Why is the government congratulating itself on the economy when widespread economic pain is being felt by millions of Australians who are being left behind by the Morrison government? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, let me again deal with uh, this attempt by the opposition to run some sort of congratulatory theme. The only congratulations I offer are to hard-working Australian businesses and their employees who have come through these tough times. They're the ones that we congratulate for the fact that they have absolutely responded to this crisis with support from the government. No doubt with support from the government. You cited some of those supports, Senator. You cited them in terms of JobKeeper, the single largest intervention in an Australian economy ever. We created it. Our government has extended it. We created it and we extended it, but in this year's budget we also outlined the next steps in terms of the economic recovery, outlining the fact that driving private sector investment is about job creation for the long term, sustainable jobs for the long term, getting the investment that absolutely generates business growth for Order, jobs growth Senator to keep Birmingham, it going. Time for the answers expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the latest ABS labour force figures for October show the underlying resilience of the Australian economy and how the Morrison government's economic leadership through the COVID-19 pandemic has supported jobs and our economic comeback? Order. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Chandler for her question. And Mr. President, when the Treasurer earlier today Order. was updating the Australian Order. public on the national accounts, this is what he actually said. The road ahead will be long. It will be hard and it will be bumpy. But the Australian economy has demonstrated. Sorry, Senator Cash, could I ask you to move to the next microphone and I'll ask the broadcasting to move to the next mic speak into the next microphone at the vacant seat. If broadcasting can turn that on, there was some static from your, yours. Sorry. 
Maybe no well, mic at all. Uh, if I, I know. I'm no having, trouble, I'm having yes. trouble hearing the minister, so I'm not going to ask them to turn it down due to disorderly interjections. Please continue, Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, as I was saying, the Treasurer said that the Australian economy has demonstrated remarkable resilience. And it actually has. Because what today's accounts show is that the Morrison government's economic plan is helping to create jobs, it is helping to boost our economic recovery, and it is helping to secure Australia's future. And as the Leader of the Government said, we have now seen GDP growth in the third quarter return to positive territory, growing by 3.3 per cent. And Mr President, this is reinforced by the latest labour force figures for October, which do show that with the further easing of restrictions across Australia, businesses being able to reopen their doors, jobs are returning to the economy. And in fact, the labour force figures for October they show that labour market conditions across Australia do continue to recover, with employment increasing in October by 178,800 over the month. And indeed, Mr. President, when you look at what the market expectations were versus what the employment growth actually was, 178,800, it far exceeded market expectations. And when you look at the breakdown, the breakdown of those jobs, full-time employment increased by 97,000. This is the largest monthly increase on record, and part-time employment rose by 81,000. 800. We also saw an almost 1 per cent increase in the participation rate. So Australians are putting up their hands and they are saying we want to go back to work. But Mr President, this doesn't happen by accident. This happens because of the strong Order. policies Senator that the Cash, Morrison time government for the is putting has in expired. Play. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the October results build on the jobs recovery we've seen in recent months and how many Australians have found work again since the pandemic began? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, as we recognise, as the Prime Minister recognises, as the Treasurer recognises, there remains a long road to recovery. But what Australians also want to know is that we are on the right track. They want to know that the policies that we are as a government putting in place to support them and to support their employer in keeping their jobs are open are actually working, and they are. In fact, Mr President, more than 75 per cent of those who lost their jobs have returned to work. That is actually a good thing for those people. 75 per cent who lost their jobs are back at work. And when you look at the last five months, around 648,000 500 jobs have returned to the labour market since employment fell to its lowest level in May. And pleasingly, as uh, Senator Payne knows, almost 343,800 jobs were actually for women. Australians actually want to be given hope, and certainly Order. the employment Senator Cash, figures time do for the just answer that. Has expired. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the coalition government had put in place the economic policies to support the creation of 1.5 million jobs. How will the government continue to support the recovery of the labour market and build on this record of supporting job creation? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the resilience of the labour market is actually on show with the employment figures, and in particular over the last five months. But that is because Australia entered COVID-19 from a position of economic strength. That is actually a good thing. You want to enter a pandemic from a position of economic strength, because what it means is you have a chance of surviving it. And that is exactly what we are seeing happening. As we know on the government side of a chamber, Governments don't create jobs. Employers do. Businesses do. Our role as a government is to put in place the economic policies that will help businesses keep their doors open, prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And that is exactly what we're doing. And that's why we have our job maker plan. It builds on our strong economic record, empowering businesses to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians, which is what we want them to do. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Cash, representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Minister, given the government is underwriting key domestic routes through the Domestic Aviation Network Support Program, or DANS, and that state borders are reopening, what discussions or agreement has government reached with the major airlines about the prospect of returning flights to normal by Christmas? 
The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator Griff uh, for the question. Uh, Senator Griff, my understanding is, or I've been advised, the government is actually having, as you know, ongoing discussions, ongoing discussions uh, with the nation's domestic airlines uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will continue to do that, uh, because, as you know, the aviation sector uh, it has been severely, severely impacted. Uh, by COVID-19. Both domestic flights and international flights are down significantly. Um, and unfortunately, thousands of workers, thousands of workers uh, in the sector have been stood down. You'd also be aware, though, that in terms of the support that we've provided to date, it's around $2.7 billion uh, so far to support the aviation sector. This includes support to maintain minimum air services across Australia including over 400 return flights per week to more than 120 locations, of which more than 110 are regional or remote. $120 million has been paid to airlines to support critical connections on Australia's major routes, and over $30 million has been paid to airlines to ensure essential regional air networks uh, can be maintained. As you know, though, uh, the reality is international borders are still closed, and as such, the Australian government wants domestic travel to get back to normal as soon as possible. The recent challenge we've faced, though, has obviously been in relation to uh, state and territories at some time having their borders closed, uh, and sometimes at very short notice. But encouragingly, both Queensland and indeed my home state of Western Australia uh, have recently announced the opening of their borders to Victoria and New South Wales. And what we are now seeing as a direct response to that is increase um, or strong demand for flights returning already. But what we will do is continue Order, to talk Senator with Cash. the aviation Time sector. Time for the answers expired. Senator Griff, supplementary uh, question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, a number of my constituents and other constituents have experienced extraordinarily high fares in recent times. And an example I can give yesterday were a flight to Adelaide. Um, a number of flights were actually cancelled uh, in what appeared to be a move to uh, maximise loadings and profits for another flight that ended up being four times the price of the original. Um, what are you doing in relation to price gouging that some airlines appear to be undertaking? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Griffin. Certainly, the government's expectation uh, is that our nation's airlines, as we do with any business, uh, they abide by the nation's consumer laws and they are treating their customers fairly. The airlines are contractually required to provide commercially competitive ticket pricing on subsidised flights. Uh, the government support seeks to maintain a level of competitive tension in the domestic aviation market, uh, for example, by supporting both Qantas and Virgin on the same route. Under the domestic aviation network support, government assistance reduces in direct proportion to the revenue airlines earn on supported flights. Uh, and under the contracts, airlines provide weekly data in arrears at the time of invoicing to access commerciality triggers to enable the department to confirm if commerciality triggers actually apply. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Minister, a little bit of clarification on your last statement. But does the DANS underwriting agreement of flights continue to apply if an airline operates additional profitable services on a DANS specific route? And will you table the DANS agreement with Virgin and Qantas? Senator Cash. Uh, Senator Griff, my understanding is that in uh, relation to the domestic aviation network support contracts, uh, the contracts with airlines are actually commercially confidential and as such uh, are not for publication. Uh, and in relation to the second part of your question, um, I would need to take that on notice and provide you with that information. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Um, uh, my, my question Order. is to the Minister Senator representing Keneally. the Minister for Resources, Water Senator and Northern Gallagher. Australia, Senator Rustin. Because I live in central Queensland, I know how important mining jobs are to all of our communities and all through right throughout regional Queensland. Can the minister, can the minister update the Senate on the outlook for mining projects that will continue to employ 
thousands of regional Australians. Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Order. Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Canavan, for your question uh, and understanding the huge importance that the resources sector plays in Australia, but particularly up your way in uh, in Rockhampton uh, in that economy. And the government in which we are a member, the Morrison McCormack government, understands how extraordinarily important uh, that the resources sector is and the role that it plays in creating jobs yeah. and investment in Australia, but particularly in regional Australia. The sector is an absolute key pillar of our economic prosperity, and it will be absolutely crucial to ensure that Australia's economic recovery is strong. Uh, in fact, in August this year, the resources industry was employing over 247,000 Australians, and that's an increase of more than 6,000 since February. Um, and we know the importance of giving regional Australia the best opportunity, and we will continue to back the resources sector as one of the largest and most important employers in Australia. And even in the midst of the once in a century, the largest economic shock in a hundred years, this sector continues to support um, our regional communities and, committed, and, and provides great support and commitment to the training of new workers, with some 8,500 new workers have been recently trained. Uh, and the latest report on resources and energy major projects for 2020 identified a really bright future for many of our major resources and energy projects, including a 19 per cent increase from last year in a number of major resources and energy projects under development currently in Australia. And these 335 projects have a value of $334 billion. Uh, and as the Prime Minister said, our focus right now is protecting Australia's health securing jobs and livelihoods and setting Australia up to make sure that we are stronger when the coronavirus is over. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Th thank you, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the Minister please outline how the Liberal National Government is supporting regional resources communities to build new industries and create new jobs across regional and rural Australia, particularly across northern Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, whether it be gas, whether it be iron ore, whether it be critical minerals, our resources industries continue to invest in our economy, bringing jobs and long-term security to regional Australia and regional Australians. And the recent resources and energy major projects report identified the broad spread of opportunities that exist uh, in the resources investment across Australia, including Queensland and the Northern Territory. And as, uh, as you probably are aware, Senator Canavan, in Queensland alone there are more than 50 projects generating billions and billions of dollars for the Queensland and the Australian economy. Um, as well as the projects uh, in Major Canavan's home state, yesterday the Minister for Resources announced that we're helping fast track a $1.5 billion project to mine phosphate in Senator McMahon's home state of the Northern Territory. This project, which is 200 kilometres uh, from Tennant Creek, will operate for 25 years, creating 900 jobs in construction and five, Order. 250 Senator jobs Rustin. Senator ongoing. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, can I ask, is the minister aware of any risks to, to the mining industry and, and the jobs that uh, they provide in my home state of Queensland? Order. Order on my right. You're not meant to make your own minister's time difficult to be heard. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the one thing I can absolutely assure you, Senator Canavan, is this government, the government of which you and I are a member, remains absolutely committed to supporting the resources sector in this country. And that's why, in the 2021 budget, the Morrison McCormack government invested $125 million to extend the Exploring for the Future program for another four years and $52.9 million for the gas-fired recovery package. This investment is absolutely crucial uh, for Australia's economy, especially now that our internal borders are, able, are starting to open up. These measures attract investment, they deliver jobs and they secure a reliable, low-cost energy pipeline for manufacturers, industries and for households. And I know, Senator Canavan, you've been a very vocal supporter of the expansion of the new Ackland mine in the Darling Downs, and it was really disappointing uh, that we've been waiting several years for its approval by the Queensland government. Investing in mining is a great opportunity for this country. Order. Senator Seward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is, the, is to the Minister for uh, Social Services, Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, on the first of, through you, President, on the first of January 2021, the new rate of the coronavirus supplement will result in an extra 1.16 million people living below the poverty line. Is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank Senator Seawitt for her question. The one thing that the Morrison government, uh, Morrison McCormack government, is absolutely committed to um, is to making sure that we support all Australians by providing um, a safety net for those people who find themselves without work. Um, but Senator Seawitt, um, we recognise that, that we have been through a once in a hundred year crisis and the impact of that crisis has been severe across our entire economy and that's why we put in place the coronavirus supplement and a raft of other measures to support Australians through this crisis. As part of that, we have made decisions um, on a regular basis about how much additional support um, that we need to continue to put into the economy to make sure that we support Australians through this really difficult time. Um, we put in place the coronavirus supplement back in March, and we continue to have that supplement in place. Uh, it continues in place at the moment for the three months to the 31st of December, and then from the 1st of January, it will remain in place at a rate of 150. Order. Senator Seawood on a point of order. Sorry, I asked. I kept my preamble really short, and I asked a pretty short question. So, could I ask the minister, through you, President, to get to my question, which is: Is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? Um, you're quite right. You had a short preamble. I mean, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. She is directly addressing the issue of payment and that payment and supplement, at least to what I've heard. I've allowed you to restate the end of your question. I can't instruct her how to answer the question, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, well, Senator Seawood would know very clearly that the absolute priority and policy of this government is to make sure that we work with the Australian economy, with the Australian public, with all Australians to make sure that we have a strong economy that creates jobs so those people who find themselves in a situation where they have, don't have employment, the jobs are created so they are, are able to get to work. Because we know, as you know, Senator Seawood, that people who, um, who are working have a higher standard of living than those that find themselves having to rely on welfare. But the most important thing that we can do is to support Australians um, through the appropriate policy settings that we have put in place through this once-in-a-century in a pandemic to make sure that that ongoing support reflects a very clear balance between supporting Australians and recognising the shallow jobs market, but at the same time we need to make sure that we put the right incentives for Australians to re-engage with Senator the workforce. Rustin, Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. 1.1 million children are living with parents who receive the coronavirus supplement. What do you say to these children who will miss out on a proper Christmas this year because there is no certainty about the job seeker payment? Good question. Senator Rustin. Well, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and I'd once again thank you, Senator Seward, for her follow-up. Question. Um, I obviously don't accept the, the premise of her question. I think that the, uh, the government, of which I am a member, has worked very hard this year to make sure that we put additional supports in place for all Australians. And those supports remain in place today, and they will remain in place after Christmas into the first three months of 2021. And we will continue to monitor the situation to make sure that we balance the supports that have been put in place to make sure that Australians are supported through this particular pandemic. And, and as Senator C would be well aware, the government has always been committed to making sure that our welfare system is targeted so that we are providing the level of support that individuals uh, to, to make sure that individuals get the support that they need to recognise their individual circumstances. So I reject the premise of your question that you first asked, Senator Seawood, and this government remains committed to supporting all Australians. Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question. The Productivity Commission recently found that mutual obligations and the income support system is exacerbating people's poor mental health. Do you agree that the low rate of income support and the punitive mutual obligations are making Australians' mental health worse? Wouldn't it provide certainty with a permanent ongoing increase of, job, of the job seeker payment being in place? Wouldn't that help the nation's mental health? 
Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The one thing that we are absolutely committed to is to make sure that Australians who want to work have the opportunity to be able to go to work. Because, as you rightly point out, uh, Senator Seawitt, people who um, who are, find themselves without work um, find themselves in a more difficult situation and have lower uh, levels of, of personal well-being than those that are working. And that is why we are absolutely committed to make sure that we uh, put job creation at the absolute top of our agenda, at the same time providing yeah. levels of support to support all Australians through this pandemic. Um, the government um, released the final report um, to, in the Productivity, uh, Productivity Commission report to which you referred on the 16th of November, and we will very, very carefully uh, um, consult with stakeholders in relation to the findings in that report. Uh, and we will deliver a very comprehensive whole of government mental health and suicide prevention response to that report in the coming months. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. South Australia produces half of Australia's wine and 80 per cent of our wine export exports. Exports to China reach $1.2 billion annually. What is the government's estimate of the prospective losses to the Australian wine industry and specifically to South Australia as a result of China's punitive tariff decision? and the effective exclusion of Australian wine from the Chinese market. How much damage will China's tariff do? Uh, what is the likely time frame for any Australian complaint about a, a China's outrageous actions uh, to the World Trade Organisation? And is it not the case that the WTO's dispute resolution process could take well over a year, likely much longer? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Patrick, and, uh, for your question and also uh, some heads up time uh, in, about the subject that you will continue to ask about. Well, obviously, Australia is extraordinarily disappointed by the, uh, the, the actions of China um, to seek to impose a, a provisional anti dumping measure of between 107 and 212 per cent. Um, the Australian government is absolutely unaware of any evidence that Australian wine exporters have dumped their products in the Chinese market, um, and Australian exporters, we acknowledge, have worked very, very hard to establish themselves in that market. Uh, however, right now the most important priority of the government is to work with the Chinese Minister, Ministry of Commerce um, for the 10-day period which we are currently allowed to make submission uh, in writing um, by the affected parties in response to this announcement. Um, Senator, I also understand that as uh, today, I'm not sure whether they have or they're about to meet the, the Minister for Agriculture, along with Senator Birmingham, the Minister for Trade, uh, will be meeting with the Chief Executive of the Australian Wine and Grape and Wine uh, Association, uh, Tony Batlane, uh, to discuss with them the implications of, of this particular um, action, should it be successful, um, on the Australian wine industry. Um, there is no doubt, Senator Patrick, that the impact, should this action be successful uh, and these pre provisional duties get brought into place, would be significant on our home state. Um, as you would be aware, um, of the $1.07 billion worth of wine exported to, to China, uh, over $800 million of that is actually comes out of our home state in South Australia. So right now we will continue to work with the industry to assess the impact should this go ahead, but our first priority must be to make sure that it doesn't happen in the first place, and we have a very short time frame in which to make that happen with the 10 days in which we have to make those written submissions. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Given that China's Ministry of Commerce first announced that it was targeting wine imports in late August, three months ago, what plans for immediate assistance to our wine industry is the government now ready to implement? Will the government provide financial system, uh, assistance, such as loans, to help families, uh, family wine growers and, uh, uh, and, and makers survive in this abrupt, disruptive uh, event? And indeed, uh, what are you going to do in respect of international, Order. other Senator international Patrick. markets? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Patrick. Well, I, I, I wasn't in the meetings that um, that the trade minister and the agriculture minister had with the wine industry today, or, or are having with the wine industry today, where I'm sure that they will be discussing a number of things by which the Australian government can support the Australian wine industry um, through these particularly difficult times. But 
One thing I can tell you is that the government has, over recent um, months and years, uh, working, for instance, to open up other trade um, market opportunities. Um, for instance, through the trade, the agricultural councils that have been put in place in many of our um, highly um, profitable other trade markets. Uh, I believe we now have 22 trade councillors uh, that are working through the ASEAN countries to make sure that we continue to successfully um, build markets and get favourable trading arrangements with these emerging markets. Um, we also do things like the Export Market Development Grant Program, their free um, seminars and, tra and, uh, and trade advantage Order, opportunities. Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In light of China's punitive actions, will the government suspend the wine export charge, the wine research levy, and the grape research levy, which industry pays to Wine Australia, which in recent years has spent time advocating for in the in the Chinese market? Will the government replace those industry le levies? with a substantial increase in direct budget funding this year and across the Ford estimates for Wine Australia to ramp up its activities, especially to promote things outside of the Chinese market. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Patrick. Well, well obviously, um, I am not in a position to come in here um, and advise you of, of policy of which I am unaware. But one thing I can absolutely tell you, Senator Patrick, is the Australian government has will and will continue to back our exporters. Um, you know, for instance, you know, the, the government has a track record of, of standing up uh, for our wine exporters. Um, you know, we took um, uh, Canada to the World Trade Organisation and Canada agreed back in July this year to remove its tax and sales restrictions discriminating against Australian wine following Australia's initiation of uh, a World Trade Organisation dispute is an example of where we have demonstrated our willingness to back our, our exporters and our wine exporters particularly. Uh, and we will make sure in this particular instance that we work through all options to make sure that we can push back against this anti-dumping claim made by China so that our exporters are not unfairly dealt with. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rushton. The Royal Commission into the 2019-20 bushfire season recommended developing a national aerial firefighting capability warning and I quote, the increasing duration of fire seasons in the northern and southern hemispheres and the increasing duration and severity of fire seasons in Australia will make it increasingly difficult to share aircraft domestically and to acquire aviation services when we need them. The Morrison government dismissed this recommendation, claiming that the government is comfortable with current arrangements. Why? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and, and I thank Senator Chisholm for the question and um, inform him that there's no H in my name. Um, but um, look, thank you very much. Y you raise a very, very important issue. Aerial firefighting plays an extraordinarily important role in protecting uh, communities' essential infrastructure and providing the vital support that our bushfire fighters on the ground so importantly need. Um, also, the National um, Aerial Firefighting Centre is an effective method for the government to be able to deliver critical emergency management capacity. And I know that the commissioners and the fire, uh, chief fire officers within each jurisdiction work very closely with that centre to determine the type and location of aerial firefighting assets based on the assessed bushfire risk. Um, this collaborative approach is absolutely essential uh, right now as we enter into the bushfire season. We remain absolutely committed to supporting this important emergency management capability, and we know that our aerial firefighters are integral to the safety of our communities as they fight fires and deliver important resources when and where a disaster might strike. Uh, in fact, we announced a permanent increase in funding to the centre of $11 million a year, taking the annual contributions to in excess of $25 million. Um, Additionally, um, we, the government supplements the operating costs um, of aircraft um, through the disaster recovery funding arrangements with the states and territories. Oh, sorry, oh. Senator Gallagher, a point of order. Um, Mr. President, we've had more than half the time now um, relevance. The question was specifically about the recommendation uh, from the Bushfire Royal Commission and why the government had dismissed it. If the minister wants to table the brief she's reading from, we're very happy to allow that to be tabled. Because, um, but 
an answer to the question would be um, preferable. I am listening to the minister's answer. Um, I've allowed you to restate that. I, I think when a question is asked why a particular action is taken or not, not taken, that, that is relatively open-ended. And as long as the minister is directly relevant to the subject matter, and I understand, at least if I correctly understand, she is talking about aerial firefighting capacity, I believe that is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Uh, look, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government has noted recommendation 8.3 of the Bushfire Rural Commission final report, uh, and concerning the Commonwealth, state, and territory governments adopting procurement and contracting strategies to develop a broader sovereign aerial firefighting capability. The government has clearly stated it has no intention of taking over the role of the states and territories, but it will work closely with them to ensure that we support aerial firefighting to keep Australia Order, safe. Senator Rustin. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Royal Commission's report noted there were inconsistencies during the last bushfire season, and, and I quote, the requests for aerial firefighting assistance were not fulfilled because there were no aircraft available. Why did the Morrison government fail to ensure requests for aerial firefighting assistance were fulfilled? No plan. No Senator plan. Rustin. Well, thank you Order. very much, uh, Mr President, and uh, I thank Senator Chisholm for his follow-up question. Um, I think, to a large extent, I have answered your question um, in the first part of my, uh, my question, uh, and that is that the Australian government is absolutely committed to making sure that we have a sovereign aerial firefighting capability that is appropriate for Order. the conditions that we find. Now, um, we have a very comprehensive response to bushfires. We continue to work across jurisdictions, uh, and including acknowledging Senator Reynolds and the huge role that the military played in supporting Australians and our firefighters during the terrible bushfires at the end of 2019 and into 2020. Order. We made absolutely committed to doing that. We also remain committed to making sure that there is a broad range of support put in place, whether it be making sure that we support telecommunications, whether we make sure that we've got wild five um, things in place. But in terms of our aerial firefighting capability, we are absolutely committed to providing and working with the Order, states Senator to Senator Rustin. This Senator battle. Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Why is the Morrison government refusing to deliver the aerial firefighting capabilities required to keep Australians safe? Senator Rustin. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, Senator, for, oh, through you, uh, Mr. President, thank you very much, um, Senator Chisholm, for your question. Well, I would refute uh, the, pre, uh, the context of the question that you have just put forward because I don't believe that the Australian government uh, is doing what you've accused it of doing. I believe the Australian government is absolutely supporting the Australian public in making sure that we put in the capabilities to make sure that we keep Australians safe. We put those things in place last year through some of the most devastating bushfires this country has ever seen, and we remain committed to working with the order. states and Senator territories. Senator Wong, on a point of order. The point of order, direct relevance, was a very, very specific question about the delivery of aerial firefighting capability, and I'd ask the minister to return to the question. If reminded the minister of the question, I will continue to listen closely. The question did ask why and then asserted a claim about the government. As long as the minister is directly addressing the claim and the subject matter within it directly, I think she's being relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I, I, to, to the point of Senator Wong, um, I refuted the, the accusation that was made and the premise of the question that was asked in the first place, because I believe that the Australian government is supporting our aerial firefighting capacity through 159 aircraft, uh, providing Order. 185 services. You know, and if you'd like me to do, I can list Order. or put on the record all of those capabilities. Order. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on the steps the government is taking to protect Australians against cybercrime? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for that question, and I also thank him for his enduring support for our nation's security. Malicious cyber activity is increasing in our nation in its frequency, in its scale and also in its sophistication. In the last financial year alone, the Australian Cyber Security Centre had over 60,000 uh, reported cases of cybercrime. 
Today, there's over two million small to medium businesses here in Australia. Their cyber resilience is absolutely critical to our post-COVID-19 recovery. And that's why today I launched a new national cyber security campaign for small businesses. This new campaign will empower Australians to take responsibility for their online security. Led by the Australian Cyber Security Centre, it will provide regular, easy to follow advice for all Australians on how to protect themselves. The campaign will particularly target the major cyber security threats that face Australian businesses, and that starts with the first publications on ransomware. This campaign will be as agile as the cyber criminals that we seek to defeat. This government has made an unprecedented investment in our nation's cyber security. This includes a $1.67 billion announcement by the Prime Minister through the National Cyber Security Strategy. It also includes a $15 billion investment in enhanced cyber and information warfare capabilities for the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Signals Directorate. But cyber security is a shared responsibility for all Australians. And I urge all Australians to go to cyber.gov.au for tips on how to act now, how to stay secure and how to protect themselves and their families online. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Can you advise the Senate of how the government is supporting Australian small business owners against ransomware attacks? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I also thank the Senator for his question. Australians need to be aware that it is not just large businesses that are being targeted by cyber criminals. Small and medium enterprises are also being targeted. Ransomware attacks now pose the highest cyber security threat to Australian small businesses. Over the last 12 months, the Australian Cyber Security Centre has seen a 50 per cent increase in ransomware attacks. This week, the government, through the Australian Cyber Security Centre, has launched two new guides on ransomware. These guides provide very practical and easily implementable advice for Australian businesses. They advise how to protect themselves, how to respond if they are subject to a ransomware attack, and also how to recover from these attacks. I urge all Australian businesses to visit cyber.gov.au to Order. download Senator these Reynolds. guides. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update on how the government is using its offensive cyber capability to protect Australians from cybercrime during COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and again, thank you very much, um, Senator, for that question. Globally, malicious cyber actors are taking advantage, quite shamelessly and cruelly, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This government has continued to strike back against highly organised and highly sophisticated foreign cyber criminals. We've done this through an offensive operation led by the Australian Signals Directorate. The Australian Signals Directorate has collaborated with the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission and also the Australian Federal Police, using its offensive cyber capabilities to attack cyber criminals' tools and to disrupt their business models. These criminals are simply ruthless, and they are attacking Australian and targeting Australians by tricking victims into downloading advanced criminal malware onto their mobile devices. This ASD-led operation has protected hundreds, if not thousands, of Order. Australians Senator Reynolds, from these crimes. Order, Senator Reynolds. The answer has crimes. expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the minister failed to tell the Senate the exact date on which the government first became aware that robo debt was not valid. On what date did the government first become aware that Mr. Morrison's robo debt scheme was not valid? Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank Senator Wong for her question. Um, I had the opportunity since yesterday to um, consider the question that was asked of me by Senator Gallagher, um, and I reject the premise of the question because at no time has there been a finding that the income compliance program was not valid. Order. Okay. They're your words. No, they're not. Order. They, 
Or uh, Senator Wong, Senator you've got Wong, the opportunity. You are wrong. Senator Rustin, Senator Wong, mm -hmm. Senator Wong, you've got an opportunity to ask a supplementary question. I believe the minister has concluded her answer. Senator Wong, um, a supplementary question. Uh, yesterday, the minister used those precise words, "not valid." So I again ask, when? I'm oh, sorry, you're right. It was on Monday. <laughs> On, uh, on Monday, you used precisely those words. I again asked the minister, uh, on which day did the government first beca become aware that the scheme was not valid? I also asked the minister how long it took between that knowledge and the Order. ceasing of Senator issuing Wong, of debt. Time for the question has expired. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and for the point um, to make sure that we are very, very clear. Uh, on Monday, I rose in this place and I was referring to income averaging as the method by which debt, uh, the method of debt collection. I have never said that, uh, and, and I was verbal by Senator Gallagher yesterday, that the income compliance program was not valid. They are very, very different things, Senator Wong. So I will stand by and I, uh, my comments, and I think that uh, it, the, those opposite decided to review. Um, what has actually been said in this place, they would see that I did not say what I was verbaled and uh, suggested that I said by Senator Gallagher. Um, so on that basis, Sen uh, Senator, uh, the, there has never been any finding Order, that the income compliance program Order. was not valid. Senator, w Order. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. To settle. The minister has made, my supplementary question is this. The minister has maintained that the government acted, and I quote, very quickly, and acted, quote, immediately. Given, oh, well, I'm quoting her. That's not verbaling. I'll take that interjection. Given it has taken 76 AAT decisions over two years, a hundreds of secret rejected AAT appeals, and the suffering of thousands of Australians, how can the minister stand by her statement that the government acted immediately? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, Senator Wong, I will stand by my comments that the government acted quickly, um, and I will reiterate the fact that, that when, uh, upon finding uh, and being made aware that uh, income averaging was not a valid means by which to generate a debt, the government acted almost. A, Straight away Order. to make sure that we ceased Order. that program and subsequently put Senator in place a program Senator to ensure that those people who had, had debts uh, Order. debts Please raised your seat, as Senator a result. Rustin. Senator O'Neill, when I call you to order five times consecutively, you shouldn't keep counting. Senator Rustin, please continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, so what I will tell this place is, on the 19th of November 2019, the government announced that going forward it would seek additional proof points when raising a debt. Uh, on the 29th of May this year, the government announced it would refund and zero approximately 470,000 debts raised using income averaging. As of the 30th of November, nearly all of those people have had their refunds completed. Order, Senator Birmingham. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher, Chisholm and myself. Right now, across Australia, we see dozens of bushfires. There are some happening right now in my home state of Queensland, uh, in particular on the World Heritage listed Fraser Island. Uh, there are also fires in New South Wales and other states as well. It's another reminder already that we are in the natural disaster season. As well as those fires happening in some parts of the country right now, it's of course also coming time for the first anniversary in so many parts of Australia of the terrible black summer fires that we saw last year. Uh, to give one example that I don't think anyone will forget, uh, the town of Cabago, devastated by fires, the scenes of those embarrassing visits by the Prime Minister after he came back from Hawaii, 
forcing people to shake his hands, scurrying off once they actually had something to say to him. Uh, and unfortunately, we still see residents and business owners in towns like Cabago being left behind by this government nearly a year after they experienced devastating bushfires. Only this week uh, on the Q&A program, which was, among other things, looking at how people are coping after the bushfires, a Cabago resident, Graham, said, and I quote, we've been politically and practically abandoned. That's how bushfire victims feel one year on from the bushfires, uh, around which, of course, they were abandoned at the time by the Prime Minister and his government. To, go, to give one example of that, the National Bushfire Recovery Fund. This was the Prime Minister's great response to the bushfires when he pledged that he would spend $2 billion on a National Bushfire Recovery Fund to assist survivors uh, of the bushfires recover. Of course, we discovered at Senate Estimates earlier this year that, in fact, that was a notional fund, a fund that didn't really exist and would only ever reach $2 billion if it really had to. And what we've seen recently is that the government is claiming to have spent $1.2 billion of that bushfire recovery fund. But again, at estimates, we uncovered that this is another example of the government making claims that just don't stand up to scrutiny. Because, in fact, that amount that the government claims to have spent from the bushfire recovery fund includes half a billion dollars that it has yet to distribute to the states. I don't know why it's so important for this government to misrepresent what it's actually doing for bushfire victims. Why not just admit that what you've actually spent is $700 million from the fund and that you will be spending another $500 million, rather than going out there and claiming to have spent $1.2 billion when it's actually a lot less? This is why bushfire survivors find it so hard to trust this government and why they feel so abandoned and left behind by this government. Because for all of the promises that the government has made to look after people, they continue to be left behind. Of course, we're also seeing not only this government fail to respond properly in terms of the recovery from last year's bushfires, but they are again uh, demonstrating that they are not prepared for the coming disaster season. Today, I accompanied uh, the Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, and the member for Eden Monero, Christy McBain, uh, in Braidwood, about an hour and a bit away, where we met with cadets. RFS cadets who are being trained through the local, local high school. That community was also hit by the bushfires last year and is doing a good job of recovering. But what they're doing in actually training up young people to assist them in the RFS is they're showing that they're preparing for what lies ahead this summer. And unfortunately, their effort is not being matched by their federal government. Again, to just give one example, uh, 18 months ago, in last year's federal budget, the government announced a $4 billion emergency response fund. We worked with the government last year to get the legislation through to, to establish that fund, and here we are 18 months on after it was announced, while fires are already happening around Queensland and New South Wales, and not a single cent has been sent from, spent from that emergency response fund. We are, we are already seeing fires in this country. We know from the Bureau of Meteorology that we face above normal numbers of cyclones and floods this year because of La Nina, and yet the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has a $4 billion fund sitting in his bank account that was established to help communities prepare for disasters that he hasn't spent, sent, spent a cent from. Now, the answer we always get from the government is that there are other funds available to assist people. Well, if that's the case, why are people still living in caravans in Cabago? Why are people in Bega and Cabago crowdfunding to build evacuation centres and toilet blocks? The fact is this government isn't delivering on its Thank announcements you, yet again. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note. And, and, um, I would like to hear from those opposite, um, particularly, who have been involved in active firefighting. I have been uh, down on the farm uh, and on my parents' property, and I know uh, my good friend Jim Molan is actively involved in his local fire service, and I would genuinely like to speak to those opposite, because I think there is a really important level of knowledge to be gained from actually experiencing a fire front, and it's truly a extraordinarily frightening uh, and confronting experience. Uh, my father and I were protecting our property uh, one day from a fire, and literally the pump stopped working. Uh, 30 seconds before 
the fire brigade, the bush fire brigade, arrived. Uh, the, the gutters of our house were on fire, um, so we certainly know what it means to both be in a, in, a, in a dangerous fire situation. And why I say I'd like to speak to those opposite who have experienced that is because I cannot believe that those opposite are politicising disaster preparedness in the way that they are here today. Uh, aerial firefighting capacity is not a silver bullet. Anyone uh, who's been involved in firefighting, who's been involved on the ground in a bushfire zone, knows that, yes, they have a role to play, but they are in no way a silver bullet that can replace people on the ground. When my father was a young man, um, there were hundreds, uh, thousands of people involved in the forest industry uh, from where I grew up down in Pemberton, uh, thousands of mill workers. In fact, the Warren district at that point was a safe labour seat because uh, the mill in town employed hundreds, thousands of blue-collar workers. But when the Labor Party walked away from that industry, they walked away from those workers, and the bush lost an extraordinary capacity for on-the-ground firefighting. Uh, at the same time, society has changed. We've developed the peri-urban areas. In the last decade, something like 300,000 new homes have been built in the peri-urban areas of Australia, i.e. completely surrounded, in most cases, by reasonably dense bush. Uh, that has created an environment where the risk of uh, disasters of this sort, um, including climactic conditions, are having a massive impact. But the idea that this is something we should politicise, that this is something that in any way we should seek to make political points out of. It's, it's very sad that the Labor Party uh, has, has, quite frankly, stooped to this low. The Emergency Response Fund, as, as some of my colleagues have, have noted in, in disorderly interjections, was voted for by the Australian Labor Party. Um, it, 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 um, cannot be accessed until advice is received that it is required and that all other funding sources have been depleted. That is its purpose. That is what those opposite and those on this side voted for. But we do provide significant funding for disaster preparedness from, uh, through other means—130 million in Commonwealth funds under the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, 37 million on uh, telecommunications resilience and, um, again, we know how important it is. If you can't contact uh, your local fire brigade, your local bush fire service, uh, your local emergency services in those situations, then um, you know, being on your own in those circumstances ex is extraordinarily risky. Uh, $8 million to work with the states and territories to develop a public service mobile broadband capacity, $2 million for the emergency alert capacity, uh, an enduring research capability with $88 million in new world-class disaster research centre. Uh, in, in the 30 seconds I have remaining, I think we've also got to make sure that we listen to those who had the experience. Uh, Roger Underwood from Western Australia was a, a good friend of my father's, spent a lot of time in the southwest forest of WA. He knew what it was like to fight fires on the ground. And I think the people in this place have an obligation to listen to people like Roger Underwood, people like Rich, Rick Snejak, people who actually had the experience, who have the experience of fighting these sort of fires on the ground. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And whilst I'm tempted to take Senator Brockman's opportunity to talk about my uh, bush firefighting experience, I, I fear that is actually self-incriminating if I were to tell that story, so I might leave that one for another day. Uh, but what I did want to talk about is the economy, and uh, there was some welcome news that we saw today, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, but I did want to actually go to the substance of the way this government deals with it. And what we saw, and we saw it from the press conference from the Treasury, we saw it in this chamber today as well, and is how quick they are to get out there and take credit. Uh, as soon as they are able to, they get out there and they take credit. Uh, we saw evidence in that from the question from Senator Gallagher today uh, to 
the leader of the government in the Senate. And whilst there's some welcome news, there is still overwhelming uh, evidence about how difficult, difficult it is for families out there as they try to recover from the COVID pandemic. And I think you've got to look at how the government operates, because this actually goes to um, the way, at the end of the day, that they treat Australians, uh, they treat Australian families. Uh, we see it today with the economy. Uh, we also saw it earlier this year, and as we've also highlighted through question time today, with their response to bushfires. Uh, we've also seen it in how they've responded to sports rorts as well, uh, let alone robo-debt, where there's a lack of accountability. There's a lack of answering the questions that we put to them, uh, trying to hold this government to account so that Australian families can understand uh, how they are responding to these challenges. Uh, we also know that they avoid accountability. Uh, so they go out of their way, whether it's by uh, lodging PII claims, by not answering questions, um, by failing to front up uh, and actually level with the Australian people. And at the end of the day, when you're in government, there actually requires a component of that, where you have to be up front with the Australian people. You actually have to be prepared to answer some of those tough challenges. And we see from this government, and it's from the Prime Minister down, he takes the lead role in this. Uh, always there, ready to announce the good news, but never actually to be up front with the Australian people uh, or actually say, we got this wrong, uh, like you should have done at the start of the year with bushfires, like they should have done uh, in response to sports rots. Actually been up front with the Australian people and said, we got this wrong, we're going to fix it up, we're going to fund those clubs that missed out. Uh, we've seen it with the bushfires again, a failure you know, who could not be forced into action after what they saw at the start of this year? Still seeing it today with those communities that are suffering. Uh, we've also seen it in response to international events as well. Um, all Australians were relieved when Kylie Moore was released, uh, and the Foreign Minister was all over it, uh, all through the media talking about it. Yet this week we've got a massive diplomatic incident with our biggest trading partner, and the foreign minister has not fronted the media once. Uh, the shadow foreign minister has, has been prepared um, to get out and talk about Australia's interest in this regard, but the foreign minister has been silent uh, all over the news the other week about Kylie Moore being released, but a failure to actually uh, show leadership. The member for Dawson, George Christensen, has done more media about this than the foreign minister, our biggest trading partner. This is going to cost jobs. Uh, this is going to have a negative impact on the economy, and the foreign minister is silent. So this is what we get from this government. Uh, when there's some good news around, you'll have the minister and others out there taking credit. But when there's actually the tough stuff to deal with, whether it's response to bushfires, uh, whether it's actually taking on responsibility for what happened with sports rots, whether it's the outrageous behaviour with robo debt, the government go missing in action. Time and time again, this is what we see from them. So we know, uh, we welcome that there is some encouraging news on the economic front, but we know the reality for Australians and for Australian families is going to be extremely difficult over the next 12 months. We know that this government are actually going to withdraw support early next year for those people who can't afford it. But that is what this government do. Uh, they actually don't make the hard decisions and the tough decisions and level with the Australian people and have a Prime Minister that actually is prepared to talk in the national interest. With this Prime Minister, there's only one interest, and that's himself. That is all he thinks about. He never thinks about the national interest. He never thinks about what's good for Australians. He only thinks about himself. And there's no better example of that than when you quarantine, you quarantine with your photographer. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Coming up to 18 months I've been in this place, uh, it's been a, a great honour to serve the great people of Western Australia. And uh, I think I can count on one hand how many times I've actually seen very serious and, and legitimate questions come from those opposite uh, that aren't covered in smear, questions that aren't covered in, in, uh, in all sorts of innuendo. And, 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 and very few questions that, uh, that might actually go to a, a point that is of significance for the Australian people. But what we see time and time again 
is, is people over here coming into this place and, 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 and describing things or putting uh, spin on, on particular topics and particular subjects to score, of course, a political point. And I don't think there's anything more shameful than coming into this place and trying to score a political point over something that is very, very serious to the people in this nation, particularly those that live in bushfire-prone areas. This line of attack is typical of Labor, thinking that blindly uh, committing to spending money can solve a problem with flashy promises and attack lines that really have very little substance at all. Labor's record in firefighting and land management is, is actually not very good. And Senator Brockman uh, spoke uh, about the importance of actually understanding what's involved. What's involved in dealing with bushfires, in understanding what's involved in making sure that we've got the preparedness for it. Uh, they and their friends in the Greens continually hamstring attempts to perform adequate backburnings. And we're seeing this in, in states uh, controlled by Labor and where there's a real Greens party influence in these states. And the disgraceful attempts in 2015 and 2016, where the, lay, where the, uh, uh, where, where the, the unions tried to unionise the, the, the CFA, the volunteers. That just demonstrates that uh, Labor sees bush firefighters, bush fire firefighters as, as just another political opportunity to boost union membership. Labor's record of politicising disaster relief is longer and stronger than their history of disaster management. Senator Murray Watt, the Shadow Minister for uh, Emergency Management, only last week accepted an invitation from the, to have a briefing from emergency management experts on our seasonal preparation. Just last week he accepted that. And that meeting, I understand, is happening a little later. But he moves today an MPI on this very subject, asks questions and then takes note of those answers here without ever actually allowing himself the opportunity to have the briefing. Oh, sorry. Um, Senator Watt. Senator Sullivan's misleading the, ha the chamber. Um, the briefing that I'm receiving this afternoon is actually about new legislation that the government intends Thank to you, introduce. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, please continue, Senator uh, O'Sullivan. But what we're seeing here, in any case, is a politicisation of a very, very serious, serious issue that this nation, of course, faced bigger than any, you know, any time in our history, really, when you compare previous fire seasons uh, you know, to the one that we had last year. I want to just talk briefly in the remaining time that I have, just to give some reassurance uh, to the Australian people of what this government is actually doing. Now, we accept that. Uh, the, the primary role of dealing with bushfires and bushfire management on the ground is delivered by state governments. And this government doesn't want, as the federal Commonwealth government, doesn't want to interfere with that at all, but rather provide the necessary support and, and resources to assist. Uh, and that can be done in many ways. And one way is through the Defence Force. So during uh, this year, we're, we're going to ensure that the ADF is poised to respond as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's streamlined and simplified its processes for state and territories to receive that support. Uh, we've set up joint task forces for each state and territory. We've ex exercised and validated its reserve call-out processes, and we've conducted response planning exercises with the states and territories and with the Australian government agencies, including the EMA and Services Australia. We've streamlined these processes so that we can act quickly when it's called upon by the states to ensure that that support is there. Uh, there are uh, many other things that uh, this government is doing. I haven't got time uh, in the 14 seconds that I've got, but Services Australia stands ready. Uh, we're, we're ready to, to deal uh, with any outbreak and, and dealing, of course, with people that require assistance from the Commonwealth Government through services and, and uh, funding, and that's there. Thank and you, Senator thank you. O'Sullivan. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, today we've heard Senator Birmingham crowing, crowing about the state of the economy, uh, literally shouting 
in this chamber shouting about the government's achievements. When we know that people are struggling to get back on their feet, when we know that people are crying out for a big and bold jobs plan, uh, when we know that people want a big picture plan, a plan of hope for their future, not slogans like the government's comeback slogan, a slogan that got a great workout uh, in the Senate today. Uh, and while I was sitting in the chamber um, hearing this slogan thrown around over and over and over again, uh, the government's comeback, I had the chance to look up the dictionary definition of this term, uh, the government's new favourite comeback term. Uh, and here it is, comeback, a return by a well-known person, especially an entertainer. An entertainer. Well, Australians do not need an entertainer in chief. Uh, we don't need an ad man in chief. Uh, what Australians need is a leader, a leader to take the country through this crisis, a leader with a plan, not a leader with a focus grouped slogan. We need a leader with a big and bold jobs plan, a plan that we are still yet to see from this Prime Minister, a plan that Australians need more than ever. We know that the Reserve Bank has said that it expects unemployment to stay high and above pre-pandemic levels until the end of 2022. So there is nothing to crow about here while people are still struggling to get back on their feet, while people are still hurting. There is no time for slogans. While 2.4 million people are unemployed or underemployed, and while the unemployment queues are continuing to grow, and while we continue in this country to experience record low wages growth, low wages growth that began well before the pandemic in this country uh, under this government. Uh, and there is no time to crow and there is no time to shout about achievements in this chamber whilst three million Australians are relying on JobKeeper and JobSeeker job to survive. Uh, and many of these people are the very people that the Morrison government is leaving behind. And this government, of course, finds it all too easy to leave people behind. Just look at the millions who missed out on JobKeeper in the first place when they needed it the most. The casuals, the freelancers, the temporary migrants uh, and so many more. Look at the hundreds of thousands of workers that the government has just left out of their plans for the JobMaker hiring credit. Uh, indeed, almost a million Australians aged over 35 have been left behind. Uh, and think about those Australians on JobKeeper and JobSeeker who are being left behind in just a matter of a few weeks' time when their incomes are cut while they are still struggling to get back on their feet. Uh, while their incomes are cut, despite the warnings from the OECD, despite the warnings from the Reserve Bank, the IMF uh, and every prominent economist that you could name who says that more needs to be done, that we need to maintain incomes and that we shouldn't be ripping support out of the economy too early. This government is leaving people behind in this recovery, just like the government is leaving people behind who have been devastated by bushfires in this country. Uh, but let's think about what Senator Rustin said today. According to the minister, uh, we're committed to standing by people affected by bushfires. Well, I doubt that people devastated by the fires last summer, who are still waiting for support, who are still waiting for the funding to rebuild, who are crowdfunding the things that they need to rebuild and get their lives moving again, are going to be impressed by that statement or are going to be comforted by that statement. The minister said today communities received funding immediately. Again, I doubt devastated communities who are still waiting for support are going to be comforted by that answer or indeed believe that answer from the minister today. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
against. I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. President, I rise today to take note of the minister's answers to my question, Minister Rustin's answers to my questions about the um, job seeker payment uh, as it relates to the coronavirus supplement and the Productivity Commission's report on mental health. First off, I asked the minister, I thought it was a fairly simple question, is, the government, is it government policy for people on the job seeker payment to live in poverty? Now, the minister spent two minutes not answering, very carefully not answering the question. Filibustering, I would call it, but did not answer that question. So, given the evidence that is before us, I'll answer the question, and that is yes, it obviously is government policy that people on the job seeker payment live in poverty, because in fact their actions speak louder than words, and their actions are with the cut to the coronavirus supplement that has already occurred, people are now living below the poverty line, and with the changes and the lowering of the coronavirus supplement that comes in on the 1st of January 2021 in just a couple of months to, or less than two months time they will definitely be in living in poverty they'll be dropped further into poverty so yes it is government policy that people should live on the job seeker payment in poverty the minister also then complete basically really didn't answer and ignored my question about all those children who will have a much deprived Christmas because their parents will be very aware that they have limited money at the present time, but even more limited when they come to the 1st of January, a week after Christmas, and their payments are cut again and they will be living in poverty. Now, I just wanted to quickly touch on the Productivity Commission report because this is very important when discussing these issues. Because the Productivity Commission's report, which I asked the minister about, does she agree that the low rate of income support and punitive mental health obliga uh, mutual obligations are making Australians' mental health worse? That's what the Productivity Commission says in their report on mental health. And the minister said, yes, obviously, oh, yes, they'll take their time. They're looking at the report. They'll take their time, um, but they need to take some time to review the report. Now, this was released on the 16th of November, but what the community needs to, to realise and know is that the government's had that report since the 30th of June this year. In other words, in time for their budget in October to, con to respond in a much more uh, formal and a much stronger way than the commitments they made in the budget. And while, of course, the commitments made in October are welcome, they are piecemeal and they are not done in response to the Productivity Commission report. But how this affects job seekers and those on income so support particularly is because the Productivity Commission report did find that the, most, the mutual obligations requirements and, uh, and our income support system does negatively impact and aggravate the symptoms and increase distress of those with poor mental health. The system itself is hurting people, which is why I asked the minister that question. Our income support system and the punitive approach to mutual obligations is aggravating people's ill mental health. It, the outcomes from uh, Job Active for participants in Job Active who have mental ill health are significantly worse, with 82 per cent spending more than 12 months on the program compared to 64 per cent for the wider Job Active population. It noted the challenges that people with ongoing mental ill health face when trying to re-enter the workforce. It, it found that people receiving income support were more than three times uh, likely to have depression than those that are paid employment. So we know, we know that people on the job seeker payments and who don't have work are more likely to have mental ill health. But we have a system that then aggravates that mental ill health and in fact in and of itself makes them stay longer on the support on the system because the system is making them sicker making them more unwell and the government couldn't and the minister would not then 
answer the question about whether she in fact agreed with the Productivity Commission's report, which makes me deeply concerned that the government is ignoring the fact that the very system that they say they've put in place to help people find work is making people more unwell. Again, Thank pointing you, to the fact Seawitt, reform your time is needed. Has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for 7 December 2020, proposing the disallowance of the coronavirus economic response package, deferral of sunsetting income management and cashless welfare arrangements determination 2020 and business of the Senate notice of motion number three standing in my name for 13 days after today proposing the disallowance of the continent's AIDS payment scheme 2020. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Um, are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall proceed to the placing of business and call the clerk to begin with, then I'll come to you, Senator Urquhart, if that's easier, to notify Postpone. postponements and extensions. Sorry. Postponement notifications have been received in relation to General Business Notice of Motion 853 for today to the 7th of December, General Business 854 for today to the 3rd of February 2021, General Business Notice of Motion 877 for today to the 3rd of December. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Brown for Wednesday, the 2nd of December, till Thursday, the 3rd of December, 2020, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, unless there's any other matter, and I'll commence with government business matter number three. Senator Dunningham. President, I ask that government business notice of motion number three be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Designs Act 2003 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Designs Act 2003 and for related purposes. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the first day of the next period of sittings. Senator Dunningham, Government Business Number 4. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion Number 4 relating to the consideration of a disallowance motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham, number five. Oh, Senator. Yep, Senator Dunningham. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number five relating to the days of meeting of the Senate for 2021 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham, government business number six. I ask that government business notice of motion number six relating to the estimates hearings for 2021 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Again, Senators, I'll endeavour to do this in the most convenient order possible. And I'll commence with 884. Uh, Senators Watt and Green. Senator Urquhart, is that one of yours? Mr President, uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 884 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. The motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Mr President. The Morrison government is committed to developing the north. Since its inception, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility has made 23 investment decisions and uh, one conditional approval totalling around $2.4 billion. 
The extension of the NAIF, announced by, the, uh, by Minister Pitt on 30 September this year, affirms this commitment, and the government will table the review in due course and looks forward to the opposition supporting the amendments to the NAIF. question is the motion 884 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I jump to 892? Senator Hanson's not here, so I'll come back to that later. 893, Senator Dean Smith and others. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 893 relating to World AIDS Day be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senators Pratt and Seward and add the names of Senators Hughes and McLaughlin. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I now jump back to Senators McAllister and Water number 881? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 881 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is, uh, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, the, uh, domestic and family violence is a scourge and its impact is horrific. This government swiftly committed $150 million for uh, the domestic violence-specific COVID-19 support package, now fully distributed to states and territories. This funding is on top of the $340 million the Commonwealth had already invested in the Fourth Action Plan initiatives and the new ongoing uh, 1800 rather, respect funding in the 2020-21 budget. On International Day for the Elimination of Violence, the government also announced the three new providers of specialised family violence services in the Northern Territory. The question is that motion number 881 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I now go to 896, Senators Waters and Thorpe? Am I needing this? I think we're needing this. Senator Thorpe. <laughs> uh, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 896 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. The question is up. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Okay, short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Before the coronavirus pandemic, the government had reduced the gender pay gap to the lowest level on record. In December 2018, the government legislated five days unpaid uh, family and domestic violence leave as the new minimum entitlement for employees in the national employment standards. On 6 October 2020, the government released the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, in addition to significant community-wide measures in the budget. This $240.4 million package provides targeted support for women to strengthen their employment opportunities, pay, participation and flexibility. There's more work to do and the government is committed to improving women's economic security and closing the gender pay gap. The question is that motion number 896 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number 897, Senator Urquhart, in the name of Senators Ayres and Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 897 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government has noted the recommendation relating to the aerial firefighting from the Royal Commission's final report. Firefighting is the responsibility of state and territory governments. The appropriate aerial firefighting fleet for each jurisdiction is decided by operational experts, not by federal politicians. Nevertheless, the federal government will continue to support Australian industry to grow in this area. At present, 128 of the 158 aircraft contracted are Australian-owned and operated. There's an ongoing federal government commitment of more than $25 million a year to support this capability. The government will continue to work with the states and territories and rely on the expert, of advi uh, expert advice of their commissioners. The question is that motion number 897 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, I'm going to leave 891 until the end, because I understand there may be a request to split that. We will get to it, but I'm going to now go to 894. Senator McKim. Senator McKim, do you have motion number 894? I do, President, and thank you. And I ask that general business notice of motion number 894 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. 
leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government has not reneged on its acceptance of this recommendation of the Royal Commission. Recommendation one states. The National Consumer Credit Protection Act should not be amended to alter the obligation to assess unsuitability. With respect to this recommendation, Commissioner Hayne noted, and I quote, consumer advocacy groups urged me to recommend that the NCCP Act be amended to require lenders to determine whether a loan contract or credit limit increase was suitable for the consumer, as distinct from not unsuitable. I do not favour that proposal. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim, number 894, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 894 in the name of Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell for the noes.
The results of the position is ayes 31, noes 31. The matter is therefore negative. Senators, please remain in the chamber. There will be a couple of imminent divisions. Could we come to matter number 895 in the name of Senator Walsh? I think Senator Urquhart has this. I'll only be ringing the bells for one minute until 4 p.m. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 895 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government is committed to helping senior Australians remain in their own homes for longer, and that's why we've invested in home care at every opportunity since the 2018-19 budget, with additional funding for over 73,000 packages at a cost of $4.6 billion. Packages have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012-13 to 185,597 in 2020-2021. Under this government, an increase of 208 per cent in packages. Over the same period, funding will increase by 302 per cent due to the growth in high-level packages. Labor went to the last election with $387 billion of new taxes and offered no additional funding for home care packages. Home care wasn't even mentioned in their budget reply speech. Question is that motion number 895 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 895 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 31. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senators Hanson Young and Wish Wilson, number 891. I flagged earlier, I thought there might be a request coming. So could I ask us to move to that one now? Senator Hanson Young. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 891, standing in my name and the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that um, parts one and two of this motion be put separately. Okay, so I will then put cla clause A one and two separately to the rest the remainder of the motion is that correct yep because um oh, sorry clause one and two of paragraph a so that paragraph a still stays there to cover the rest of the clauses if it's treated differently um, because the set we could the senate could still note clauses sub roman three four and five without actually noting one and two so what I'm going to do. Okay. All right. This makes it easier. So it's been corrected. The question is now: clause A and clause B being treated separately. So the matter, essentially, of the Royal Commission being treated separately to the substantive matters. Oh, I'm just trying to assist the Senate, Senator Hanson Young, Senator. Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation supports this motion. One Nation and the Greens may well expect different outcomes from a Royal Commission, yet there can only be one set of facts, and a Royal Commission will decide those facts. We expect a Royal Commission to find that the level of dishonest and illegal behaviour in the basin has allowed some people to make out like bandits while family farmers struggle. We expect a finding that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan works best for entities with strong, close links to the National Party in New South Wales. The plan will be seen to be destroying the productive capacity of one of the world's richest agricultural areas, destroying rural communities and transferring wealth from everyday Australians to large corporates. We expect that the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holders Office will be found responsible for environmental damage across the basin and the Coorong. It's time to eliminate the bad actors from the plan so hard-working Australian farmers can return to growing food and fibre for the world whilst pr protecting the natural environment. The question is that clause A of motion 891 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The, bells. the question is that clause A of motion 891 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that clause B of motion 891 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that Clause B of Motion 891 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawatt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 36. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, the final matter is motion number 892 in the name of Senator Hanson. I'll give you a moment to go to your seat, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice the motion number 892 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Uh, Senator Urquhart, you are going to seek the call to add a name. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. You can get some. Um, if I could, with the indulgence, um, seek leave to add um, to motion 881 the, the name of Senator Billick. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Thank Senator Urquhart. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 22 pro proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by me by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Urquhart. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. 
The failure once again of the Morrison government to listen to experts and prepare for disaster season by refusing to spend a cent from their $4 billion emergency response fund and refusing to commit to developing a national aerial firefighting fleet. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Urquhart, I understand you need to move the motion. I do need opening. to move the yep. motion, and I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. <laughs> Um, over the last few decades, Tasmania has experienced a long-term drying trend that has been characterised by a 10 to 20 per cent reduction in cool seasonal rainfall. An upward trend in bushfire occurrence has also been occurring since the 1930s. The total area burned has tripled since the 1960s. In 2015, the state had, had the state's driest ever spring on record over the last 140 years and the hottest October on record, prompting an early start to the fire permit period. In 2016, a total of 229 vegetation fires were recorded from 13 January to 15 March, burning a total of area of 124 742 hectares, with a combined perimeter of 1,260 kilometres in largely remote rugged and inaccessible areas. About 20,125 hectares, or 1.27%, of the Tasmanian World Her uh, Wilderness Heritage Area was affected by these fires, including about 1,466 hectares, or 1.8% 1 of threatened and sensitive vegetation communities, some of which may not ever recover. Other sensitive areas, including Aboriginal and historic heritage areas, were also affected by the fires. In 2019, almost all of Tasmania recorded accumulated monthly forest fire danger indices in the highest 10 per cent of historical values for December 2019, and much of the eastern half of the state recorded its highest ever December. Um, Forest Fire Danger Indices FFDI, on the 30th of December. Several locations recorded temperatures in the high 30s and low 40s that day, with several experienced a temperature record for December. Tasmania registered 406 lightning strikes that ignited dozens of bushfires that day, including a fire south of Pelham in the Upper Derwent Valley, 45 kilometres northwest of Hobart. In extreme fire weather conditions, the fire spread rapidly southeast in dry forests and grasslands towards the rural communities of Eldersley and Broadmarsh. Professor, professor David M. J. S. Bowman, uh, a professor of uh, pyrogeography and fire science and director of the Fire Centre Research Hub at the University of Tasmania, wrote in his submission to the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council review of the management of Tasmanian bushfires during the 2018-19 fire season, and I'll quote, the 2018-2019 Tasmanian bushfire season conforms to a global trend of longer duration, geographically larger and economically, environmentally and socially more disruptive wildfire events. The 2019 fire season also fitted an emerging syndrome of lightning ignited bushfires, lightning -ignited bushfires in western Tasmania. The Tasmanian bushfire season can be understood as an expression of the Anthropocene, a new trajectory for the Earth system induced by anthropogenic climate change, compounded by other factors such as land use and fire regime changes. Bushfires in the Anthropocene have a trajectory that tracks away from historical norms towards more extreme events. The increased frequency of abnormal fires will significantly reduce our ability to reliably ensure clean air, supply potable water, store carbon and conserve fuels. The emergence of Anthropocene bushfires raise, raises profound questions for fire management and community safety and requires the development of new fire management practices to protect human life, property and infrastructure, to conserve heritage and biodiversity to manage conservation areas and national parks and to sustain yields from forestry, landscapes and hydroelectrical catchments. 
Anthropocene bushfires demand a recalibration of socio-political expectations around the capacity, effectiveness and financial costs of firefighting and fire prevention approaches, methods, methods and practices. Close the quote. So that's just in Tasmania and just in the last 14 years. Australia-wide, this last bushfire season was a horror one. The stories are still very raw. 33 lives were lost, thousands of homes destroyed, many families are still without proper shelter, hundreds of businesses destroyed, national, uh, natural values gone, many forever, whole species of native Australian flora and fauna most likely wiped out. Some of them will never recover. Over 17 million hectares had been burned across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, the ACT, Western Australia and South Australia. We all know that the government was unprepared last bushfire season. It was quite evident, and the consequences were disastrous. To take just one example from the last catastrophic bushfire season, the use of the Australian Defence Forces. The Prime Minister's failures around defence were some of the most public. Let's not forget when the Prime Minister posted a Polish video advertising that the government were deploying defence reservists to assist in bushfire areas. Unfortunately, he prioritised his shiny announcement video over informing Shane Fitzsimmons, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner, who found out about the massive influx of resources through the media. Mr Fitzsimmons said of the stunt, all I can say is I wasn't aware of it. I found out about it via the media reports. It is fair to say that it was disappointing and some surprised to hear about these things through public announcements. In the middle of what was one of our worst days this season, with the second highest number of concurrent emergency warning fires ever in the history of New South Wales. Then we come to the aerial firefighting capacity. For years leading up to the last bushfire season, the National Aerial Firefighting Centre pleaded with the federal government to increase their annual funding, warning that bushfire seasons were only getting more intense. For years they were ignored until last season. When finally funding arrived, it came months after the bushfires had already begun, then the federal government announced the same funding three times because we know they all love announcements. I can appreciate that the government is taking some action to address their failures from last bushfire season. What happened last year can never, ever be allowed to happen again, but it's simply not enough. And unfortunately, we also know that the government are once again putting announcements over delivery in the lead up to this natural disaster season, which is leaving us unprepared. In recent days, Australia has experienced an extreme heat wave. Dozens of fires are now burning across the country. The Bushfire and National Hazard CRC has predicted above normal fire potential across New South Wales and Western Australia throughout December 2020 to February 2021. The Bureau of Meteorology has predicted a higher than average chance of cyclones in Northern Australia, predicting that cyclone season will start earlier and be more intense. And so I come to the government's emergency response fund. 18 months ago, the Prime Minister announced a $4 billion emergency response fund designed to help fund response, recover, recovery and resilience measures in the lead up to and following natural disasters. 18 months on and not a single cent has been spent from that fund, not a single cent. Not one project amount, not one job created, not one community protected. Once again, we bear witness to this Prime Minister parent addiction to the photo up but not the follow up. The Royal Commission recently recommended that the federal government develop an Australian-based aerial firefighting capability, noting that Australia needs a sovereign aerial fleet, as we will not be able to continue relying on overseas support for much longer. This is in large due to the fact that the fire seasons globally are starting to overlap. The government has rejected this recommendation. They said they were comfortable with the current arrangement. And again, this was repeated by Minister Rustin in question time today in response to a question from Senator Chisholm. These arrangements have seen situations where a tiny state like Tasmania 
has spent $40 million on aircraft in the 2018-19 fire season alone, with contracts often having to be negotiated at the last minute and the highest possible prices. The Royal Commission also noted that last year there were instances where requests for aerial uh, assistance were not met because they simply were not available. The federal government are happy to announce the same funding three times, but they are not actually delivering the resources that Australian communities need and that the, the Australian com communities will continue to need over this uh, warm summer season that we are starting to encounter as I speak. Senator Molan. Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. And I, I rise on behalf of the government to address the MPI raised in the name of Senator Urquhart, but I think uh, by strings, pulleys and mirrors, Senator Watt was in fact talking. To begin with, I make four points. And the first point is that Labor still has no idea what they're talking about in respect of the Emergency Response Fund. Absolutely no idea what they're talking about, and they're ignoring the facts. Order. The second point. The second point I make is that they have no idea about aerial firefighting. Absolutely no idea at all. The third point I make is that they would not have a clue, in accordance with their PMPI, they would not have a clue what an expert is. And the fourth point I make is that we have prepared very well for the 2021 disaster season. Now, like Senator Urquhart and, and, and uh, like Senator Watt, I am no expert. I, uh, as a commercial helicopter pilot, I flew firebombing helicopter droppings for years, and uh, 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 I put the water on active fires. Uh, and up until I, I did this, up until a few years ago, I was also a director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, NAFC, as it's called, along with the, each and every one of the commissioners of the state and territory rural fire services. Uh, and I did that for about three years. The NAFC, uh, uh, just in case Labor doesn't know, the NAFC is the organisation which leases and manages the National Aerial Firefighting Fleet, which uh, is funded, of course, by the Commonwealth, the funding of which was doubled recently. And that funding is merely the start of the funding process for funding the national fleet of aerial firefighting aircraft. And this is a fleet, of course, which Labor which Labor uh, are trying to convince us to actually develop. I also gave evidence at the Royal Commission into the 2009 Victorian fires, and I spent about 22 days down at the South Coast fires, as well as six days fighting fires throughout the ACT and Queanbeyan and Pellerang uh, uh, local government area. So, unlike Labor's ideological climate change activist ex-commissioners of the Rural Fire Service, which they like to quote, and I'm very surprised that you didn't quote them this time through, uh, I would like to mount a few points and to mount an informed and practical vantage point to do it. Let me develop the points I made initially. You still, as a party and as individuals, Order. have Senator, no idea— Senator Molan, I just remind you to make your remarks through the chair. Thank you, Chair. I, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, acting Deputy President, I certainly will. The Labor Party, Acting Deputy President, still has no idea what they're voting about when they talk about the emergency, uh, the emergency response fund. You would rather politicise that party over there in the opposition would rather politicise the issue of rural firefighting by making totally wrong and illogical claims about uh, uh, the emergency response fund. To begin with, that fund was voted for by the Labor Party. They agreed with this fund. They should have known. If they don't know, it would be very, very interesting to, to understand why they don't know about it. Because the Emergency Response Fund, you voted for it, cannot be accessed and you agree to it until the advice is received. That it, that it is required, that the money from that fund is required and all other funding sources have been depleted. That's its purpose. That's what you agreed to. The ERF allows for $150 million each financial year to fund emergency response and recovery following natural disasters. And this is the kicker. 
when the government determines that existing recovery programs are insufficient to meet the scale of the response required, and you agreed to it. $50 million each financial year would be available from the, the, the fund to build resilience to and prepare for or reduce the risk of future natural disasters when the government determines that funding over and above its existing suite of arrangements is required and you voted for it and you agreed. So why haven't we accessed $150 million that's, that, that I've just listed? Well, it's quite simple. The government has established the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund. Some electorates, including the one I live in with an ALP member, have received more than the total $150 million allowable under the ERF. So it's an interesting situation, and I guess the question goes: Why haven't we accessed the $50 million fund, the $50 million amount for, the, for mitigation? Well, the government is already spending over $260 million in joint funding with state and territory jurisdictions on resilience and on mitigation activity. And of course the, the, the Minister will always consider advice from, the emergency management, from Emergency Management Australia with regards to accessing the fund if that is required and, if so, what, what it should be spent on. Of course we're preparing for the 2021 disaster season. And I won't go into the detail at this stage. Others will. And of course, it was gone through in great detail by the minister and by others in, uh, in take note today. Just, but just let me mention, uh, act, uh, acting deputy president. Just let me mention Defence Services Australia, disaster recovery funding arrangements changes, communications, and all in a COVID environment national disaster risk reduction framework, and of course a royal commission. Uh, Acting Deputy President, the, the, it, this is what preparation is about and this is what Labor should look at in order to understand preparation. So Labor's claims that we should be developing a national aerial firefighting fleet uh, is totally misplaced because it's there. You know, uh, what a disgrace to years of work of good people and financing by good governments to produce a national aerial firefighting fleet. It's a bizarre claim. Go to a fire just about anywhere and look up. If you see an aircraft, uh, as you invariably will, it will be part of our national fleet. If you don't see an aircraft, it's probably because you can't see through the smoke or it's night time. In the years that I was a director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, in each of those years, we had roughly a minimum of 100 aircraft in the National Aerial Firefighting Fleet from the roughly 11 to $12 million that was at that time being provided by the Commonwealth Government. And of course, additional costs to this, vast additional costs, the 11 to $12 million just starts the leasing, project, uh, the leasing process with additional costs paid for by the states and by the territories. Now, that $11 million has become $24 million, some development. It's a bit like Labor claims that health and the ABC's budget have been reduced. This year, compared to the minimum 100 roughly uh, uh, aircraft when I was a director, uh, this year, guess how many will be actually leased? Guess how many can be deployed? If needed, 158 aircraft in total are available. Some development, I reckon. Double the money and a significant increase in the number of aircraft. And of those 128 aircraft, sorry, of those 158 aircraft, 128 aircraft are Australian-based, owned, and registered. So I heard Senator Watts saying something today about him being briefed recently on aspects of this, or about to be briefed on aspects of this. It must have continually slipped his mind. And what about the Royal Commission? We, we've heard Senator Urquhart quoting the Royal Commission there. Uh, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3. On 8.2, research and evaluation, we're doing it. 8.3, support and development, of course we're doing it. 8.1, we have already done it. I guess I would prefer, in the few seconds I've got left, to move away from 
ideological climate change ex-commissioners and find some knowledgeable experts. And that is what I would recommend, Acting Deputy President, the Labor Party do. The Commonwealth is not and should not be going to get into aerial firefighting, except to coordinate and to fund, and that is what they do. So, Acting Deputy President, uh, we reject entirely the proposition in today's MPI, and uh, 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 my colleagues will further argue the case on all of those points. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, speak on the MTI, MPI. Uh, I, I do note that uh, Senator Urka talked about a long-term uh, trend uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the fire seasons, which are becoming uh, worse and longer in duration. Uh, that all is very, very clear. I think uh, everyone accepts that. But I want, to talk, I want to talk about a static problem, a static issue, because as long as I can remember looking at the, uh, at the aerial firefighting service, uh, we've seen a fire season commence, and then we've seen a whole bunch of very sophisticated, very capable aircraft or helicopters fly in from overseas. They fly in from overseas and they, uh, they, they, they deliver this firefighting capability. And uh, you know, that all might sound good. Perhaps uh, we, we suggest we're leasing these aircraft rather than purchasing them. But the reality is we have a long-term need. And the other reality is that we're paying a huge premium, particularly in circumstances as the load varies, for some of these aircraft. So what we've got here, what people need to understand is going on here, is when there's a fire, as you see the fire trucks racing towards the fire, there's a money truck racing to the ports. A big truck full of taxpayers' money that is going to the ports of Australia and getting shipped off overseas. And that's what's happening. The only uh, yeah, well, the, the only thing that fetters or stops these trucks get rolling onto, the, onto the, the ferries to head off overseas is there's a submarine, future submarine project truck in front of them, or a Watergate truck in front of them. So we ship all our money off overseas. And let me tell you why this, what, you know, what, what the tragedy uh, here is. I know a number of Australian businessmen, people who work in the aviation industry, who would love to stand up an aerial firefighting capability. But because the contracts that are issued by the, Con by the Commonwealth are so short, they go along to their bank and say, I would like to, 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 to purchase a, an asset, a helicopter, a large uh, aerial tanker. And the bank looks at them and says, sorry, you've only got a two-year contract. The Commonwealth know that this is going to go on year after year after year. Simply extending the contract term uh, to a reasonable time frame would permit these Australian companies to invest with the, with the support of banks. But no, we don't do that. We, we trickle out money on a short-term basis, which just absolutely favours the overseas entities, because they've made the investment. They've got contracts in their home jurisdictions. And that's a fundamental problem that we need to look at. This problem could be solved simply by changing the, the, the length of the contract terms. We would have more Australians investing in capability that was resident here. And you know what? When other jurisdictions were having fires, we'd be sending them overseas and they would uh, you know, be making money, bringing money back to Australia. And that's what needs to be happening. And that's what's missing here. This is, this is the responsibility of, of the federal government. You heard Senator Molan say that the funding comes from uh, federal government coffers. Yeah, we kind of recognise that this is a national uh, process, yet we, we kind of uh, hide behind the fact that we're, we're getting the states uh, individually to look at these things, yet uh, in actual fact we, we're trying to create national emergency laws. We've got the, the ADF does a fantastic job weighing in. We've got CASA. We, uh, yeah, we've got federal funding going to the firefighting, the aerial firefighting service. We need to take charge of this. We need to take charge. We need to have a sovereign, a sovereign firefighting capability, aerial firefighting capability. And it's not too hard to do. 
I've given the answer in my, uh, in my contribution today. Just a few tweaking of contract terms and the problem would be solved because Australian businessmen and women would then stand up the capability here. Every time we issue a short-term contract for an aerial firefighting service, we cut off our nose in spite of our face. We have to fix this. Senator Ayres. No. Watching uh, Senator Molan's contribution, I guess I finally grasped why this government has been unable to act in the interests of Australians in regional areas. So fixed in the past, so stuck in his views, so unable to recognise that times have changed, that the climate has changed, that the management of country has changed, or the requirements for effective management of country, and the requirements for effective firefighting have so fundamentally changed, only response from Senator Molan is the same as the response from the Prime Minister. It's bluster, it's obfuscate, it's point the finger at somebody else. It is never take charge, take responsibility and act. Well, there are many communities this week who are beginning their one-year commemoration of the bushfire season coming to them. And people in Braidwood today are doing that. And for people in Braidwood, the fires started this week, 12 months ago, but they went all the way through to February. Some people having their properties burnt out multiple times. And what those communities want to hear is not bluster, it's not ideology, it's not politicisation, it's not pointing the finger at the states and saying, I don't hold a hose, mate. What they want to see is action, leadership and effective coordination from the Commonwealth. The Bushfire and Nat Natural Hazards CRC outlook for December to February notes that while the East Coast has experienced wetter than average conditions since last summer, normal fire conditions still persist because of long-term dryness. Half of New South Wales west of the Dividing Range will experience above normal fire conditions this summer because while the ideal conditions for cropping and pasture growth are great news for our farmers, they create the ideal conditions in mid to late summer for very dangerous, fast-moving grass fires. The ACT in southern Monaro will experience similar conditions. Drought conditions persist in southern and western Australia. As summer progresses the southwest, the Swan Coastal Plain and parts of the Wheat Belt and Esperance Plains will experience higher than normal fire potential. Nowhere in the country will experience below normal fire potential. Well, what does normal mean? Normal means that somewhere in Australia over the coming summer, people will lose their homes to fire. Businesses will be destroyed and, in the worst cases, lives will be lost. The summer of 1974 to 1975 was a normal fire season and 117 million hectares burned. The summer of 1984 to 85 was a normal fire season. In New South Wales alone, 3.5 million hectares burned, 40,000 head of sheep and cattle perished and four people were killed. The summers between 1993 and 1994 and also 1998 to 99 were normal. In all, 19 people were killed and scores of houses were burned to the ground. The summer of 2002-2003 was a normal fire season. Four people perished and 488 homes were burned to the ground right here in Canberra. The summer of 2008-2009 was a normal fire season. 173 people died on Black Saturday, 7th of February 2009. The summer of 2015-2016 was a normal fire season. It was the most destructive season since 2008-2009. Nine people were killed, nearly a thousand buildings destroyed, and the fires had a catastrophic impact on Tasmania's world heritage areas. 
The summer of 2013-2014 was a normal season, but the alarm bells were, truly, uh, were well and truly ringing this time. It was only in October 2013, in the Blue Mountains, where two people died, 208 homes destroyed and 86,000 hectares, including World Heritage Areas, burned. These are the normal seasons that are becoming increasingly infrequent. Above normal fire conditions are the new normal. How much more unnecessary death and destruction will there have to be before this government gets out of its Hawaii state of mind? There is almost nobody outside the Morrison government who doesn't think that Australia should have its own national, sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. You go to the main street of Braidwood or a pub in Cabago, uh, or a supermarket in Taree, uh, or the rural fire service in Nowra, and you try and find a single person who doesn't think, who doesn't know that Scott Morrison's job is not to produce television ads trying to glorify, and obscure, uh, glorify action and obscure the fact that he got caught out refusing to come back from overseas holidays while houses were being burnt out and the country needed him uh, and whatever leadership he was capable of providing, you won't find a soul who doesn't think that we need a national sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. Like in every case where the issue is about the government's responsibility to keep Australians safe, the Morrison government thinks it's the state's responsibility. You can hear them up in the back rows there. Whenever these issues become uncomfortable, they point to the states. Well, I can tell you, bushfire fighting, bushfire preparedness is a national emergency, a national crisis, and it requires national leadership and a national response. Apparently, for Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, the government's got no role to play other than to offer paltry, late and inadequate funding announcements with no follow-up, just spin. It took 12 hours for the Prime Minister's office to produce a slick social media ad at the height of the crisis when the Prime Minister was trying to run from his responsibility all of this year, it has been as clear as that this national sovereign air, air fleet is required and no action from the Commonwealth Government. The Senate Finance and Public Administration inquiry in last summer's bushfires has heard compelling evidence that a national aerial firefighting fleet must be a high priority of the national government. The Prime Minister himself gave support for the proposition when he said on January 4 this year, what we need are water bombers that meet the technical and specific requirements of the deployment in Australia. It's not just a matter of trying to hustle up some planes from somewhere around the world. What you need is the precise asset to deal with the situation in Australia. That's what he said. Just more words, empty words, no delivery. That's exactly what a sovereign national air, for air firefighting fleet would do. It would meet our specific technical requirements. It would be there all of the time as a precise asset to deal with the situation in Australia. But of course, all people in regional Australia have had from this Prime Minister is empty words and avoidance. Rather than each state and territory sourcing its own aerial firefighting fleet, it would be far more efficient and far more effective to build a national capability for all Australians, one that's capable of moving between the states and territories over the course of a bushfire season, one that's capable of responding early to fires that have historically been left to burn out of control in wilderness areas because they've been inaccessible and have then turned into the frightening, devastating fires that, for example, 
enveloped the community of Cabago a little less than 12 months ago. This is a government without a strategy for, everything, for anything. It's a government that points the finger and bludges off the states and territories, is never capable of doing its job and exercising its responsibility in the interests of all Australians. Uh, and you lot are never capable of doing anything else but pointing the finger at, at everybody else. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And what we heard from Senator Ayres there was the masterclass in deflection. A masterclass in deflection. And can I say uh, that it is quite tawdry the behaviour of the Labor Party in the last 12 months in their response to the bushfire crisis last year. You know, I well remember the worst bushfires in my lifetime were actually in 2009 when we had 180 Victorians killed on uh, Black Saturday. That was six times the amount, and, and with respect to everyone uh, who passed away, uh, that happened. Um, uh, and for throughout that year, there was no partisanship from the coalition when the Rudd government was in power to somehow make out that it was the Rudd government's fault for the for the loss of those lives. Okay. Yet this year, we've had a non-stop barrage of blame from the Labor Party, as though Scott Morrison actually lit those fires himself. And can I say that is as disgusting and tawdry behaviour for politicians who represent the people and should know better. And I didn't hear once one solution offered by Senator Ayres in that speech there. All it was was smear and endowendo, which is the uh, modus operandi of the Labor Party. And bushfires and emergency management shouldn't be used as a, as a political football, football to score political points. Now, you know, can I also say that Senator Ayres comments that you know, this government believed that we had no role to play is an absolute insult to the Australian Army and military who participated so gallant, uh, bravely through those bushfires in logistics, coordination, communication, uh, in helping people um, resettle. Uh, so, can, you know, I, I really think Senator Ayres should apologise to the Australian mil military because we put the, uh, you know, the Australian government was more than willing to get the military involved, um, despite the fact, despite what Senator Ayres says, um, and I accept. I think last year was had a particular uniqueness in the extent that the, the fires were widespread. And there is no doubt that when you have a national emergency like that, the army should be involved. But can I say that, you know, talking about the fires, I noticed Senator Ayres uh, didn't mention 1939, the, the bushfires, the bushfires in 1939, or the bush fight, the Black Friday of 1939, or the bushfires of the 1850s that wiped out a quarter of uh, Victoria or burnt a quarter of Victoria. Um, so a bit of selective uh, picking there as well. But we have to get to the heart of the problem here, and that, of course, is the state governments and their woeful management of their responsibilities. So, first of all, let's, let's just have a look at the emergency services. Who's responsible for emergency services? State governments. And who's been cutting funding to emergency services for the last 20 years? State governments. And you know, it doesn't help when we have retired bureaucrats who are in that, uh, you know, for an emergency role in New South Wales coming out and slagging off the government when this particular bureaucrat himself was actually head of the uh, New South Wales emergency response um, for, from 2003 to 2017, the uh, New South Wales Fire Brigade. And a lot of this stuff happened under his watch, and he was more, willing, more than willing to come out and the bushfires was on and blame everyone else. Um, the second thing is, and this is something that's very close to my heart, is the poor land management undertaken by states over the last 20 or 30 years, where uh, farmers and, in particular, uh, state governments have not managed their national parks properly. Now, I, can, I know two areas in Queensland, one just near where I currently live. Uh, there's a lot of national parks there, and the parks are full of lantana. It is infested with weeds because the state governments 
won't get in there and clean it up. I mean, we have got a real lantana problem in our national parks in Queensland. And the other thing we've got in Queensland is a actual overgrowth, lack of uh, hazard reduction burning. And I know in our, uh, our property out in Western Queensland, we've got a big uh, national park next to us and it's just full of pests. You know, the pigs come through, the goats come through, feral cats, wild dogs. It's not being looked after. It's not being looked after. And this is becoming more and more of a concern because the land uh, used by agriculture has dropped from 500 million acres in 1976 to, to 390 million acres today. And a lot of that land has either been locked up or converted to national parks. Now, out in southwestern Queensland, this, this particular part of Australia is punching way above, it, what, above its weight in earning carbon credits. And that is unfortunately to the detriment of great towns like Quilpie and Charleville who are losing uh, shires, uh, sorry, who are losing um, constituents in their shires because the mulga is being locked up for carbon farming, which means that we're going to have more and more um, undergrowth, we're going to have more and more feral pests because the farmers aren't there managing it, uh, and we're going to have a much greater fire hazard. And of course, this is the price that is paid, as usual, by regional Queensland and the regional parts of Australia that they are the ones whose livelihoods suffer uh, in order to fill the green dream. And unfortunately, you know, one of these days, you know, if it ever gets, uh, goes off out there, it's going to go on. So state governments have got to do more about hazard reduction. The other uh, part that you know, state governments have failed to uh, manage properly is, of course, zoning approvals. I mean, state governments will approve uh, housing commission blocks in both flood and fire zones. And it's, it's becoming a, uh, a very bad problem. I know in Townsville in the floods last year, houses were wiped out in the floods because they were built in flood zones. And I know that a lot of houses today are being built, unfortunately, among the gum trees. Now, where I live, I, I go through the back way around um, through um, Sanford Conservation Park, and there are houses in there that are literally amongst the gum tree. Like, the house is there, and every one of these seats around us are the trees. And if, if there's ever a fire, I don't know how these people are going to get out. And why they're allowed to live there is, is, is beyond me, um, and it worries me a lot. And, of course, the fourth failure um, by state governments is the fact that they've all sold their state uh, government insurance offices. So, you know, you want to wonder why we can't get insurance in North Queensland. It's because the state government sold the state uh, government insurance office. I mean, I think we probably can all remember the SGIOs in various different states. I mean, that was there to provide insurance where the private sector wouldn't. And of course, the neoliberals in the, in the, in the Labor Party, and I admit we had a few in the La Liberal Party, but believe it or not, in Queensland, it was all, all done by Labor, um, you know, flogged all that off to the private sector. So insurance there is another problem as well. Now, rather than continue to peddle hysteria and everything, what we need to do is to look at preventative measures. We need to look at preventative measures. Now, apart from the measures I've just talked about, some of the other things we need to do is to stop planting eucalypt trees. Now, it, it seems hard to imagine, but Landcare love to go around and plant eucalypt trees. Now, the, the last thing we need in this country are any more eucalypt trees. There's plenty of other Australian natives you can plant um, that aren't full of eucalypt oil that, when you light a fire, are going to explode. So that is something I think, and I've, I've actually written a, a letter up to the minister, the environment minister today, um, asking her to address that issue um, because I think that's very important. But just in concluding, I, I think the other thing we've got to look at: the start, the cause of that uh, Victorian bushfire in 2009 was actually determined to be a fallen transmission line, a fallen transmission line. Now, you know. A part of the clean green dream is to have more renewable uh, energy, and of course that is going to require $100 billion to be spent to build all the transmission lines to get the energy from all the disparate uh, uh, energy generation into the cities. Now, more transmission lines is going to mean a much greater fire hazard, because not only can you have fallen transmission lines, they're also those big towers of uh, lightning conductors. So. You know, it's kind of ironic that we've got the left over here saying that we've got to do something about fires and everything like that, and they actually want to increase the risk of fires 
by having more and more transmission lines. So I hope that they've taken into account the cost of putting this stuff underground. I hope these transmission lines that we build for all these renewable power stations aren't going to be built through towers because you're going to increase fire risk. And then, of course, there's solar panels. And we know that there's a lot of shoddy, uh, dodgy imported solar panels, and it's been discussed by. Um, I've got an article here where a Victorian uh, firefighter has discussed the fact that a large number of uh, fires uh, today has been caused by shoddy solar panels on houses that cause fires. So, you know, these guys need to take a good hard look in the mirror and come up with some solutions Thank for a change instead much, of throwing Senator blame. Rennick. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, one thing I do agree with Senator Rennick on is we do need to take a lot more preventative actions around fire and fire risk. And the most important thing we can do is act on climate change. Act on climate change. And I was very surprised that the Liberal Party would put up a speaker like Jim, Senator Jim Molan today, who is on record as being a climate sceptic, climate denier, whatever you want to call it. And it just shows why we are in such a mess, why we have a government who refuses to take climate change seriously. We're never going to solve this problem. And I wanted to say today that it was actually Senator McKim and myself in 2016, and I remember it was the day we launched our double dissolution election campaign in Tasmania. We launched a policy for the Australian government to buy uh, water bombs. And the reason we did that was because Tasmania had had a horrendous summer of fires in 2016, a horrendous summer of fires. And we, Senator McKim, had initiated a Senate inquiry to look at those fires and the responses. And it was public knowledge made in that inquiry that we couldn't get aerial water bombers when we needed them in Tasmania. And in 2016, we had 145 separate fires that burned for over 63 days, destroying 126,800 hectares of mostly remote vegetation, 19,800 hectares of that which was in the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. In 2018 and 19, the bushfires burned for 100 days, destroying 210,000 hectares of mostly remote vegetation again. 95,000 hectares of which was in the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. And these are the only forests in the world that are World Heritage protected. And some of them had vegetation that were thousands of years old that had never seen fire, never seen fire in their time as living, breathing plants on this planet. Both of these catastrophic fire events began with dry lightning strikes. Increasingly rare dry lightning strikes have caused a lot of damage, not just in Tasmania but elsewhere. Another thing linked directly by the bomb to our changing climate. 2016 was the hottest Tasmanian summer on record at the time and the driest spring on record. 2019 was again the hottest summer on record, which eclipsed 2016, following again the driest spring on record. We also, uh, Acting Deputy President, initiated a Senate inquiry looking at the implications for climate change on Australia's national security. And we took significant evidence right around this country on why climate change is the biggest threat to this country's national security and what we needed to do about it. And we had a very productive discussion on buying our own fleet of aerial bombers. And the Greens worked this policy up. We took it to the 2019 election, just like we did in 2016, and I commend Labor for adopting another Greens policy. We see it all the time, and it's great. Sometimes I think our role in here is to get the Labor Party on board, and we succeeded with that. And I hope we actually now get this aerial uh, water bombing fleet that we so desperately need in this country. What we learnt in our Senate inquiry very quickly, Acting Deputy President, is that with overlapping fire seasons around the world, we cannot rely on bringing planes in from overseas. We pay an exorbitant amount of money to lease these aircraft. We have no control over when they get here or when they're used. We should have our own fleets, even if it has to be housed in the RAAF. It doesn't really matter. We need to own these. They should be 
owned by the Australian taxpayer. They should be on standby for Australians. And everybody has seen that. The Royal Commission has recently reflected that. There's no reason that we don't have our own aerial firefighting fleet except for ideology, uh, both an ideology around privatising and outsourcing everything in this country to the private sector to make a big buck. And at the ideology we have seen on display today, disgusting, almost hard to believe, from a government that actually puts up climate deniers in this chamber to talk about preparedness and readiness for extreme weather events and the risks to Australians from wildfire. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I don't know about everybody else, but I love summer. And I can remember the feeling of Christmas coming and singing a beautiful hymn at my Catholic school in the lead up to Christmas. Words are written by John Wheeler and the music's from William G. James, and these are the words. The north wind is tossing the leaves. The red dust is over the town. The sparrows are under the eaves, and the grass in the paddock is brown. As we lift up our voices and sing to the Christ child, the heavenly king. Well, I tell you what we're not going to get for Christmas. We're going to get the heat, but we're not going to get the protection that Australians deserve. And we're not going to get it even that was recommended to this government, because Mr Morrison is a phony. He'll be there for all the photos, but when it comes to delivering the things that really matter, he is a man constantly missing in action. There's plenty of announcement, but when communities across this country will be looking to the sky, praying for aerial firefighting support, there will be none because Mr Morrison decided we didn't need it. That's the sort of prime minister that we've got a man who ignores the experts, a man who ignores the evidence, a man who treats Australians with contempt. I guarantee that there will be Australians this year who are standing in their street fighting for their community, fighting to save their own houses and the houses of the community that they serve through their firefighting efforts. They will be looking skyward for a missing in action aerial firefighting fleet. And there can be only one person who has to be held accountable for that, and it is the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. We've heard all the announcements, and there is such a hope amongst Australians that after we see the terrible fires that we saw last summer, when there was an announcement by our Prime Minister of $4 million in an emergency response fund, we all thought, oh, how wonderful that our taxpayers' dollars are going to help people in the community, our fellow Australians who really need the help. But Mr Mor has, Morrison hasn't spent any of that money. There's a long way between announcement and delivery with this government, and they are failing us every single day. On the beautiful central coast where I live, there was a huge effort, a heroic effort, by rural fire service volunteers who fought the Three Mile Fire. I was up in Mangrove Mountain recently, and I know the connectivity issues that plagued their capacity to save that community are still happening today because Mr Morrison doesn't think it's worth investing in proper connectivity for fire services and for that community. How can, how can this Prime Minister pretend to stand up for bushfire-affected communities when he cannot provide them even the most basic infrastructure, the lack of telecommunication capacity in this 21st century, year 2020, putting lives at risk, both the residents of those areas that will be attacked by bushfires and the lives of those who want to serve our community by fighting the fires that will always come when those hot winds blow. For years, leading up to the last bushfire season, the National Aerial, Aerial Firefighting Centre has pleaded with the federal government to increase their annual funding, warning that bushfire seasons were only going to get more intense. And they were right. 
This is not a new request of the government. This is a long-standing request, and all this government has offered to our brave service workers is sophistry and spin. I can tell you that when Christmas comes around this year, Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister who had to hire an empathy consultant for nearly $200,000 so he could learn to sympathise with drought-affected farmers, will be calling on those pretend skills once again. He is so dodgy, so dodgy, you cannot trust a word that comes out of his mouth. And when fire hits our communities across this country this summer, remember the man who has ignored pleas for years for an aerial firefighting fleet. Remember the man who's sending us into debt to the tune of $1 trillion, who couldn't find enough money to provide aerial firefighting. That's who Scott Morrison is, and no announcement regime and no amount of sophistry will be able to pull the wool over the Australian people's eyes indefinitely. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I'll just it being perilously close to 5 p.m. Um, I'll give senators a moment to enter the chamber before we move on to the first speech, because we were scheduled to start at five. Thanks, Senator Van, for his understanding. We'll get back to the MPI after this event. Pursuant to order, I will now call Senator Thorpe to make her first speech, and I ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the gathering place on which this parliament was built. I am a proud Japuran Gunai Gunditjmara woman and I live on Wurundjeri country. I stand before you today on the shoulders of my ancestors who fought and died for our country. Their resistance, their knowledge and strength over thousands of years has guided me to this moment and I carry their spirit with me in this chamber. It's an honour to be the first Aboriginal person elected to the Senate to represent Victoria. While it's a great shame that it has taken this long, the timing could not be more significant. Outside these walls, a global movement has taken to the streets to, to demand that black lives matter. An uprising of voices united by the conviction that the colour of your skin should not limit your potential, your safety or your life expectancy. That was not something society told me growing up. For an Aboriginal girl raised in poverty and public housing who left school at 14, the idea that I could make it all the way to this nation's parliament was laughable. People like me were not meant to end up in places like this. Our voices were silenced, sidelined and written out of the story of our own country. But I never gave up believing that better days were possible. I come from a long line of strong black women who taught me to stand up for what's right and never let injustice and racism beat you down. If you want change, you have to fight for it. I've been a human rights, climate and forest activist, and in 2017 I was honoured to be the first Aboriginal woman elected to the Victorian Parliament. I've fought my whole life for those without a voice. My promise to the people of Victoria is I will continue to fight for you. And I will never forget where I come from. I take my seat in this chamber today for every person who has been discarded, discounted or left behind. It's time for your voices to be heard. For too long, power has been tightly held in the hands of the privileged. I come to this parliament not as a career politician, but as someone who's done it tough and grown strong through the struggles. I'm a survivor of family and workplace violence. I was a single mum at 17, and I've had to confront my own mental health issues, and I know what it's like to count every cent to put food on the table. Millions of people all over this country 
face similar challenges every day. They need a parliament that prioritises their right to live with dignity. Instead, they have been forgotten by a political class that sees poverty as a character flaw. It doesn't have to be this way. Right now, we have a chance to build a country that works for everyone, not just the chosen few. We stand at a crossroads. 2020 will leave an enduring mark in the pages of history. This was a year that demanded we not turn our heads from the challenges that threaten our future and, yes, the urgency of a climate emergency. The growing economic inequality exposed and exacerbated by a deadly global pandemic and the ongoing fight for racial justice. For Australia to become a mature, self-assured nation, we must recognise the long history of violence inflicted upon this country's first people and embark on a truth-telling journey to reconcile that past. These challenges are big, but so is the opportunity. This is our moment to grow as a nation, and we must be brave. The devastating bushfires that ripped through this land were a wake-up call for those who deny we must act decisively to address the reality of a warming planet. We have watched in real time the full horror of the climate crisis and what happens when you stop caring for country. With governments of the world converging on Glasgow next November to lift their ambition on climate action, the denial, the posturing and fidgeting that has gone on in this House for far too long must stop now. It's time for leadership. We must put the future of our children, our grandchildren, and country ahead of the short-term interests of the fossil fuel industry. Last year, I attended the United Nations Climate Summit in Madrid and saw firsthand how big polluters are poisoning country and ripping the heart out of communities all over the world. And I also saw firsthand how this government is holding the world back when it comes to global action on climate change. At a meeting of Indigenous leaders, we wept as we shared our collective grief over the destruction of our land, from the fires tearing through the Amazon to the devastation in our own backyard. Here in Australia, we have seen Rio Tinto blow up the Jukun Gorge in the Pilbara, blasting 46,000-year-old Aboriginal rock shelters in an act of cultural and environmental vandalism. And we know they have more planned. In Western Victoria, ancient birthing trees are being destroyed. At this site, on Japwarung country, Aboriginal women have given birth to an estimated 10,000 babies over many centuries. My ancestors' blood runs through the soil that nourishes these trees. When we lose these sacred sites, we sever the deep spiritual ties that connect our culture and language to this land. Caring for country is at the heart of who we are as Aboriginal people, as custodians of this land for thousands of years. We understand the health of the community is only as strong as the health of our environment. We're tired of watching governments and their agencies pay lip service to an acknowledgement of country, while at the same time destroying the very land they claim to respect. When we don't show genuine care for the country that nurtures us, we all suffer. 
and that is why we can't separate climate justice from First Nations justice. We can't maintain the protection of our land if its traditional custodians are locked up, dis disenfranchised and dying in the numbers that represent an outrageous human rights abuse. To heal this land, we must address the inequality and injustice faced by Aboriginal people. Black Lives Matter needs to be more than a trending hashtag. It must be a reckoning, a line in the sand, a call to action. To those whose skin colour affords them greater safety and justice, it's time to stop looking away from systemic racism and stand with us and say no more. George Floyd's death was that moment for many people. I take hope from the spirit of solidarity that was born from this rising consciousness. But why did it take the death of a black man on the other side of the world to wake up Australia when our Indigenous people are the most incarcerated people on earth. We must now ensure that history also remembers the names of those who died in similar circumstances right here in Australia. John Pat, David Dungai, Miss Jew, Joyce Clark, Kuman Jay Walker, Veronica Nelson Walker, Tanya Day, and Raymond Noel Thomas, just to name a few. I wish I was afforded the time in this speech to name every life taken. 441 Aboriginal people have died in custody since the Royal Commission in 1991. Not a single person has ever been held accountable. For years, politicians in this parliament have talked about closing the gap. But our children continue to be removed from their homes at rates higher than white Australia. In fact, over 20,000 of our babies aren't with their families or their communities. Kids as young as 10 are held cr criminally responsible in this country. The vast majority of them are Aboriginal. Our babies should be playing and learning not incarcerated for petty offences like stealing a chocolate bar. These are not just statistics on a page for me. Earlier this year, I went home to grieve with my mother and our community on Gunai country, in what the colonisers called Gippsland. Four Aboriginal people had been lost to suicide in 10 days. These tragedies reflect a profound sense of hopelessness felt by many First Nations people when they look to a future that holds little promise. Three of those young people had connections to Lake Tyres, a community where generations earlier my mother's family were imprisoned as, imprisoned as refugees in their own country. It happened as part of the systematic slaughter of Aboriginal people across this nation. In Victoria alone, there were 67 massacres and more are still being uncovered. They tried to wipe my people from this land, but they failed. We are still here. We are the oldest living culture in the world and our fight for survival is part of this nation's story. White Australia has a black history. We cannot change the past, but we can build a better future. We must reckon with our history so we can heal and move forward as one country united by truth and common purpose. I believe Australia is ready to come with us on this journey. For the last two years, I've led a dawn service on January 26 to mark a day of mourning and honour all the Aboriginal men, women and, yes, children 
who were massacred upon invasion of this country, known as the Frontier Wars. The vast majority of people standing shoulder to shoulder with us have been non-Indigenous Australians, sharing our grief in a spirit of healing. Their numbers grow each year. But to truly bring this country together, we must not only treat the symptoms of disadvantage, but the cause. We do this with a treaty. A treaty is a written agreement between sovereign nations, and Australia is the only Commonwealth country without one with its first people. If we write it together, treaty can be a blank canvas to reframe the story of who we want to be as a country. We can celebrate what unites us, protect the rights of First Nations people and acknowledge injustices, both past and present. There can be no justice without peace. Treaty could bring that peace. It would end the suffering and heal the wounds. That's why treaty must come before other debates, such as constitutional recognition, changing the date of Australia Day or a voice to parliament. Because the disadvantage and inequality we face as a community are not due to inherent failings in our character. They are symptoms of the persecution and oppression this country and its constitution were founded upon. We can't be included in the Constitution before this chapter in Australia's history has been resolved via a treaty. And we mustn't replicate tick and flick domestic treaties that allow native title to be extinguished to make way for the destruction of country for mega mines, logging or fracking. A genuine national treaty would elevate Aboriginal voices and reframe us as a more caring society where nobody is left behind. We need to make that shift because the gap between rich and poor is growing wider. The unprecedented public health and economic crisis we're living, in through, living through in 2020 has brought this into sharp focus. It has often been said that the COVID-19 virus doesn't discriminate, but we know now its impacts do. Young people, women, migrants, the elderly, public housing residents and casualised workers are bearing the greatest burden. I want to offer my condolences to the families of those whose lives have been tragically cut short by coronavirus. Through this crisis, we have seen that inequality is not just a social issue, it's a major public health risk that eats away at the fabric of our society. Precarious work and insecure housing have fuelled this pandemic. When you have low-paid, casualised workforce Inevitably, people will be forced to make choices that have life and death consequences. Staying home when you're sick is not an option when that decision means your children go without food. Too many people are living hand to mouth without job security or the dignity of a living wage. COVID has exposed deep cracks in our society, showing how quickly it can fall apart when people have no safety net. As we endured periods of lockdown, I think of all the people who are permanently locked up and forgotten about by our government, like my friends Farhad and Moz, Kurdish refugees who spent seven years on Manus Island before being brought to Australia under Medivac legislation. They are now locked inside a Melbourne hotel room with no prospect of release and fighting for basic rights. These men have committed no crime. 
How can we as a nation treat people like this? We are stronger as a country when we extend the hand of friendship to everyone, not just those who look like you, not just those who wear the same school tie as you. That is what this parliament should be about, a place that represents everyone equally. Because what COVID has shown us is that economic inequality is not an individual moral failing, but an active political choice. The disaster in private aged care is a tragic reminder of what happens when we put the profits of big business over the dignity of our community's most vulnerable. Who's been looking after our elders? Not this place. But it should have been. Through this pandemic, we have seen governments find money to house the homeless, feed the hungry, support the unemployed, prop up childcare and boost mental health services. These solutions to social and economic disadvantage have always been there. Our political leaders have just chosen not to adopt them. We deserve so much better. And we can be better. This pivotal moment has offered us a unique opportunity to reimagine our society. From the ashes of the crisis, we can rebuild in a way that addresses our overriding national challenges. Justice for First Nations people, reducing inequality and addressing climate change. We can create a community where the collective good outweighs individual self-interest. As we look, look to that future, I think of the lessons we can learn from the matriarchs in my family. My great-grandmother, Edna Brown, arrived in Melbourne on the back of a truck in 1932 after being forced off the Framlingham Aboriginal Reserve near Warrnambool as part of the White Australia assimilation policy during the Great Depression. Back then, it was common for Aboriginal people to be buried as paupers in unmarked graves. Nan Edna wanted to offer the dignity in death that so many of our people were denied in life. She set up the Aboriginal Funeral Fund, supporting families to bury their loved ones. After Nan Edna, her daughter, my Nan Alma Thorpe, was one of the founders of the, Aboriginal, the first Aboriginal health service in Victoria in 1973, the year I was born. To this day, that service is still saving lives. That is kinship. It is self-determination and strength through community. And then there's my mum, Marjorie Thorpe, a co-commissioner for the Bringing Them Home Stolen Generation Inquiry and a member of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which inspired a quarter of a million people to walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge in 2000 in a powerful gesture of social solidarity. This is where I come from. As I followed these strong women, I learned through one of the toughest periods of my life that strength comes from community. Living in the Collingwood Commission flats saved my life. Public housing helped me escape family violence and gave me and my son the safety and stability I needed to get a job and pursue further education. That is what everyone deserves, a, place, a safe place to call home, secure work, food in their belly, and the hope of a future with potential. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that our society is weaker when people don't have these basic rights. The people in this chamber have the power to change that. We can do more of the same, or we can offer our kids and grandkids a politics of hope. The solutions to the big problems we face are there in the way my people have looked after each other for generations. Holistic health care, 
caring for country, kinship and self-determination. We can give everyone the dignity of a living wage and lift people out of poverty. And it's not too late to tackle the climate emergency, but we can't be fooled by a gas-led recovery backed by both sides of this House. The only so safe road out of our economic and climate crisis is one that creates thousands of jobs in renewable energy. We can write a treaty that acknowledges our past and brings us together to heal as a nation. That's why I'm here, to fight for the change that will unite and strengthen our country. I will be a senator for all of us. To our LGBTIQ community, know that I've got your back. Together we won marriage equality, but the fight for your rights is not over particularly for trans and gender diverse people. To the activists fighting to protect our country, climate and human rights, I stand with you. To all those women who have been trapped, who've been made to feel worthless or unsafe, who've been told time after time to sit down and be silent, whether in your home, your workplace or wherever you go, I see you, I've been you, and I will not forget you. To Greens members and voters who have backed me on this journey, I thank you. I chose the Greens as my political home because it's a grassroots movement that won't sell out to vested interests that have corrupted our democracy. And I'd like to pay tribute to the person whose shoes I now fill, Richard Di Natale a leader of great integrity and passion. Thank you for your service and support. I also pay my respects to other First Nations MPs who have walked this road before me. And I thank my sisters Arika and Mariki, my partner Gavin, my children Andrew, Kawira and Kayan, my daughter-in-law Jackie, don't cry. And my granddaughters, Aluka, Nakaya, and nephew Cadell, for loving and supporting me through this journey and for your sacrifices that got me here. Finally, to every person watching today, particularly those who have lost hope in politics as a vehicle for change, I say this to you. Change is possible. Hold me and every other elected representative in this place accountable. Our job is to serve you. We have an opportunity to build a stronger, more unified nation. And I invite you all to come on this journey with me, a journey of truth-telling, healing and justice. Together, we can build a brighter future, and I'm here to fight for it. Thank you.
think it's still with ten minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to speak on this motion. I, and again, I find myself thanking a senator on the other side for putting on, up an MPI, which really, for us, is just a Dorothy Dixer. It's really quite amazing. And it's quite ironic that the Labor Party want to bring this topic up as, it, as we enter another disaster season. Politicising disaster preparedness, response and recovery is nothing new for the Australian Labor Party. After all, we know they have form in this space, especially in my home state of Victoria. The Andrews government's so-called reforms of the fire services, at the behest of their union mates, undermined the coordination of firefighting across the state last fire season, especially in the regional cities and has led to poor morale, loss of expertise and the decimation of volunteers in our beloved country fire authority. Um, the comments from some of those opposite during uh, their contributions, uh, particularly around firefighting, I found quite amazing. We heard from a, a, an actual aerial firefighter, Senator Molan, talking about how good we are, how well we are prepared with our aerial firefighting fleets. The government is working with states and territories to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission. And it's important to note that uh, 128 out of 158 aircraft that are used for firefighting are Australian owned and operated. Uh, it was, it was a, quite amazing, I found, before uh, Senator Watt, who was uh, very, very active during question time on some of these issues and is the Shadow Minister for Emergency Management, has only just this last week, just this last week, accepted an invitation for a briefing with Emergency, Emergency Management Australia on our seasonal preparation. So again, Senator Urquhart moving this MPI prior to that briefing just further demonstrates that Labor is simply not interested in facts. The Labor Party are not interested in how well prepared Australia actually is. And those decisions have left Victoria at a substantially higher risk now and into the future. Mr Acting Deputy President, earlier this year I spoke about the impacts of bushfires on my home state in Victoria and how, along with Victoria's first responders, the ADF had made a vital contribution to the safety and welfare of Victorians. Now, we, as we all should in this place, know that emergency management is primarily a state or territory responsibility. And certainly during COVID, it was brought into stake, stark um, uh, contrast the difference between states and what states were managing and what the Commonwealth had to manage. And we sh but, however, we saw th right through the, both the COVID crisis and the earlier bushfire crisis in the year, the Australian government ensured that everyone had support, or was at least offered support, by the ADF. The Morrison government has substantially reformed national disaster payments and implemented the Emergency Response Fund and increased Australia's aerial firefighting responsibility. We have to remember that the funding that we've put forward, the Emergency Response Fund, is for response and recovery. So to claim we haven't spent any of that money is simply ridiculous. The fund, the $4 billion fund, is set up to spend up to $150 million, uh, per, uh, $200 million per year on various things. And just this uh, last month, the, uh, the Minister for Disaster Recovery, 
Minister Little Proud has uh, signed off on signing some of those funds to go out the door. Now, with the Emergency Response Fund, the Labor Party voted for the establishment of that fund, knowing full well that the circumstances in which it can be accessed. And so, as I mentioned, the $150 million each financial year to fund emergency response and recovery is when the, de the government determines that existing recovery programs are insufficient to meet the scale. And the further $50 million to, to in each financial year is to build resilience, and that comes to prepare or reduce the risk of future nat natural disasters. Mr Acting Deputy President, we know that uh, Labor don't understand these things, but I think we can see that this motion was a farce. Thank you. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Will those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Moving to uh, the consideration of documents. We have government documents, uh, Crimes Act 1914, uh, report for 2019-20 Australian Federal Police, uh, Migration Act 1958, section 4860, amendment of detention arrangements, Commonwealth Ombudsman's reports, uh, government responses to Commonwealth Ombudsman's reports, uh, numbers 51 and 52 of 2020. Having uh, now moved on to uh, reports and government responses, we will uh, uh, standing committee for the scrutiny of bills digest 17 of 2020. Opposition whip. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I present scrutiny digest number 17 of 2020 of the standing committee for the scrutiny of bills. The question is that. Uh, no. Uh, standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, Senator Furavanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 13 of 2020 uh, of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation. Uh, I also present the interim report of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation on the uh, exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report and I seek uh, leave to speak to the motion. I rise to speak to the tabling of the interim report of the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. As parliamentarians, we are elected by the Australian people to make and scrutinise the laws of this country. However, about half of the law of the Commonwealth by volume consists of delegated legislation rather than acts of parliament. I would like to repeat that. Half of the law of the Commonwealth by volume consists of delegated legislation rather than acts of parliament. And in 2019, 20 per cent of the 1,675 pieces of delegated legislation made by the executive were exempt from disallowance by the parliament and scrutiny by the committee. The volume of delegated legislation made by the executive and the frequent exemption of these laws from parliamentary oversight restricts our capacity as parliamentarians to perform our scrutiny and lawmaking functions. The committee's inquiry considers the source, nature and ongoing appropriateness of the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight informed by expert evidence and the committee's own scrutiny work over the past 88 years. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, this interim report <coughs> focuses on how systemic issues in legislation, <coughs> procedure and practice have combined to exempt <coughs> delegated legislation made in response to the pandemic from parliamentary oversight and what actions can and should be undertaken to resolve these issues. 
Now, part one of the report provides an overview of the legis legis legislative framework relied upon by the government to make delegated legislation in response to COVID. The Biosecurity Act 2015 is the key component of this framework. As the report explains, the Biosecurity Act confers extraordinarily broad powers on the executive to make non-disallowable delegated legislation which restricts personal rights and liberties and overrides any Australian law, including laws made by this parliament. Despite the significance of the delegated legislation making powers in the Biosecurity Act, they received little consideration when the biosecurity bill was being considered in 2014 and early 2015. Accordingly, the committee recommends that the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills or another independent body or person review the delegation of legis legis legislative powers in the Biosecurity Act. In future, the committee urges all parliamentarians to carefully consider the delegated legislation making powers in emergency legislation to ensure that the exercise of these powers is subject to an appropriate degree of parliamentary oversight. Part two of the report considers the specific systemic factors that have contributed to the exemption of delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19 from parliamentary oversight. These features include the cancellation of parliamentary sittings, the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance, the classification of delegated legislation as non-legislative, the duration of delegated legislation, and the exclusion of delegated legislation from scrutiny by parliamentary committees. In particular, I would like to highlight the committee's concerns about the exemption of emergency delegated legislation from disallowance. Disallowance is one of the most important tools that the parliament has at its disposal to maintain control of delegated legislation. Despite the importance of this procedure, nearly 20 per cent of all delegated legislation made in response to the pandemic between January and July this year was exempt from disallowance. And this includes all 27 legislative instruments made under the Biosecurity Act, and six advanced to the finance minister determinations, which allocated an additional $2.1 billion of public funds to aspects of the government's response to COVID-19. Consequently, parliamentarians have been prevented from scrutinising and, if necessary, disallowing significant COVID-19 response measures. These include travel bans on Australian citizens, the declaration and extension of the human biosecurity emergency period and restrictions on people entering and exiting certain areas within Australia. The committee fully appreciates the government's need to make such laws in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, worse, where such laws have the capacity to restrict personal rights and liberties or override laws made by parliament, the committee considers that parliamentarians must, I underline must, have the capacity to scrutinise and, if necessary, disallow these laws. The committee was also concerned to discover that one in five non-disallowable legislative instruments made in response to COVID-19 are exempt from disallowance due to pre-existing grounds determined by the executive rather than the parliament. Accordingly, the report recommends that any grounds for exempting emergency-related delegated legislation from disallowance should be set out in primary legislation. I also draw the chamber's attention to systemic issues which have excluded COVID-19-related delegated legislation from scrutiny by parliamentary committees. The standing orders currently prevent the committee from considering non-disallowable legislative instruments in its regular scrutiny work. To inform this inquiry, the committee found that 48 per cent of non-disallowable legislative instruments made in response to COVID-19 between January and July this year appear to raise potential technical scrutiny issues. However, the procedural constraints imposed by the standing orders prevented the committee from attempting to resolve these issues with, with the relevant department or ministers. Accordingly, 
The committee recommends that all delegated legislation made during these times of emergency is subject to technical legislative scrutiny, regardless of its disallowance status. Given the significant content and volume of delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19, the committee also recommends that a Senate Select Committee be established in times of emergency to specifically consider the policy merits of delegated legislation made in response to that emergency. Can I conclude by saying that the committee is grateful to everyone who has made a submission to this inquiry and given evidence to the committee's first ever public hearings. We trust that this interim report and its focus on delegated legislation made in response to COVID-19 provides a useful case study of the detrimental impact of long-standing long systemic issues on parliament's capacity to appropriately oversee delegated legislation made in times of emergency. Our final report will further consider these systemic issues and the options available to the parliament to resolve them. In the meantime, the committee calls on all parliamentarians to carefully consider their responsibilities as representatives of the people to ensure that delegated legislation made in response to emergencies is subject to rigorous parliamentary oversight. That is a responsibility that we have as parliamentarians, mm -hmm. and this is the reason why we sit in this place. Mm -hmm. Can I also acknowledge the hard work of Committee Secretary Glenn Ryle and all his team? This is the first ever inquiry of this committee, and their commitment to producing excellent work is to be highly commended. I and other committee members very much appreciate all your efforts. With these comments, I commend the committee's interim report on the exemption of emergency delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight to the Senate, and I thank my colleagues on the committee for their hard work and their willingness to participate in this very important work on behalf of the people of Australia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Senator uh, Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I just wanted to take a few moments to associate myself with the remarks by uh, Senator Ferrienti Wells. Um, when I first came into this place, I had, to be frank, no idea about this committee. And um, quite frankly, it's probably one of the, the committees that I enjoy my time um, with colleagues, and it's good to see other colleagues in this committee uh, in the chamber at the moment. Um, it's certainly been fascinating to see how our democracy works, and you know, being a part of the Senate, the House of Review, keeping the executive uh, accountable. Um, I know there's only the one member of the executive here in the place currently, but um, I think it's fair to say we do enjoy our time on the committee, uh, scrutinising the delegated legislation, the instruments, following up with ministers and uh, ensuring that we are doing our jobs as parliamentarians uh, as part of our democracy. Um, the Senate uh, Select Committee for the um, Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, and it has had other names along the way, but it's certainly one of the oldest committees in this place. Uh, its purpose is to really ensure that we uh, are scrutinising delegated legislation enacted by members of the executive and is subject to appropriate scrutiny by the legislator. It's a role of us in this place to write the laws of the land. Yet I think many Australians would be surprised to learn just how much law is written. And as we'd heard from the, the chair of the committee, close to 50 per cent. 50 per cent written, enacted stamp of approval by the executive, not through the parliament. Whilst there is no doubt in that there is a role for such delegated legislation to exist, it is nonetheless appropriate that in an instant where law is made by members of the executive, it is subject to appropriate oversight by this parliament and by the Senate. And most importantly, to disallow any instances where it is resolved by the Senate that such a measure is necessary. As the report articulates, the volume of delegated legislation as a proportion of total Commonwealth law is substantial. Even more substantial is the proportion of this delegated legislation that is exempted from scrutiny. All Australians should be concerned 
at the readiness with which government is prepared to exempt delegated legislation from consideration by the parliament. As mentioned earlier, whilst there is merit in the existence of delegated legislation, one is right to question whether exemption provisions for this legislation is entirely in accordance with the principles of the separation of powers that make up all good systems of governance. The interim report that's been tabled has a particular focus on the emergency delegated legislation that has come about as a result of the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost a quarter of these measures, some of which had a significant impact on the community, were exempted from disallowance. Questions as to whether the individual freedoms of our citizenry ought to be curtailed are some of the most significant that any decision maker in this building may be forced to consider. Owing to this, they necessarily ought to be subject to the highest standards of democratic exemption and examination, sorry, as one would expect in a nation such as ours. Regrettably, the, the report also finds that there are instances where government falls short of this standard and systemic reasons for how this has come about. And as the Senate, as a democratically elected body, representatives of the community, we must resist this. After all, we are the House of Review. Whilst I fully appreciate why government, any government for that matter, would like to dispense with such inconvenience wherever possible, we owe it to those who have gone before us and with such toil have established our norms of parliamentary primacy in lawmaking to clearly demonstrate the bounds of the tolerance of this House. I, like the Chair, would like to place on, my, oh, place on the record uh, my thanks and uh, obviously of that um, Senator Carr, who is obviously not here today, to say thank you to the Secretariat for their work. And I, to be fair to say, I don't think it, without the support of the Secretariat we wouldn't have been able to produce such a comprehensive report and bet that we were able to present today. I want to say thank you to uh, my other colleagues on the committee, in particular the Chair and the Deputy Chair for their advice, their uh, wisdom, um, and you know, maybe one day I myself may be chairing such a committee. And uh, Thank you, Senator Scar. I, I would look forward to you being my deputy at some stage as well. But certainly the wealth of knowledge that those two senators bring to the table is something that we really do need to acknowledge. And again, um, the highly cooperative and bipartisan nature, um, it should be noted, in which we've all been able to conduct um, our work. Senators can trust that the interests of this House are in good hands with the leadership of this committee. And uh, once again, I commend uh, the report to the Senate. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak. On, uh, on this report and indeed uh, do so as an outsider, not a member of this very important committee of the parliament. Um, I must, uh, I, I, as I stand here, I just want to say, and I mean this genuinely, I think uh, the words that we've heard from Senator Ferravanti Wells today in, uh, in uh, addressing this report are some of the most important words spoken in this chamber uh, since the time that I've been here. I, I just want to reflect on something I heard today in the chamber, and I'll come back to uh, the point that uh, uh, the chair was, um, that Senator Ferraventi was, was making. Uh, Senator Patterson stand up, stood up during the committee stage of the uh, of the uh, 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 foreign affairs uh, bill, and he, he made the statement that the government is responsible to the people, and that is not actually the case under our constitution. The way it works is the government of the day is uh, responsible through ministers to this parliament, and it is this parliament that is responsible to the people. And that's really important. Uh, I just want to draw back to, uh, to, the, um, to the constitution, and that's, that's the, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the gravitas or, or the importance of, of the, the statements being made in the chamber. Uh, part one, section one of our constitution 
entitled Legislative Power, states the legislative power of the Commonwealth shall be vested in the federal parliament, which shall consist of a Queen, a Senate and a House of Representatives, and which is here and after called the Parliament or the Parliament of the Commonwealth. It is, it is the Parliament's role to pass laws. And that's a really important principle because the people who write uh, the delegated legislation, um, of which half in volume is written by officials, are not responsible to the people. They are not able to be removed by a vote of the people. In fact, it's very difficult for even a minister to remove a person uh, who might be writing this delegated legislation. When legislation is to be uh, considered, it ought to be done uh, in an open manner, in a Senate chamber where it can be debated and where the people can watch and see what people say and they can uh, at least once every three years, or perhaps six in the case of, uh, uh, of some senators, of, of senators, they can uh, exercise their right to either support that member or to have them removed. Hold them accountable, thank you. And that is not the case for delegated legislation. And uh, it concerns me and I think we should pay regard uh, to the, the two very senior people that are the chair and the deputy chair of the committee with a great deal of experience in this place. And uh, I, I commend Senator Ferrandi Wells because um, actually it's a committee I really didn't notice very much until you started to chair uh, the committee, uh, I might say. Um, and and having, having someone as, as strong as Senator Ferravanti Wells and indeed uh, backed up by Senator Carr is a very powerful combination. And uh, uh, I, uh, I used to watch Wacker Williams come in here and he'd, he'd uh, uh, stand up and he'd move these motions uh, announcing a, a possible disallowance. I used to think, geez, he's a rebel. Not, not understanding that the. Not, I know, of course, I like rebels. I love rebels. And, uh, uh, you know, Perhaps falsely, that was how I developed an affinity with Wacker, and uh, uh, he. Um, uh, but but uh, since this committee has been chaired uh, by the current leadership, uh, chair and deputy chair, I've certainly started to take notice, and I must congratulate Senator Ferravanti Wells for the do job that she <laughs> is doing. Uh, but uh, again, I say her contribution this afternoon is one of the most important contributions I have heard in this chamber uh, for, for my time being here. And I, I would ask that all senators listen to what has been said, look at the series of reports that are coming from this committee because it talks uh, and it's directed at us and our responsibility and our responsibility to our constitution and to the people uh, to whom we represent. Senator Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too would like to make some remarks on this uh, interim report on the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. And first, if I could just acknowledge the kind remarks from Senator Patrick, uh, I couldn't agree more. If I could seek to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Ciccone, and given he associated himself with the remarks of Senator Ferravani Wells, that means I'm associating myself with your remarks. So we're all associates. I love him. And Senator Patrick, you are absolutely correct that we serving on this committee are very fortunate to have uh, Senator Ferravani Wells as our chair and Senator Carr, that's Carr, not Scar, as our deputy chair. And as a new, a relatively new senator to this place, as uh, in the class of 2019 with my good friend Senator Ciccone and Senator Davey, and Senator Green is not here today, but I'm sure she would concur. Uh, there are three things I took, I've taken from the leadership demonstrated from Senator Ferravani Wells and Senator Carr on this committee. And the first is the importance of that experience and wisdom that they bring to the process. It is irreplaceable and just so important. Secondly, the collegiality 
with which they have conducted themselves. And, and one of the lessons I've learned from serving on this committee is you have to divorce the partisan from the nonpartisan. And I think both Senator Ferraventi Wells and Senator Carr do that extremely well. And thirdly, and most importantly, the deep and abiding respect they each have for the institution of parliament. The deep and abiding respect they have for the institution of parliament. And that, that is reflected, that respect for the institution of parliament is reflected in this report. And it's reflected in the first recommendation of this report that parliamentarians, not politicians, parliamentarians, that we are we're not just politicians, we're parliamentarians, should give consideration to the appropriateness of exempting delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight me mechanisms. We should do that as parliamentarians. And reflecting on that point that we're parliamentarians, also politicians, but parliamentarians first and foremost, I commend uh, the members, the senators, my colleagues, to have a look at sections 4.31 and 4.33 of the report, which contain some submissions that were made uh, to the inquiry. And I'll quote them. I'll quote them for you. First one in 4.31, and I quote, the rulemaking process should or needs to be separated from the political process, end quote. End quote. The second quote, 4.33, the determination should be exempt from disallowance to prevent political considerations interfering with what should be a technical and scientific process, end quote. Now, those were two submissions made by government departments, and I think they reflect more than anything an institutional view with respect to these matters, an institutional view which we as senators need to be aware of, and in a context through this report where we are robustly reasserting, robustly reasserting the importance of the parliamentary processes. Because what are these political processes? What are these political considerations? Are they not parliamentarians, parliamentarians, not just politicians, parliamentarians as democratically elected representatives exercising their judgment on behalf of their constituents and their country? That's what these political considerations are. Are they not parliamentarians making an assessment on how the proposed laws of the land will impact upon the people they represent and their country? Those are the political considerations. Are they not parliamentarians acting as a check and balance upon the executive? We in this place acting as a house of review, as Senator Ciccone referred to it. Are they not parliamentarians being accountable, being accountable, accountable to and facing their constituents on a regular basis in free and fair elections as part of a liberal democracy. Those are the political considerations. Those are the political considerations. And they go to the heart, the absolute heart of our liberal democracy. And we must always, always remember that and cherish it, respecting the institution of parliament. Finally, I too would like to give some thanks to the members of the Secretariat who worked uh, on, the, uh, on the report. And, uh, Chair, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Senator Ferraveni Wells, you'll always be chair to me. Um, I must say you forgot um, one person we should always remember is the prof, Professor Edgar. Yes. Where would we be without our, our good Professor Edgar? Always there, ready to give his, uh, his wisdom and educated view on, uh, on sometimes the most arcane of legal matters. So thank you, Professor Edgar. Thank you, Glenn and Laura and the whole team. And his knowledge of contract law as well. You're absolutely right, Chair. Um, we're, we're at, you're, you're an absolute terrific crew, and uh, we've been extremely fortunate to have the benefit of, uh, of your assistance. I, too, commend this report to the Senate. Thank you. The question is that uh, the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, declare it carried.
We are now going to move to committee reports and government responses presented out of sitting C, page five. We have any speakers? Senator O'Neill. Yeah. Sorry, Thanks. So we've got item number four. No speakers. We have no speakers. Item five. Sorry, uh, what I'm asking is, uh, do we have any speakers on page five of the reds on the committee reports? Right, so can I just clarify? Senator O'Cart. Thank you. Um, so can I just clarify? So I understood we were at tabling in consideration of committee reports just a moment ago. Have we now gone back to consideration of documents? No. We're, no, we're on committee Sorry. reports and government responses presented outside of the sittings on page five of the red. Ah, okay, thank you. Great. So I've asked if there anyone want to um, speak. Take note of any of these reports. Number four, five, six, seven. No. Are there any ministerial statements? We have um, no, no uh, committee membership, so we move down to the messages of the House of Representatives. Clark. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for a concurrence. Federal Circuit Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and Federal Circuit Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendment and Transitional Provisional Bill 2019. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I call the clerk. Put, uh, sorry, I put the, the, the question. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against? Clark. Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019, Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is that leave granted? So granted, Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Thank you. Oh. I'll put it. Uh, the motion is that the debate be adjourned. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, declare it carried. Mark. A message has been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr. Fitzgibbon to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade in place of Mr Champion. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by the House relating to an extension of time for the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services to present its report into litigation funding and the regulation of the class action industry to the 21st of December 2020. Clark. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill, disallowance of the Corporations Amendment litigation funding regulations 2020. Senator O'Neill. I move the motion. The motion. Th thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and in 
Moving this motion uh, on the Corporations Amendment Litigation Funding Regulations 2020 made under the Corporations Act of 2001, I will argue that it should be disallowed by the parliamentarians in this parliament. Uh, and I hark back to the conversation or the um, contributions of my colleagues recently uh, with regard to the scrutiny of bills and the work that's been undertaken there. Because this is a perfect example of government by regulation uh, and what's wrong with that. The regulations that I seek the support of the Senate to disallow today uh, were arbitrarily determined and advanced without warning by the Treasurer, Mr Josh Frydenberg. The regulations as they stand apply to all Australians and they are not fit for purpose and they prejudge the report of a committee of inquiry that the government itself set up. These regulations that I'm asking for the Senate to disallow today are rushed, careless and will only make it more difficult for ordinary Australians to access justice against deep-pocketed corporates. I want to thank members of the crossbench for their conversations with me, many conversations with me in recent uh, weeks in seeking the, their support to disallow the action of the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg. Uh, and I particularly thank uh, Senator Sterling Griff, Senator Rex Patrick and Senator Jackie Lambie for uh, taking um, a position that indicates they really are aware how much this is costing in terms of people's access to justice and that it is a piece of legislation, a piece of regulation made on the fly by the Treasurer who actually established an inquiry into litigation funding on the 13th of May and yet only nine days later stood up on the 22nd of May and brought in these regulations. There's a famous saying, uh, the doors of justice are just like the doors of the Ritz-Carlton. Anybody can walk in, but money determines who can stay. Litigation funders enable ordinary Australians to get their day in court. They're critical in helping launch class actions on wage theft, on the poisoning of farmlands, on properties and businesses affected by poor, poor flood controls, and they've been instrumental in enabling justice for citizens who were affected by the PFAS contaminations who had to fight their own government. And in addition, litigation funders support consumers who are ripped off by big corporates. Litigation funders give access to justice to those ordinarily unable to afford it and deter the government and other deep-pocketed entities from reckless and harmful behaviour. Labor believes that litigation funders should be regulated, but only by an appropriate and fit-for-purpose regime that keeps their vital purpose intact and allows for healthy competition between funders. And I remind members of the crossbench that the government established the inquiry to deliver its report on this matter on, March, uh, on May the 13th, and just a few days later, on the 22nd of May, changed their mind and brought in this regulation that I'm asking you to disallow this afternoon. The government's approach has, to, has been to impose regulations that will reduce competition in the industry, will frustrate and deter ordinary Australians who look to our justice system to right wrongs and secure compensation. And this is for people who find themselves in the most difficult circumstances up against the giants of the corporate world and against their own government. Instead of waiting for the joint committee inquiry they, that the government set up itself, instead of waiting for it to run its natural course, instead of acting on the recommendations of the Australian Law Reform Commission reporting to class actions and litigation, the, the report again that this government commissioned Josh Frydenberg has rushed these regulations through in a chaotic and thoughtless way. Using the cover of the pandemic, the Treasurer decided to pass legislation through to change the regulation of litigation funders to that of managed investment scheme, as well as to require them to obtain an Australian financial services licence. Funded class actions were never meant to be considered, of, considered as a managed investment scheme and uh, overseen by ASIC in that form. And the funders themselves say that the onerous regulatory burden will force funders out of the market, lessen competition and increase the cost of access to justice. 
These regular at and indeed Senator Patrick, I'll take that interjection, and ASIC did not want this regulation to be established in that way and were on the record on many occasions as saying a managed investment scheme was an entirely inappropriate way to uh, manage this, uh, manage this uh, activity of litigation funders. The regulations as they now stand because of this disallowance appear at the moment to lack the support of the Pauline Hanson One Nation Party. Um, and I do worry that in these uncertain times for many businesses and many Australians right across this country that a, a, a limitation on their access to justice and the continuation of a managed investment scheme structure and AFSLs which were constructed without consultation is not a good outcome for the Australian people. People like those who were caught up in Michelle's patisserie franchise, franchisees who seek recompense for a in a class action against exorbitant fees forced on them by their franchises as investors in a managed investment scheme. I, I really think uh, that Senator uh, Hanson, who hasn't declared her position at this point of time in the Senate, and I'll still continue to seek her support for uh, supporting my disallowance to give the Australian people some certainty in uh, the coming period to, to make sure that no money, time or energy continues to be spent on delivering managed investment scheme, which we know is an entirely inappropriate um, a vehicle for uh, litigation funding, uh, that no further uh, uncertainty and limitation of access to justice is continued in the haphazard way that the government's gone about it so far. If this disallowance isn't passed this evening, it will hurt organisations like the Australian Farmers Fighting Fund who support class actions that affect their members, such as in the class actions against the live export ban. It will also hurt workers seeking their only avenue for justice in wage theft cases because the government cravenly refuses to pass appropriate wage theft laws. Mr Rod Gibson, the lead plaintiff in the landmark Murray Goulburn case action, um, Case, form, a former stockbroker and former director of three stockbroking firms gave evidence to the PJC inquiry. I want to give a, a voice to his evidence because he debunked the government's narrative that a naive, naive Australians are being ripped off by rapacious funders and being denied their access to justice. Large amounts of money are involved in litigation funded cases. That is true. And there could be excellently considered structures to make sure that Australians get the best value out of those decisions and get the majority of the uh, allocation of any awards that be, might be um, determined by the court. And I know that Senator Hanson is interested in that matter, and I'm very keen to make sure that that outcome is delivered too. And that is why I will continue to say today we should disallow this regulation by Mr Frydenberg. We should give Australian certainty we should make sure that this government that's acted arbitrarily and dangerously in this, in this regard come back and put something carefully considered on the table early in the new year. Now, Mr Gibson said, I've been in this business of investing for quite a long time. I've been around the block a few times. I'm not going to get corralled into anything I don't want to be corralled into. No pressure was put on me whatsoever. If you try to get rid of litigation funders, you're going to be cutting off the only avenue of redress that 99 per cent of people have because most of us can't afford to launch actions against corporates. Mr Gibson went on to say, in answer to my question as to whether the class members had a negative experience of litigation funding, and his response was this. Not one of them objected. We're talking of over 1,300 litigants. They had every opportunity to object if they thought it was insufficient and not one of them thought it was insufficient. Now, Mr Gibson's a man, a businessman who knew exactly what he was getting into with litigation funder. He trusted the wisdom of the judge and he was able to receive recompense for his ill. The inquiry should listen to these individuals who've actually uh, interacted with class action funders. Uh, and we have listened. And we're at a point now where I believe that it is clear that the government's ill-conceived scheme introduced as regulation, is not fit for purpose and it should not be allowed to continue. The government even managed to bungle the rollout of this scheme uh, that they've imposed on us by first giving ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Commission, only a single day's notice before announcing the changes. 
They forgot to release the required statement regarding the impact of the regulatory change, that would, as this would impact on business and individuals. And these errors from this government alone show how poorly conceived this idea was, how rushed, how sloppy, and how damaging regulatory leadership by the Treasurer is proving to be. These regulations were not the sober reflection of a government following a commission, report or inquiry. They're merely the scribblings in the margins of a party manifesto or cliff notes scrawled on the back of a lobbyist's card, discreetly tucked into a minister's pocket. They're heavy on ideology but utterly scant on detail. Is this really what should be at the top of this government's priorities during a global pandemic? These regulations also go against the advice that the Treasury gave to then Treasurer Scott Morrison in a review that it conducted in 2015, where it said there was no reason to believe that Parliament ever intended, and I quote, no reason to believe that Parliament ever intended that litigation funding schemes should be regulated as a financial product under the Corporations Act. When the court case uh, called Brookfield Multiplex Limited versus International Litigation Funding Partners Proprietary Limited unintentionally captured litigation funders in the AFSL regime and the MIS provisions of the Corporations Act, ASIC then swiftly moved to grant them relief from these requirements because ASIC believed that plaintiffs would, and I'll quote, suffer considerable delay, expense, uncertainty and disruption as a consequence of the decision. And that is why senators, and particularly those on the crossbench who I'm calling on to support my disallowance motion, should support what I'm asking you to do today, because it will, it will cause delay, it will cause expense, it is causing uncertainty and it is disrupting the litigation funding action in this country. Far from listening to his own department or the responsible agency, Treasurer Frydenberg has even refused to make available to the inquiry the decision-making process behind these rushed, alarming regulatory reforms by refusing to release key documentation between ASIC and the Treasurer's office to the government's own inquiry into these very changes, claiming public interest immunity, that we shouldn't know what the conversations were that were going on in the background that led the Treasurer of Australia to one day announce an inquiry and a mere nine days later, ignore his own direction and come in with regulation over the top. Why is there such secrecy? If the Treasurer's got nothing to hide, if his motives are pure and if he's acting in the best interest of the Australian public, why on earth would he try to hide that from the Joint Committee? Secrecy, speed, sloppiness, these are the three hallmarks of these regulatory changes. You cannot trust this government's future promises of support or reform. I note as a member of the committee that reported on the bipartisan reporting to whistleblowers, the government promised to on that, act on that urgent need for protections, and they've made that promise. Senators, they made that promise three years ago. We are still waiting. I was also a member of the Senate Education Employment Committee that released the landmark report on industrial manslaughter two years ago. We reported, and people were here in the gallery, mothers and fathers, in tears for the loss of their children, for their husbands, their partners. Two years, the government's done nothing. They had the power. They had a two, two whole years to do something. They did nothing to help. You cannot trust the word of this government. You cannot trust their promises. You can only draw the appropriate conclusions from their actions. The only supporters for this change in regulation are foreign pressure groups, such as the American Chamber of Commerce Institute for Legal Reform, large corporates, lobbyists and insurance companies. The government would have you believe that litigation funders are a bunch of ambulance chasers helping find spurious, fund spurious class actions, but they are giving people access to justice. The regulations as they stand do not protect everyday Australians. And I urge senators particularly Senator Hanson, who I, I, I know from my um, professional conversations with her, uh, wants, like me, for Australians to get access to the justice and also to be able to get their fair share of whatever the court decides. I know that that's your intention. I just urge you to, to stand on the side of the Australian people, disallow this motion, give them some comfort, and do not trust this government, who have been found so wanting so wanting in delivering the promises that they've made in this place time after time, day after day, 
year after year. I urge you, urge you to act in the Thank interest you. of the Australian people. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The biggest barrier to justice in this country is financial. That is the capacity of ordinary people to have their day in court, the capacity for ordinary people to be able to seek justice. And class actions are crucial to that end. And we should be making it easier for people to organise and collectivise, to seek justice and take legal action. We should not be making it more difficult, which is what the government is trying to do. So the Greens will be supporting this disallowance motion because it is essential that everyday people can access the courts to have the opportunity to fix wrongs that they have suffered. And in the main, those wrongs have been suffered um, historically in this country through the actions of governments or the actions of big corporations. The government's corporations amendment litigation funding regulations do not make it easier for ordinary Australians to access the courts when they've suffered a wrong or a loss or an injury. In fact, they make it harder. And they make it harder deliberately and by design. The government's regulations require litigation funders to hold an Australian financial services licence. Now, that would include not-for-profit funders like, for example, the Australian Farmers Fighting Fund. The regulations also specify that class actions are managed investment schemes. The government's regulations treat everyday, ordinary Australians who are seeking compensation from corporate or government wrongdoing as if they were some kind of investors seeking to make a profit. Even the corporate regulator ASIC says that the government's regulations are not suitable. And what the government is trying to do is make it harder for everyday people to right wrongs by seeking justice through having their day in court. And we're talking about people here, for example, who are being poisoned by toxic PFAS chemicals. And let's not forget the thousands of people who were totally shafted by this government's robo-debt debacle. Research has shown that people who rely on class actions are people who would normally face considerable barriers to asserting their rights in court and accessing the justice that we actually established our court system to deliver. Many are elderly, injured, have disabilities or are dealing with incredible grief or distress because of things that they are suing about. And yet the government wants to make it harder for them to achieve justice. A good government would begin by making a formal response to the Australian Law Reform Commission's report into litigation funding, which the Attorney General has had for almost two years now. A good government would consider the 24 recommendations in that report and use them as a base to develop solid and sensible regulations that enable everyday Australians to access our justice system a little bit more easily. Going to court, particularly to get relief from corporate or government wrongdoing, should not be an obstacle course. Everyone needs transparency and certainty and, of course, appropriate regulation. But we should be generating regulation to protect and assist those who are constantly locked out of the legal system simply because they cannot afford to access justice. But these government's regulations are not that kind of regulation. They are actually designed to make it more difficult for people to have their day in court and to access justice. And that is why the Australian Greens will support this motion to disallow them. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. I rise to make a brief contribu contribution to this debate and uh, indicate that I will be supporting the disallowance um, that has been moved. Um, it, it seems to me, uh, when I look at this, and, we heard, and just to, to summarise on what Senator O'Neill had talked about, uh, the, th this, there was a, an inquiry established. Partway through the in inquiry being established, uh, a regulation was then tabled by the Treasurer. 
caught ASIC completely by surprise. Uh, and indeed, I know uh, there's not many people on, on the other side of the chamber itching to, to stand up and defend uh, this particular regulation. It is uh, a regulation that I believe will reduce access to justice for small people. And that's, uh, that is my deep concern in relation to this bill. I do understand that Senator Hanson is actually trying to work constructively with the government to find a, uh, perhaps a, a more sophisticated uh, arrangement that uh, seeks to balance out uh, uh, protections. I note that, uh, in some sense, uh, this regulation may have come as a result of uh, some uh, lawyers, some uh, senior lawyers, actually doing the wrong thing. But I point out that in that situation, uh, in that particular case, the the uh, the court actually dealt with uh, with those people in a very very uh, firm way. So uh, we can have the status quo whilst uh, a bill is is uh, uh, is developed with uh, with Senator Hanson and uh, I'd be very open to supporting such a bill. Uh, but I just point out uh, we have heard one of the difficulties with uh, not disallowing something and then waiting for the government to do uh, something. And, and you, we've mentioned whistleblowers. Uh, uh, whistleblower legislation is one that I, that's uh, foremost in my mind. Uh, ICAC is another one. Uh, there, there are a stream of different uh, pieces of legislation pro promised by the government. So. Uh, uh, and I, look, I thank Senator Hanson. I, I know she has come into the chamber. Uh, often she does uh, sit and listen to what everyone's got to say uh, and considers what is being said. Uh, I just say through you, Chair, that it, it's, it would be much better to disallow this and have the Treasurer wanting Senator Hanson's support rather than uh, letting this through and then having Senator Hanson needing the Treasurer to make a decision. Uh, she will be in a much stronger position negotiating, uh, negotiating what, uh, leg the legislation that she's seeking uh, if this, uh, if this uh, instrument is disallowed. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak in favour of uh, this disallowance motion, and I do so on behalf of many of those who have taken um, the very difficult step uh, to take on either a corporation, a big bank, a big insurer or indeed their own government when they have been wronged, their community has been wronged, and often at the expense of their farms, their environment or their children's health. And what we see uh, today is just one step in the government's attack on justice and the participatory democracy that is so fundamental in this country. This is just one block in the wall that this government wants to put up between ordinary Australians being able to seek justice and the government being able to shelter and look after their big corporate mates. We know at the moment there is a number of class actions on foot, one of which is uh, um, controversial uh, in this place, relates to the management of water in the Murray-Darling Basin. And we know there are a bunch of small farmers in the Riverina area who are desperately fighting for justice because of the incompetence and mismanagement of water. We also know that while this class action is on foot, we've just seen a report come out of New South Wales ICAC that shows that the exact concerns and injustices committed against everyday farmers like those in the Riverina have, did go on, did happen, were overseen by the New South Wales government, and lo and behold, at this point nothing can happen. Those farmers those who are fighting for their community deserve their day in court. And how do they afford to get their day in court? They do it by coming together and funding those costs collectively. This disallowance motion would make it near impossible for those communities to stand up for themselves, their environment, their farms and their future. We know, of course, that 
after the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria. It took a class action to deliver real justice for those impacted. There is also another uh, class action on foot, and that is from a number of young people who are standing up for their right to a safe climate and a healthy environment. Those who are taking class action to stop the Whitehaven Vickery coal mine. Those young people have a right to justice and a right to have their day in court. And how do they do it if they don't come from rich families? They have to be able to rely on litigation funding. It is absolutely crystal clear that this move by the government is designed to shut down ordinary Australians and to shut them out of the justice system and being able to participate in accessing redress. We know that this is an attack from the government that is just one part of the process, but it is in, in doing so, it is the government covering the backsides of big corporates, of the big banks, of big pharma, of the big insurance companies, of the big agriculture and irrigation corporations. Many of these corporations, of course, are all foreign-owned, multinationals, and they come into people's communities, they poison their water, they rip up their land, and the community is left with nothing, except when they decide to fight back. And that is what litigation funding allows. It's for everyday Australians who have been wronged to be able to take on the injustice they have suffered themselves and each other. It is a fundamental part of our system. To take this away is simply giving the green light to big, greedy corporations in this country to keep treating everyday Australians terribly, like mugs, and having absolutely no regard for the consequences of their actions. We know that there, are, there is often class actions that get brought forward that are uncomfortable for the government of the day. Maybe they're taking on a government department or a government agency or a mate, a corporate mate of the government of the day. But it is not a responsible government or a representative government that takes the right away of their citizens to access justice and to have their arguments and their issues and their position put in court. That is a fundamental part of the Australian democracy. I said that this motion is just one part of the government's attack on everyday Australians being able to access justice and to participate in our democracy. And next down the line, of course, we have the government arguing to ban secondary boycotts, to ban the idea of the community and individual citizens being able to come together and make choices about where they want to spend their money. It is just not okay. This is an attack on democracy, it's an attack on access to justice, and it is an attack on Australians' freedom. It is not the type of position or ethos that should be coming from the Conservatives over here, for heaven's sake. But when it comes to cover covering the backsides of their big corporate mates, they'll sweep aside the concerns of regular Australians and they'll chip, chip, chip away at these fundamental rights. It's important for this parliament and this Senate today to vote in support of this disallowance motion to sweep away this attack and to send a clear message to those on the other side that we're not going to sit by and let everyday Australians be taken for granted just because the people abusing the land, 
their workers' rights, their freedoms happen to be cosy corporate mates of yours. Big agriculture, big pharma, the big banks and the big insurance companies. They're the ones who desperately want this motion to fail. They want it to fail because they don't want to be held to account in court for their negligence, their misinformation and their disregard for the rights and freedoms of everyday people or the environment. So I urge the crossbench, don't give big pharma, the big banks, the big irrigators a win today. Give everyday Australians and our community the assurance they need that if something goes wrong, they can have their day in court and they don't have to be rich to be able to access justice. They should be able to work together, fund together and make sure that they can access justice in a way that delivers the proper redress if that is indeed what the court of the day decides. Senator Hanson. This is a very important um, uh, decision to be made uh, with regards to this disallowance motion. And I, I know the passion that Senator O'Neill has, uh, has to, to do with this, and she's concerned about the Australian people, like all of us are. But listening to these speeches today, boy, I've heard some spin put on it, and it's not the truth, it hasn't even come out. So the people that are listening, watching, they're thinking, well, what's going on here? I don't favour either side in this place neither with the Liberal, National Party or the Labor. All the decisions that I make here is based on research and to listen to both sides. I've had constant conversations with um, Senator O'Neill with regards to this. I've listened to her. I've had discussions with the government with regards to this as well. And finally, the right um, decision to come to for the Australian people, for those people that do deserve justice. There has to be justice. And to say it's only for the big end of town, if you've got the money to go to the banks, you know, to, to actually go to the courts, that's not the, that's not the truth. The whole truth here is you're talking about litigation funders. Let's, let's talk the truth here. Litigation funders have been coming into this country. They're backed from other people who put in monies around the world. And you know who they picked to come and do litigation funding? Australia go down under. They have a lot of litigation there, big payouts, payouts to the tune of its statistics show litigants who use litigation funders historically lose up to 50 per cent of any judgment awarded. 50 per cent. Don't hear you talking about that. Not only that, they're not registered here in Australia. And where they are registered, you know where they send the money? They actually send it to the Cayman Islands. We don't even get taxes out of them. They're only doing it for the profits, the money's in their pocket. Oh, we just had the robo debt, the litigation there, 1.2 billion. I wonder what they got out of it. How much did the Australian people get out of it? Have you spoken about that? Have you really cared what the Australian people are getting out of it? No one has really spoken about that. But what I have been doing is doing my, my research and talking to the government about the Australian people getting money out of it. They're the ones that are hurting. And my negotiations in talking to the government is that there is a minimum payout of 70 per cent, even more to others. But you're more worried about the, the litigation funders making their millions of dollars out of it. Now, if they're represented by themselves, not by the litigation funders, they, the, they actually get, where the litigation funder is not involved, receive approximately 85 per cent of the awarded payouts that they both get—85 per cent. Isn't that important? Isn't that what this is all about? Don't we want to see regulated industry here in Australia with these funding that they are registered? 
that they are up front, that they are going to represent the people, that it's not going to go in the pockets of who knows around the world that they're not paying their taxes here in Australia. Isn't that what's important about all this? And don't say they're not getting justice. There is justice. There will be justice, but they will be registered. Now, I know the Labor Party has a big interest in this because of their, their firms, Slater and Gordon, Morris Blackburn and Shine, litigation fund you know, litigators. So they take on these cases because of the money. So they get funded by litigation funders from around the world to take it on to be the lawyers, and a deal's been done. So they make a lot of money out of this, and I'm sure some of that money goes back into the Labor Party. So there is self-interest here. That's what we need to stop because they can still represent the Australian people. Let the Australian people decide. If you actually allow for these non-profit organisations, people can go and represent themselves. Okay, if they've got to be registered, so be it, because you don't want every Tom, Dick and Harry taking their, their cases to the courts, which are, which are going to be um, it's not feasible to do it. It has to be regulated in some way. But I have spoken to the government with this. I have no problem. Okay, it was held up. The report was supposed to be brought down a lot sooner this year. We've had a, a hell of a year. It's been totally different to any other year with the COVID. Everything's been put on hold. But the fact is that it, this is moving forward. I'm not going to support this disallowance motion because in my working with the government, what I'm trying to do is bring forward an outcome for Australians that they will get more payout, a bigger payout. So they are the ones that are hurting, not the litigation funders, not, not, the, um, not these, these uh, um, lawyers that are making a lot of money out of They don't want to see the change. They're not interested. So my position here is to look after the Australian people. And it's quite interesting, you know, that even Mark Dreyfus, member in the other house, he puts out a tweet, urgent, the Senate votes today on whether to overturn this is today. The Senate votes today on whether to overturn the government's move to deny access to justice to ordinary Australians, particularly farmers and households in rural and regional Australia. Where was the Labor Party, where was, where was Mark Dreyfus when it was one nation that pushed for the, uh, the bank inquiry into the rural, rural sector of Australia that we chaired? We listened to those farmers. We listened to those people that were losing their lands taken over by administrators and liquidators. That's why it came about the Royal Commission into it. So I how dare Mark Dreyfus talk to, you know, raise this and says we don't particularly care about the farmers. That's all I've ever talked about in this parliament. It's about the farmers and the man on the land. And says Re regional Australia, will Pauline Hanson's Oz, you know, um, stand with farmers or with the Liberals? It's not about whether I'll stand with either one. I have always backed the farming sector in Australia. No one can ever deny that. So I think it was a, a blow the belt punch from Mark Dreyfus there was no need for that at all. And I'm sick and tired of getting bullied in this place that I'm supposed to make decisions based on what you think is right. You know, both sides of this, this government here, whether it's Liberal or Labor, whoever is in government, do you think you've made the right decisions? Do you think that you've never done wrong? The Labor Party, you stand up there and you criticise the, the Liberal Party now because they're in government? What you have done has not been Senator up to the standards of the Australian people either. So the fact is that I will make the decisions based on I think what's right for the people, and I won't be bullied by either side. And say that I that I will not make my decisions will be based on what I think is right for the Australian people, and I will keep working with the government and push them because the outcome that I want, I want a regulated industry, where people have to be registered here in Australia not the litigation funders from overseas funding it and getting millions and millions of dollars out of Australian people without paying their taxes. I also want the people that, if they are awarded, that they get the money, not these rich lawyers that get, see, you know, 
here comes another sucker. We're going to get as much as we can out of them. And that's who we should be supporting. Order. And that's why I, am, I will be continuing to work with them that this is dealt with ASAP and it's the end of the year, so I'm hoping this is going to be dealt with ASAP. So that's where I'm at. And, and I'll put it on the record. If you think that's the case, and I always get thrown up my face by the Labor Party, what deals has she done? No deals have been done. I don't do deals. I actually state the case, I research it, I look at it, and I make my decisions based on what I think is right for the people in this country. And this is the way I'm going with it. So congratulations on all your work you've done, Senator, Senator O'Neill. But you, we will not be supporting you in this disallow this motion. So I hope that next year we can celebrate when uh, changes are made to, to give fair and balance to, to the Order. Order. I'm not Order. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Chair. Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I know we're pressing for time. I just want to make a very brief contribution to this debate because I am chairing the relevant inquiry, which will be soon handing down its report into this question. And I wanted just to share some brief facts that have been omitted from this debate uh, by some contributors so far. If Senator O'Neill's motion was successful today, litigation funders would no longer have to seek uh, and be granted an AFSL licence. What does an AFSL licence require someone to do? It requires them to act efficiently, honestly and fairly. Which of those three requirements, Senator O'Neill and the Greens, do you think that litigation funders should not be required to do? Do you think they should not be required to act efficiently? Do you think they should not be required to act honestly? Or is it fairly? You don't think they should be required to act fairly? Order. Uh, because the record shows, in fact, since these regulations were uh, introduced, litigation funders have been apply applying for and have been successfully granted AFSL licences. As they said before our inquiry, they don't think that's a significant obstacle. Uh, the, co the complaint that they did have was largely around the MIS schemes, and ASIC has given them enormous relief from the regulations imposed under the MIS schemes. Almost every part, almost every complaint they made before the inquiry about the applications of the MIS schemes, they have been granted relief from ASIC from complying with. So this is a totally phony debate. This is a totally false debate. And it is a bizarre debate to hear the Greens and the Labor Party come in here and defend litigation funders who are generating 500, 600, 700 per cent returns from cases which they are then remitting back to their Cayman Order. Islands, British Virgin Islands, Jersey Islands headquarters. They're quite fond, fond of islands. I, I never thought I would see the day the Labor Party and the Greens would combine to come in here and try and defend financiers making what they would normally call record profits and obscene profits off our legal Senator system, Patterson, off please our take justice I've got system. Senator Hanson on her. Much for Senator. a point of order, I'm very interested in what um, Senator Patterson has to say. You know, these other people in the chamber had the, you know, we had the courtesy to allow them to have their say. I expect the same courtesy paid to Senator Patterson, so we and other people can actually listen to this debate. I agree. Interjections are disorderly. And we'll call Senator Patterson. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to point out we require a suburban financial planner with the most meagre of resources to have an AFSL licence to practice in this country. It is a pretty basic requirement to be operating as a financial services provider, and the federal court has found that litigation funders are financial services providers, and they were required to, be, to have AFSL licence and, and to be considered an MIS scheme until uh, Mr Bowen uh, as, a, as the Financial Services Minister issued a regulation of his own, Senator O'Neill, I know you have strong objections to regulations, but issues a regulation of his own to exempt them from that requirement, despite the fact that the courts had found that they were subject to it. Uh, I look forward to handing down the final report of this committee so that the parliament can consider a more durable solution to this problem. But in the meantime, it would be an enormous mistake to get rid of these regulations, which are requiring very basic, very minimal standards of efficiency, Senator honesty Hudson, and fairness. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I never thought I'd see Senator Patterson arguing point. for more regulation. It's not a point of order, Senator O'Neill. 
Senator Patterson. Oh, th thank you, Chair. I, I had concluded uh, my contribution, okay. but since invited to continue um, by Senator O'Neill, allow me to say um, I'm much more comfortable arguing for consistent regulation across all of our financial services providers so that everybody is on an even playing field than Labor or Green senators should Order. be arguing for tax haven domiciled uh, financiers who are making extraordinary profits of, frankly, very vulnerable people. Uh, we have heard many tales through this inquiry of how people who participate in class actions are getting cents on the dollar of what they deserve to get from their Order. rightful payout from their rightful payout because of these people. You might be comfortable defending them, Senator O'Neill. You might be com comfortable defending them, the Greens, uh, but I think that reflects on you. I think our concern should be for class action participants, not those who are making super profits out of our justice system. Thank you. So the question is that the litigation funding regulation be— oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the regulation ensures that litigation funders operating in Australia are treated like other financial services providers and have to hold an Australian financial services licence and be regulated by the Corporations Act, which ensures that they have a legal obligation to act efficiently, honestly and fairly. So the question is that the litigation funding regulation be disallowed. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. Aye. No. The noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? I'll ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the litigation funding regulations, business of the Senate, motion number one, be disallowed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell for the ayes, Senator Brockman tell for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 32. The motion is therefore negative. So we will now resume business and I will call on the clerk. No, Mrs. sorry. I have got something. Senator Brockman seeking the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Pursuant to order and on behalf of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I present reports on legislation as listed them at item 19 on today's order of business, together with documents presented to the committee. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I will call the clerk. Is that oh, we're going to me. Sorry. All yours. Thank you. Business order of the day number one. Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill in committee. The committee is considering the Australian's Foreign Affairs State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill and amendments two and three on sheet 1078 moved by Senator Rice. So, anybody ready to go? Are we actually ready to move it? Sorry, I wasn't in the chair previously. So the question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Rice. The, the, the Greens votes um, be recorded as voting in favour of that, uh, that, those, amendments, those amendments. Thank you. Well, yes. so, so noted. So Senator Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. I um, seek leave to move uh, Amendment 1 on Sheet 1151 together with uh, Amendments 1 and 2 on Sheet 1152, although I, I think they require separate questions to be to be asked. Okay, I'm just going to We're happy for them to move together. That's okay, right. thank you very much. I'll just I just want to speak briefly to this. Prior uh, this morning, we talked about uh, the the, you know, the the judicial review or the review associated with decisions made by uh, by the minister under this bill. Uh, the Senate has declined. Uh, to include an AAT uh, review process. Um, so, what this amendment or these amendments together seek to do is to remove the prohibition in the bill for a review under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, uh, and uh, c requires the, the minister to, to make a dis to make or provide decision reasonings. Now, I just want to talk uh, very briefly about that. The um, Administrative Decision uh, Re Judicial Review Act does not permit a merits review, which I think is one of the things that the minister is seeking to avoid 
a discussion about you know, the merits of a particular policy decision. The Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act, uh, Section 5, sets out the sorts of questions that can be brought before a court in relation to the decision. And they are things like that a breach of the rules of natural justice occurred in connection with the making of the decision, that procedures that were required by law to be observed in connection with the making of the decision were not, not observed, um, that the decision was induced or affected by fraud, uh, that there was no evidence or material to justify the making of the decision. They're just several uh, of the questions that can be put uh, before a court. They are questions of law, not, not, uh, not going to the merits of uh, any particular decision. So this is trying to find the balance between not overloading the, the AAT with matters typically that would be initiated by fairly significant litigants, shire councils, state governments, uh, it would, uh, um, uh, or universities. Uh, you know, the AAT is more of a place for uh, individual litigants who want to take on the government in respect of a decision that's been made about them personally. That's typically what happens uh, in, the, in the AAT. But this does bring the level up to a court. That in itself will filter out the number of applications likely, be, likely to be made. But an important part of that uh, review process is that uh, uh, the minister is required to uh, provide, a dec provide a decision. Now, it's generally accepted in administrative decision making that decision makers who are required to write down and set out the reasons generally make a better decision. But there are other reasons why people should be provided with reasons. In these circumstances, the minister may make a decision about an organisation, and that organisation uh, may, uh, in a sense, be aggrieved by the minister's, minister's decision. They've got a no on something. They've been prohibited from, from doing something or something has been overturned, and they never get to understand why. That's the one, one of the reasons and why which administrative decisions uh, normally are accompanied with reasons so that the aggrieved party can have a look at those reasons. The second uh, reason why it's important to have uh, reasons made available is that it, or uh, well, sorry, the third reason, first being better decisions are made, second, the aggrieved party can see. Uh, what, you know, what the justification was. The third is that it actually provides a mechanism for review, uh, for, to initiate a judicial review of some sort. You can see what the minister has or has not done, and uh, you can uh, perhaps bring that to the attention uh, of a court. And the fourth reason is that, in, in general, with any administrative decision, we like to see consistency in government. We like to see uh, predictability in government, and if we have a number of decisions that are available for people to see, for people to understand and comprehend, then uh, it allows others in the community to understand whether or not the actions they might be considering taken would fall foul of the minister's um, intent or, or not. So it is important to provide reasons, uh, and it's for that reason that this, uh, uh, I would encourage the Senate to vote for uh, the amendments that I that I have uh, uh, that I have put. Minister, um, thank you, um, Madam. I um, oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to uh, to clarify in relation to the ADGR, which ADJR, which we went through uh, in part uh, earlier today, um, the government does not support uh, these amendments. Um, one of those being the uh, requirement. One of the reasons for that being the requirement uh, to provide reasons. Uh, we also believe that uh, there is substantial overlap between the scope of judicial review under the um, uh, ADJR Act and the Constitution itself, that is the common law which is already available, of course, and the grounds for, ju for judicial review under the ADJR Act. I'm sorry, Sen um, Senator, I misspoke. I meant to say the Judiciary Act and the ADJR Act there. Um, the government is of the view that um, Judicial review remains available under the Foreign Relations Bill, as we have already discussed, by the Federal Court, uh, by the Federal Circuit Court, under the uh, Judiciary Act, by the High Court, 
uh, under the Constitution. And like the ADGR, these avenues of review do allow a court to do several things, including setting aside a decision that has been unlawfully made, requiring the performance of a duty uh, that a decision maker has failed to perform, ceasing proceedings where a decision maker has failed to exercise their powers properly. Uh, and to grant an injunction to prevent or require certain action. So we do think the judicial review mechanism in the bill is appropriate. There are comparable schemes which also exclude the AG ADJR Act review on the basis that those uh, schemes are ones which involve complex political considerations. That includes the FERB, it includes, as I said earlier, decisions, certain decisions under the Passport Act, extradition and prisoner transfer arrangements, and a range of other decisions relating to intelligence and national security, to taxation, to corporations uh, and to charities. Uh, and I don't think um, uh, it is appropriate to replace the foreign minister as a decision maker on foreign policy and uh, foreign relations uh, with merits review. These are the remit of the federal government. They draw from federal government uh, expertise. Uh, and uh, we oppose these uh, amendments. I'll give Senator Wong. Oh, sorry, Senator Rice. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, the Greens will be supporting this amendment um, on the issue of of review. It's not, it doesn't go as far as our amendment, sort of asking for review and the reasons to be to be provided. But it's certainly a step forward and an improvement from what is currently in the bill. Okay, so I'm going to put. Yeah, I'm going to start with, um, and I think Senator Patrick will correct me if I'm incorrect. But I'm going to start by putting on sheet 1152 um, to oppose item one of schedule one. So the part one of sheet 1152 on Australia's foreign relations, state and territory arrangements. That, and the question is that item one of schedule one stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Order. I'm just going to explain what we're doing. Um, I'm sure the whips are across it. But um, the first question I'm going to put is that um, Schedule 1, that item 1 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. So that is a reference back to Amendment 1 on sheet 1152. The second piece I'm then, and these have been moved by Senator Patrick, and then the second part of that, after we voted on that, will be Amendment 2 on sheet 1151. And the third a piece that Senator Patrick has moved is um, Amendment 1 on sheet 1151. So the question is that item 1 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 31 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is negated. So the second one we'll put on the voices. So the question is that item one of Schedule One stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, beg your pardon. So it is. Uh, so the question is that Amendment Two on Sheet One One Five Two and Amendment One on Sheet One One Five One be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, sorry. I'll just seek advice from the clerk. Right. I'll stand corrected. So it is Item One on both of those sheets. So those of that opinion on 1151 and 1152. So I'm, put, I'm going to put the question. So we. So the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. Uh, believe the noes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Sorry. Um, I'm calling for the for the noes. Senator Wong. This is the positive amendment for reasons for decision which the Labor Party support. Um, unless one nation are indicating that they are changing their position, I think that that will be uh, we will that amendment will not succeed. So we can call the division if people wish. No, you're not in a position to indicate. Oh, well, the eyes have it. Those have a division required, I think. Uh, so, okay, so we, a division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So before I put the question, it will, I've just explained that we are dealing with Amendment 1 on sheet 1151, as moved by Senator Patrick, and Amendment 1, order, on sheet 1152. And the question is that the amendment be agreed to. So the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 31 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the neg negative. It now being passed, I'll just report to committee. It being 7:20 p.m., I shall now report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate that the Senate do now adjourn. I'll just wait for senators uh, who are not participating in the adjournment debate to leave the chamber. And when we've got a bit more quiet, Senator Rennick, I'll call you. Senator Rennick. Thank you. Uh Madam Deputy President, today the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed, sorry, overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new ele electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger the public policy could itself become the captive of the scientific technological elite. It is the task of the statesmanship to mould, to balance and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system, ever aiming toward the supreme goal of our free society. Those words I just uh, quoted were actually from a bloke by the name of Dwight Eisenhower who said in his departing speech those words way back in 1961. And I must admit I was only put on to this uh, part of the speech today because it's probably uh, better known for a course where he referred to the industrial military complex. But what I find amazing about this speech was just how prophetic it was in uh, anticipating the problems of the conflict of interest between education for the sake of education and knowledge versus the need, obviously, for greater funding. Um, 
And of course, the other great thing about you know this was such a well-known speech because Eisenhower predicted back in 1961 the threat of the industrial military complex. And you know a lot of people can go, oh here's Rennick again. He's put on his silver tinfoil hat. But you know you can call me a right-wing nut job. But the one person you can't call a right-wing nut job, of course, is the person who, in my view, is the greatest leader of the 20th century. And that, of course, was Dwight Eisenhower, who led the invasion forces of at D-Day. Uh, was the head of NATO, was the first uh, supreme commander of NATO, was the head of Columbia University and, of course, president uh, for two terms. Uh, and, of course, he oversaw a great era in the American uh, history where he built, built lots and lots of infrastructure, which just happens to be one of my favourite topics. And, of course, I often wonder what he'd think if he was alive today because he was worried then about the industrial military complex. And today, of course, we have many uh, uh, industrial complexes, whether it be the superannu superannuation industrial complex, the renewables industrial complex, the childcare industrial complex, the higher education industrial complex. There are so many vested interests in the role of government. And of course, it's this last paragraph where he says, it is the task of the statesman to mould and to balance and integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system. And in order to do, and, and I should finish this, ever aiming towards the supreme goal of our free society. And you know, this is one of the uh, important things uh, that we have to do. Uh, is, in my view, is to stand up to our bureaucratic elite, um, who, in my view, uh, gravely lets us down uh, in many, many ways. And I, I just want to touch on a couple of those issues briefly. Uh, and I think the first one that really sort of grinds my gears is the $430 billion defined benefit liability. Uh, this was the first year, this year's budget was the first time it was ever discounted at 1 per cent. So you actually got to see what the true cost of this liability is going to be for our children. Now about a third of that is for the military. We've got no problems with that. Our military deserve to be looked after in retirement. Absolutely no problem. But the remaining approximately $300 billion, and I'm going to get these numbers confirmed if Treasury give me these numbers and estimates, and on my questions on notice and estimates, and I better get them, um, works out at about over a million dollars for every retired bureaucrat. And I have to ask myself, and everyone says you can't go back and change the defined benefit scheme because it's a violation of property rights. Well, I would disagree with that because in order to have a property right, you have to have a valid contract. And a valid contract requires an offer and an acceptance. And there was never an offer by the elite to the people that said, we want to pay ourselves a, defined, uh, a golden handshake or a defined golden pension um, that's going to cost you a uh, million dollars, over a million dollars per person. Uh, and that is just one example of how our bureaucrats are a part of this technological elite and they've basically, in my view, overstayed their, uh, over used their powers. Thank Senator, you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, tonight I rise to make some remarks about the state opposition and the WA Liberal Party and the ongoing and significant risk they pose to the health and well-being of West Australians. Right through the course of the COVID-19 pandemic so far in Western Australia, the Liberal opposition has every step of the way sought to undermine the efforts of the McGowan Labor government. No team spirit here, no putting the science or the epidemiology first. They've called again and again for the borders to be opened, siding not only with federal colleagues here but also with Clive Palmer in trying to use the courts to bring Western Australia's border down. This is the same Clive Palmer who, of course, made attempts to bankrupt Western Australia with a 30 billion dollars damages claim. And I don't think that's surprising really that the Liberals are also associated with this given their history of reckless spending when they were in control of the Western Australian state government's finances. I would note that Lisa Harvey, the under the pressure from her federal WA Liberal colleagues perhaps, repeatedly called again and again for Western Australia's hard border to be scrapped. That border, that border was there for no other reason than to keep West Australian citizens safe through this global pandemic. There's no doubt 
that indeed we know the border had an effect on families, that it's been tough, that it's had an impact on jobs and livelihoods. But it is a, a lot less tough than losing loved ones to COVID-19 and a lot less tough than a pandemic with untold economic consequences as we're seeing elsewhere around the world. But finally, in Western Australia, it seems at last that the faceless men in the Liberal Party of WA have understood the mood in the room, they've understood the mood in the public, and they have overthrown Lisa Harvey. In throwing out Lisa Harvey, who, despite all her faults on policy and understanding the West Australian sentiment and mood, she was an experienced operator with real life experience who had been in government before. So who did Nick Garan and Peter Collier leave themselves as picks for the West Australian Liberal Party leadership? On one hand, we had an untested leader on training wheels or an incompetent former minister who displayed bad judgment again and again. WA Liberals who wanted the borders down in the height of the pandemic and the shadow health minister who's now the leader of the Liberal Party in WA was responsible for that policy. They have selected in the WA Liberal Party the very man uh, who was the shadow health minister who endorsed the call for the borders to come down. So it doesn't really matter, I say to the chamber tonight, it doesn't really matter who the leader of the WA Liberal Party is. You can see from these backroom dynamics that the risk is the same. Unfortunately, I've got no trust. No trust that they won't continue to undermine the efforts of the McGowan Labor government, a McGowan Labor government that has kept the state safe and strong. Thanks to the considered and strong leadership of the McGowan government, WA has recorded this year the strongest growth of any state. That is 1.4 per cent, and that is even despite the pandemic in the final uh, quarter of that financial year. So Labor's strong leadership in WA from Tuesday the 8th of December, we know that families will now be able to be reunited from loved one, with loved ones from all over um, the place, including Victoria and New South Wales, and we're wishing uh, South Australia all the best in getting their pandemic there under control so that we can welcome them to a state. We cannot risk another WA Liberal government. We want a strong and experienced Premier that we can trust. Mark McGowan. Senator Betts. Twelve days ago, a full bench of the federal court, 3-0, brought to an end three years of desperate lawfare by the Australian Workers' Union in its attempt to shut down an investigation by the Registered Organisations Commission into alleged unauthorised use of AWU members' money by its former National Secretary, Mr Shorten. The AWU lost on every single issue of fact and issue of law it had pursued. This matter can now be very easily settled. Indeed, the AWU National Secretary Daniel Walton promised to release all documents once the legal process is completed, even if the union loses the current court case. It lost. It should release the documents. The similarities between the allegations facing Mr Shorten and the AWU and Craig Thompson and the HSU are disturbingly similar. Craig Thompson used money to finance his campaign for the seat of Day Bell. Mr Shorten allegedly used AWU members' money to finance his run. Mr Thompson used money to make donations to what he considered worthy causes with which he was associated. Mr Shorten allegedly used union money to make donations to GetUp, of which he was a board member at the time. 
Mr Thompson was found to have breached sections 285, 286 and 287 of the registered organisations legislation, the same sections which Mr Shorten and the AWU continue to stand accused of breaching. In 2015, Justice Jessop found that Mr Thompson had used the money of the union without national executive authorisation, the same allegation against Mr Shorten. No wonder Mr Shorten threatened to defund the ROC if Labor won the last election. In 2007, Mr Shorten used AWU money to employ an individual to work on his own campaign. This was one of the breaches for which Mr Thompson was found guilty. Justice Jessop found that to use the services of the campaign worker for his own purposes was the clearest of improprieties. End of quote. The questionable AWU transactions include donations totalling $150,000 to GetUp, which GetUp should, of course, repay. GetUp's lack of integrity will see them cling on to these funds and disregard the AWU membership's entitlement. Labor has continually asserted that the ROC's investigation is nothing more than a fishing exercise through historic paperwork to find any kind of error, not a crime, an error. Well, Justice Jessop in the HSU case strongly disagreed with such arguments, describing using money without authorisation as a conspicuous impropriety and unthinkable breaches of the duties of an office holder of a union. And these are not small amounts. The impugned donations from the AWU totalled around $230,000. The amount that Justice Jessop found Mr Thompson had misappropriated was a lesser $184,000. Not deterred by the failure of the court challenge, the AWU took to Twitter a month ago to describe the ROC's inquiry into the AWU as a witch hunt. I remind listeners Justice Bromberg completely shredded such claims by the AWU. His Honour stated that the AWU has not presented any evidence or even suggested a case concept or narrative that provides a no motive for the knowing and deliberate conduct that it ascribes to the ROC. To the uh, Justice Bromberg found the AWU refused to cooperate with the most straightforward of requests for information by the ROC. It seems shiftiness and evasion are characteristics that are handed down the line of succession for national secretaries of the AWU. I commend the officers of the ROC for their commitment to achieving justice for the membership of the AWU, whose money has been allegedly used as a personal slush fund. Labor's vicious, personal and nasty attack on these officers are unbecoming, now proven to be false, and undertaken simply to distract from the issue at hand, AWU members' funds being misused by officials. Watch this space as justice ultimately prevails. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Christmas season is nearly here. Of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many Australians will be buying gifts online this year. Many will be using Amazon Australia for the first time. A company with an extremely concerning record on taxation, environmentalism and workplace rights. In 2019, Amazon's retail arm made $562 million in Australia but only paid $2.5 million in income tax for that year. That's an income tax rate of 0.4%. At the same time, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' personal net worth is a whopping $185 billion. It's disgusting that any single person should earn so much while his company fails to contribute to taxes around the world. It's worse that billionaires like Jeff Bezos have earned so much during COVID, while our income for the communities, hospitals, education, security misses out. The company's record on workplace rights is also deeply alarming. Warehouse workers across Europe were shocked to learn last week 
that Amazon had hired a notorious Pinkerton agency to gather intelligence on union activities, including going un undercover as spies on Polish warehouses. And in the United States, Amazon released a training video to managers teaching them how to identify warning signs of union activity. They have been seen sacked workers, workers sacked for speaking out about company failings surrounding COVID-19. This kind of big brother behaviour has no place in a modern society, and this grubby company should be held to account for their practices. Amazon's reliance on insecure work is another deeply concerning issue. Currently, the SDA and their state secretary in New South Wales, Bernie Smith, are supporting an Amazon worker who will soon be in the federal court pursuing their rights. Amazon led one of their, led one of their you know, labour hire employees to believe, because of her diligent work, that she would become a permanent employee of the company directly, directly employed by Amazon. Then she told Amazon that she was pregnant. She said she would be giving birth by Christmas, something that should be a joyous time for a young mother. But of course, suddenly, the job disappeared. Amazon will say that it was, it was not about that. It sh they'll say it's about some other flimsy excuse. But we do know the truth. Unionised workplaces don't get away with this. That's why these companies resort to casualisation and anti-union behaviour. Amazon, of course, has big ambitions in Australia. They plan to make $23 billion a year in retail revenue from their Australian operations by the end of this decade. They'll be larger than Qantas, Lendlease and Macquarie Group, and almost the size of Telstra. But we know their business model. Dodge paying tax, bust up the workers' voice, sack any staff who raise concerns and pollute the environment. This is why I'm urging others to join unionists, including politicians here, to join the Transport Workers' Union and the Shop Assistance Union and religious figures and activists around the world to make a, support a campaign called Make Amazon Pay. Make Amazon Pay is an international movement to ensure that Amazon does the right thing by communities and its employees. This movement says that Amazon can absolutely afford to pay its fair share in Australian taxes. Amazon can absolutely afford to pay its workforce appropriately, including sick leave and adequate breaks. And Amazon has no right to import anti-union activities, American activities, into its business community-busting strategies and a rapacious business model that puts profits over people. When it comes to workers' wages, Amazon rips them off. When it comes to owner-operators and contractors, Amazon rips them off. Amazon is one big rip-off. The Morrison government can make a difference right now by legislating for rights for contract labour and digital taxation. The choice for the government is whether they stand with businesses that pay their taxes and pay their workers, or whether they stand by rip-off merchants like Amazon. Time it's for... time to make Amazon pay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd like to speak tonight about the recent tragic deaths and serious injuries of food delivery workers in Sydney and across the country. We have seen a tragedy unfolding on our streets over the last few months. At least five delivery riders have been killed on the roads since the end of September, and four of those deaths were in Sydney. The Greens have been warning for years about the precarious and dangerous nature of exploitative work in the so-called gig economy. Operating outside the ordinary rules and parameters of our industrial relations systems, companies like Uber Eats, Menulog, and Deliveroo profit hugely off the back of drivers and riders who are often paid well below minimum wage and who put up with dangerous conditions that would be completely acceptable in other, unacceptable in other industries. Riders have to work themselves to exhaustion in order to make enough money to eat, and their pay has reportedly been cut during the pandemic. Moreover, these companies do not check basic things like, does this person know how to ride a bike safely? 
Is the bike in good condition? Does it need repairs? Or is it roadworthy at all? The mentality behind gig, gig economy work forces workers to bear all responsibility and risk when it comes to their ability to get home safely um, at the end of the day. The company wipes it, its hands off. It is disgusting and an unfathomable business model. New figures revealed by SPS over the weekend show that 65 safety incidents have been reported to Safe Work New South Wales involving food delivery platforms in the last 12 months. And the Transport Workers Union says this is likely to be the tip of the iceberg. And we cannot ignore the reality that many of these delivery drivers are migrant workers and international students. In March and April, the government drew up its COVID income support measures and made a decision to exclude temporary visa holders from the coronavirus supplement and the JobKeeper wage subsidy. We put forward proposals right here in this chamber that would have extended income support to international students and other temporary visa holders. But sadly, this did not get support from the government. This decision has forced many into dangerous work. The Liberals' approach stood in sharp contrast to countries such as the UK, Canada, and New Zealand, where visa holders were eligible for income support. The Treasurer here said that when providing the COVID safety net, the government had to draw a line somewhere. And the Prime Minister infamously told international students to go home. But students did not go home. The latest data from September shows that the vast majority of international students and other visa holders stayed in Australia, and they remain in Australia. This shouldn't have come as a surprise. The pandemic continues to rage on across the world. Borders have remained closed, and perhaps most crucially, Many of these people have made it home here. So where should they go and why should they go? But they do have to make a living. When jobs evaporated earlier this year, without income support, many visa holders turned to the gig economy. In its recent submission to the New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry into Future Work, major food delivery company Deliveroo stated that during COVID-19, it saw a surge in applications during COVID with hundreds of riders onboarded nationally between April and mid-August. These migrant workers might be invisible to you all sitting here, but they are real people who live here. They do the jobs that no one else will. They keep the economy going. Poor industrial conditions have been rightly identified as largely responsible for the danger of food delivery work. Laws must be overhauled at both the state and federal levels to provide better pay, good conditions, and protections that these workers deserve. But the brutal reality is that the federal government's decision to exclude migrant workers from COVID support should also be attributed some blame. And it gives me no pleasure here to label that decision racist and deadly. It's not too late to make changes. Federal income support measures should be immediately extended to all temporary visa holders. My thoughts are with the delivery riders and drivers who continue to needlessly suffer within this industry. And I extend my condolences and thoughts to the families, friends, and loved ones of the drivers who have been killed. Senator Davey. Thank you. In Australia, we have a health star rating system which is a system designed to help consumers make healthier choices. It is a system of good intent. Currently, there's over 10,300 packaged foods and drinks in Australia that have a Health Star rating label on the package. The system is designed to compare like for like, dairy products, uh, packaged foods and beverages, non-dairy beverages. So under the rating system, these products are given a rating based on their nutritional profile according to a strict calculation called the Health Star Rating Calculator. The integrity of this cal calculator is paramount to the integrity of the system because this is a system that, if we get it right, has great potential to aid consumers, but if we get it wrong, can be absolutely misleading. And I'll give you an example. 
If you were to look at two beverage products and on one ingredient list you had carbonated water, colouring, acidity regulators, sweeteners, preservatives, caffeine and natural flavours, or a different product that had natural fibres, vitamins A, B6, C, thiamine, folate, calcium, magnesium and potassium, which would you choose as a healthier choice? I know for my position, I'd choose the one with the vitamins and not the one with the numbers. But if we get the calculator wrong under the Health Star rating system, because of the protein, fat, carbohydrate and sugar content of the two products, the product with the vi fibre, vitamins and minerals may come in with a higher health star rating, uh, but with a lower health star rating than the other one. Now those two products I compared were diet cola or 100 per cent orange juice. When I talk to parents who want to do the right thing by their children, they would acknowledge that orange juice is a healthier choice than cola. Now, thankfully, most parents don't rely wholly and solely on a health star rating, but it does show how dangerous it is if we don't get the calculator right. We must ensure the calculator does as intended, which is to base its ratings on a combination of assessing the total energy, the saturated fat, sodium and sugar content as well as the fibre, protein, fruit, vegetable, nut and legume content. It must consider all of those because that way it will consider the nutrition of the product and not just the salt and sugar content. Because this system is not just about health, but it's also about our valuable citrus industries, fruit and beverage industries in Australia. There are 1,900 Australian citrus growers across our country and they support 5,000 full-time equivalent jobs. And a lot of that product goes into our high quality, fresh, 100 per cent Australian fruit juice. And I'm not just talking about orange juice. We've got apple juice, which is so important to the apple growers around Batlow in my state and across Tasmania. And, um, the other high quality, healthy, fresh fruit and vegetable juices that we produce in, our, in Australia. The Citrus Australia CEO, Nathan Hancock, has said that their growers would be gutted if they were told that their fresh, high quality, 100 per cent juice product was a lesser health value than diet cola. So, we need to ensure that our health star rating system maintains it in its integrity in Australia. And I call on the uh, Council uh, of Food Ministers across Australia and New Zealand to ensure that that calculator has integrity, remains robust and considers fruit, vegetable, nut and legume content as well as the other factors to ensure that we are Senator, promoting health choices. Urquhart. Tuesday, the 1st of December, yesterday, um, was in somewhat a special day to some, but not to others. 78 years ago, on the same day, ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan went down with his ship, HMAS Armadale, and lost his life at the age of 18 years old. So much of his life not lived, sadness and tragedy for his family, friends and loved ones. Yesterday, Teddy's family, after all that time, received into their hands the VC, which was finally awarded to Teddy. Teddy died as he strapped himself to the Orlikon gun, and in a gallantry act, he chose certain death to ensure that his comrades had a chance to live. HMAS Armadale had been hit by two torpedoes and a bomb from the air. Ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan disobeyed the order to abandon ship, fired back at the Japanese aircraft. He was wounded in the chest and in the back, but continued to fire, shooting down one bomber and kept the other aircraft away. He was seen still firing the gun as the Armadale sunk. 
49 of the 149 of his shipmates had been on board survived. The citation for his Victoria Cross says his preeminent act of valour and most conspicuous gallantry saved Australian lives. Teddy's nephew, Gary Ivory, accepted the medal from the Governor-General in a quiet ceremony yesterday in Canberra. Mr Ivory has tirelessly campaigned for 32 years for his uncle's bravery to be recognised. Congratulations to Mr Ivory and all those involved in the many, many hours and years that they've put in to ensure that Teddy was recognised. Teddy was born in East Barrington, a small rural village near La Trobe, in 1923, just a few kilometres southeast of uh, my office in Devonport. In La Trobe, there's a memorial and a lovely walk through an avenue of honour along a peaceful path all the way to the lovely Bells Parade. It's named the Sheehan Walk. I spent some time there a few months ago to reflect on the sacrifice that Teddy made for his country. I'm sure the sun is shining brighter at Teddy Sheehan Walk today. All Tasmanians, in fact all Australians, are very proud to call Edward Teddy Sheehan VC one of our own. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.